Okay, what's up guys? I'm going to just climb right into this because we have a lot of ground to cover and this is a really mind-blowing and profound topic so I don't want to waste your time with bullshit. The presentation is called Panic, Profit and Power, Decoding the COVID-19 Conspiracy and for the past three months, pretty much day and night, I have researched this topic obsessively, meticulously and it's really mind-blowing stuff. Um, so if you're in a rush, I recommend just bookmarking this talk and then you can come back to it because it's absolutely imperative that we become aware of what's really actually going on here because if not i assure you this world is going to change in irreversible ways and not for the good it's going to be for the bad but if we become aware enough of us then we can create positive change and it doesn't have to be the new normal it can go back to how it was before <laughs> when the world was still Pretty insane, but not on this next level of insanity. So I want to start off by just explaining a psychological vulnerability that we all have. It's nothing to get defensive about because we all share it. It's inescapable. It's a vulnerability within our perception. And what that is, is inattentional blindness. The example I chose to use here, it's a very simple one, and it's because we can all experiment on ourselves and see how this works, and that's the nose. Now, if you take a moment to see your nose is clearly in front of your face, and your eyes can actually see it, or your mind rather, can see it at all times, but it chooses to block it out. It eliminates it because it's not considered a priority. And if you want, like I said, you can quickly experiment on yourself, consciously look at it, it's clearly in front of your face, and then if you look at something else, you'll notice it pretty much vanishes. That's inattentional blindness. Now the significance of this is if something is considered an unconscious priority and when we tend to think of priorities we might think about what we want them to be but a fear could be a priority, propaganda could be an unconscious priority, it takes precedent because maybe the media is always sharing it or something along those lines. And not only does the mind have the vulnerability to where we can actually eliminate something staring at us right in the face, if you notice when your nose vanishes, when you look back at this presentation or you look at something else, you'll realize that not only does the nose vanish, but the mind actually plugs in what it thinks should be there instead. So when you're looking at this presentation, where your nose should be, your mind actually creates an image of what it thinks should be there instead, what it considers to be a bit more important. So in that way, it can create a very subtle illusion for us. And like I said, nothing to get defensive about we all have this vulnerability. The mind has, it's incredible, it's really remarkable, but it has its limitations. It can process only so much information at one time. And it's just necessary to become aware of that. Now to further illustrate my point, I wanted to give another real world example that we can all test on ourselves. And that's this red dot with this blue circle around it. What I'd like you to do is just take a few seconds to try to block everything out and just focus on that red dot. Nothing else. Just for a few seconds. Now what you should begin to notice is that the blue circle that is surrounding the red dot, it begins to fade away into the background. That again, it, that's how inattentional blindness works, guys. And the significance of this as it pertains to the society in which we live is we have all kinds of forces that are constantly competing for our focus, for our perception. That could be the news, the media, fear-mongering, it could be we live in a consumer society, it could be different corporations trying to sell you something. There's many, many people, many, many individuals, many groups, many organizations that are all trying to compete for your focus. And those who have the biggest platform, which tend to be the billionaires and the trillionaires of this planet, they have a megaphone, a proverbial megaphone that they can use to essentially induce inattentional blindness. And naturally, again, this is just a vulnerability within the way we perceive the world, all of us. A loud voice is louder than a soft voice. So if somebody screams loud enough, well, we're going to hear them over the people that are potentially just whispering the truth. So if there's a very loud propagandist screaming deception, and it's coming from all kinds of different figures, that can become the most pronounced reality, reality that you are perceiving, and everything else can fade into the background. 
And that leads me just to authority versus the truth. It's very important to understand how to distinguish between these two things because a lot of people don't know how to do that. And this is precisely the problem that we are running in today. It's a problem that we've been experiencing actually for centuries, for thousands of years, in fact. And what is taking place is we have figures of authority that have that megaphone, that proverbial megaphone, and people tend to give all their attention to these individuals, not realizing that we should be looking for the truth, okay? Look for the truth separately. And a very elementary example that I use that we can all, let, all more or less understand is if this dude over here, let's say he's the greatest mathematician and professor in the world, and all the media outlets are singing his praises and governments are giving him awards and he's just propagated everywhere. I mean, you turn on the radio, you hear about how great this guy is. You turn on the news, you hear about how great he is. If he says 2 plus 2 equals 5 and then that is spread like wildfire by the media and by governments and it's taught in education schools, it doesn't make him right. And just because it's popular, it doesn't make it right. And then on... The contrary, if there's a guy, let's say he got kicked out of school, he's, uh, he's homeless, etc. And he says, no, that's not true. 2 plus 2 equals 4, but the media makes fun of him. People just go to town on him and the government tries to put him in a mental institution. He's still right. Okay. And the way that we can figure this out is it requires investigation. So we cannot become beholden to authority because throughout history, agents of deception... They rely on our blind trust in authority to manipulate us. And as you're going to find in this presentation, and I'm using overwhelming evidence, okay, an abundance of verifiable evidence to make my case. The figure of authority in this case is the World Health Organization. It's different governments. It's corruptible scientists and organizations. And we're going to get into all of that. But I had to just quickly explain that so that you'll be a bit more receptive. So essentially, I'm just saying never blindly believe anyone, including myself, all right? But you never blindly reject them either. Learn how to critically think for yourself. There is no substitute, guys, for critical thinking, for asking questions. And it's so important that people realize it is through investigation that the truth is always ascertained, never through a blind belief, never, okay? Truth wants to be questioned. It wants to be investigated because that's how its power, that's how its authority, and truth is the only legitimate authority, but that's how its authority is established, is by us questioning it. Okay, only deception requires blind belief. Now with that said, like I already made very clear, I'm going to produce all the sources, all the citations, people who are familiar with my work, I always give the sources and citations. I want you to look into what I'm saying, all right? I want you to verify it. Not just because you should question everybody, all right, within the realm of logic. I mean, we can't question everything, otherwise we'll never ever live our lives. But not only should you question things that require questioning, right, extraordinary claims or something that induces the whole world to go into lockdown, not only should you question everything, but I want you to look into it because each of us have mental blocks that prevent us from actually discovering deeper truths. It becomes very difficult to process and we can become dismissive. And the only way to get through that red tape, that proverbial red tape, is to learn how to go question for ourselves and then slowly sift through it and kind of get rid of all the weeds in our mind that have been set up there to prevent us from learning. Now with that said, where have I been? All right, let me just address this elephant in the room quickly because I've been gone for over half a year. And I'm sure you are curious about that. And I don't know if you guys remember this, some of my followers. This was actually over a year ago already. That's crazy. In May of 2019, where I was talking about how I got very sick. And it was uncanny. It was very different because in the past, as some of you know, I suffered with depression and PTSD and anxiety and I went through a lot of difficulties and the thing and suicidal thoughts and poverty, etc. And when you go through something like that and you come out of it, if you come, you get through it, then everything else is, is kind of like a walk in the park. It's like a picnic. It becomes a lot easier to do. Right. But this was different. 
normally you can just bounce back. I know more or less how you get back up in the proverbial horse when life knocks you down. And I wasn't sure what it was. And then I was just, you know, kind of explaining to everybody the position that I was in and confronting this and trying to motivate myself and at the same time motivate anybody else that may be experiencing that because I know a lot of us are. But it turns out it wasn't just me getting sick. I actually had taken an antibiotic that resulted in severe liver damage. So I had a near fatal response to this antibiotic, it's called Augmentin. And I went to see all kinds of specialists and, and so on and so forth. And it was bad, guys. I mean, some of you may notice if you're a bit more perceptive, I've lost a lot of weight. I lost around 20 kilograms, 45 pounds. And I had terrible symptoms. At the risk of sounding very dramatic, I thought that I might actually die. It made me question my existence, my sense of purpose, and a lot of different things. But um, yeah, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be able to give you this presentation. I'm very thankful to all of my friends and my family members that helped me get through this troubling time, including, and, and I just want to point this out very quickly, including those people that simply messaged me or emailed me that I haven't even gotten back to you yet. And I'm going to get back to you. But, you know, when you're really down and you think that you aren't going to make it or whatever, your mind's in another place. But even those small messages, those emails, just, hey, how are you doing? Where are you? You know, we'd like to hear from you. What about the book? And so on and so forth, which I'll get into in a second. That still helped to motivate me, you know. So thank you for that. I appreciate all the support. And I'm very grateful to be here, right? It's a good learning lesson too. I mean, there's always, there's always a lesson to learn if you look close, close enough. With that said, the book, right, Escaping the Matrix of Society, the revolution starts within. I am still working on it, guys. And I'm so sorry. I know I've been promising you this book for such a long period of time. And uh, it's, it's almost finished. It probably would have been done had all this crazy lockdown stuff and the coronavirus not come along. But I knew I had to dig into what's taking place here because, I mean, this is just like a bad science fiction movie what's going on it's, it's really it's crazy stuff and it's not something we should blindly accept without looking into so i'm very, very glad that i looked into all of this because it's going to blow your mind guys it's really just an unprecedented level of corruption that's taking place but the book is coming so stay tuned all right the wait will be worth it all right let's officially get started here i wanted to just actually put things into a little bit of perspective. Let's talk about some of the leading causes of preventable death annually that tend to be overlooked, or at least by way of comparison, ignored by the media, ignored by the authorities as comparison to COVID-19. And as you can see, these are millions and millions of people dying, and these are preventable deaths, guys. They can be prevented, the overwhelming majority of them. Um, in the case of cancer, that's one of the lower figures. Roughly, it's estimated around 40% is preventable. Cardiovascular disease is around 80%. And then diabetes is around 80%. The rest, as far as we know, based on the evidence available, are pretty much entirely preventable. And there's some shocking things on you, right? We see hunger, hunger-related, 9 million deaths every single year. Medical errors and accidents, guys, 2.6 million. And that's just LMIC, which means low or middle income countries, like a country that I'm in right now, South Africa. But for those of you who live in so-called wealthier countries or first world countries, you don't get a free pass. I'm going to get into that later. There's a large number of deaths due to medical errors. Um, pneumonia, that's another one. People have no idea, guys. Pneumonia is very deadly. And it's far more deadly when you look at the statistics for young people, by way of comparison to COVID-19, which is fairly insipid. And even right now, and I need you guys to do your best, probably should have mentioned this later, but I already uh, <laughs> took that rabbit out of the proverbial hat. In the United States, despite the high number of deaths that have been attributed, we're going to get into why I'm saying attributed to COVID-19, in spite of that high figure, there's actually been more deaths officially, and this is on the CDC's own website, officially attributed to pneumonia. Based on those stats, more people have died from pneumonia than COVID-19, who've never shut down the whole economy and done all of these crazy things and forced unemployment and so on and so forth for pneumonia, have we? And I'm sure you haven't heard any media outlets talk about that. And we'll get into all of that stuff. I mean, this is going to be a roller coaster, so buckle up your seats 
try your very best not to pause this and go look up things immediately. I'm almost confident you're going to watch this twice, even though it's going to be a long presentation, just because it's that mind stretching. But I want you to try to stick with the presentation because this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's really small stuff, guys, compared to the larger picture that we're going to unfold. Then indoor air pollution is another big one. Suicide and even a se severe seasonal flu, 650,000 deaths. So I just wanted to mention this because by way of comparison, the media and the authorities, they almost never speak about any of these things. And not only do they never speak about these things, they don't take the same obscene, dramatic overreaction um, policies against any of these things, and they most certainly can. So let's explore, explore very quickly the deaths from cigarette smoking and tobacco use. Now I want to just make it very clear guys, I'm just making a point. I'm not yet to say you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, let's get those people, let's get our pitchforks and get the cigarette smokers. You're a big boy, you're a big girl, you can smoke you some cigarettes. I'm just making a bigger point, so don't get defensive, alright? Stick with me. Right now, per year, it's average that 8 million people die due to cigarette smoking and tobacco use. 15% of them, or 1.2 million, are due to secondhand smoke. Okay, that's a staggering statistic, guys. Those are innocent bystanders, 1.2 million people. So this is a big problem if you think about it, right? 1.2 million people, that's 100,000 people, innocent people dying every single month from secondhand smoke. But you don't have the media talk about that. You don't have the governments talk about that. In fact, this is so serious, right? That the World Health Organization, they claim that in the 20th century alone, 100 million people died from tobacco use and smoking cigarettes. 100 million, and that's projected to be 1 billion in this century, guys. And they actually released this report and called upon governments to do something about this. But has any government really done anything to address this? And again, I'm not yet to attack you smoking cigarettes. Stick to the deeper point that I'm trying to make. Just bear with me, guys. All right, and please try not to get defensive. Try not to be impulsive. The point being is right now, 1 billion people are projected to die. That's a massive figure. 15% of those approximately will be secondhand smoke. That's 150 million innocent people, innocent bystanders that will die from secondhand smoke. There's been no pandemic, including the Spanish flu, which they make these ridiculous comparisons to. And I'm going to get into that later because it's pure propaganda and it's been completely taken out of context. But 150 million people, innocent people, are going to die based on these projections. And I haven't seen them shut down the economy or shut down the big tobacco companies. And I haven't seen them stop uh, Hollywood actors from smoking in the movies. And I'll quickly point that out. Just, this is something that I meticulously documented in my book, the history of how cigarette smoking was popularized. And that was one of the propaganda methods. You know, for example, they had Sylvester Stallone and they, uh, signed a contract with him where he was going to smoke cigarettes in Rocky and uh, in Rocky Balboa and I think the other one might have been Rambo. I can't quite recall the second one, but the one movie was Rocky. And the significance of that is they do it because they know this is an influential figure. And anyways, I mean, you can read the book more about learning about that stuff. So just back at hand, what I'm trying to explain here is that this is a major, 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 major public health risk. So when they are telling us right now that they're doing all of these crazy measures, they're imposing and encroaching on our freedoms, and they're forcing us into isolation and lockdown, and we have to spray everything down, and they say it's for our public health and our public safety. That can't be true, because if it was, why wouldn't they take the same course of action against something that's way more deadly? I mean, 150 million innocent people, 1 billion people in total? And if you look into tobacco tactics, guys, the big cigarette companies, it's very, very dodgy. It's deceptive. They target children. Most people that start smoking, they start as children. And then they stick with a particular brand. It's, it's crazy. It's really, really mind-blowing stuff. So I wanted to point this out, and here's another study, because like I said, I'm going to use overwhelming evidence, not because I want to attack smokers. You want to smoke, you're more than welcome to do that. I don't recommend it. And please don't smoke around other people. But my point being, this is far more deadly by way of comparison. Not just each month or, or each year, but in the long run. This is a very serious, this is an unprecedented public health risk. One billion people, 
150 million of which will be innocent victims of secondhand smoke, but you don't hear them freaking out about that. You don't see them taking the same measures. So the argument that this is for our public health, and they are just concerned. You know, they're just concerned about our health. That's why they're doing these crazy things. This is a very simple example that shows it's not true. And here's a perfect example that they can put an end to it. In Bhutan, they passed a law where you, you, you no longer can smoke cigarettes. And I'm not saying that we should do that. All I'm saying is they have the capability through regulations to limit something that is far more deadly than COVID-19, yet they aren't taking those actions, all right? It's just a very simple point that I'm making here. Now, in addition to that point, I want to make it very clear, like I said, I go through this in meticulous detail in the book, but we can explore it very quickly here, yeah, that the tobacco industry, the tactics that they used was they actually funded scientists that were willing to be corrupted. Now, I want to make it very clear because throughout this process, and this may be an authority, people think that authority is just an authority you don't like. No, authority is always an authority that you trust. The scientific establishment is an authority in that context. So is religion, so are governments, so is the World Health Organization. Everybody has an authority that they are a bit more susceptible to blindly trusting. So in this particular instance and throughout this presentation, I'm going to challenge your understanding and your potential bias of blindly believing in the scientific establishment. That doesn't mean that you should no longer trust science as a concept. I'm going to use science, good science, which is based on verifiable research to show you what's really going on. But I'm also going to show you that the scientific establishment has been corrupted in the past, which we're about to get into, and it is currently being corrupted on an unprecedented scale with everything that's going on. So here's a perfect example. You can look at this study that was published where they sponsored a front company called the Center for Indoor Air Research. And they did this on a regular basis. It's fascinating to look into big tobacco companies' tactics from the past because it's a playbook for how corporations, and particularly Big Pharma, which is behind all of this madness that's going on today, of how they operate. Because, listen guys, the play has changed throughout history. They do change. They come, they go, the emperors of the past in ancient Rome, and so on and so forth. And today with the puppet presidents and these powerful families, they come and go, but the game stays the same. So if you can learn how the game is played, then you can start to see how the world really operates beyond all the propaganda. And what they did was they set up a number of front groups, the Advancement of Science Science Coalition, for example, Associates for Research in the Science of Enjoyment, and then the one that I just mentioned, the Center for Indoor Air Research. And the tactic that they employed was very clever. It was a means of inducing inattentional blindness. So what they would do is they would, instead of focusing directly on the argument about people smoking cigarettes indoors, because back then people smoked freely indoors, including on airplanes, and then it started to become suspected and scientists that weren't bought and paid for started to raise concerns based on the research they had done that smoking indoors is very dangerous. It can cause cancer and so on and so forth. What they did to cause doubt over this argument is they focused all of the attention on indoor air pollution and then they used the media to propagate that further. And then when everybody starts to hear about that and talk about it, what does it do? Those other arguments about cigarette smoking indoors, they begin to fade away through inattentional blindness. It's a very elementary tactic that propagandists use, and it's being used today. So like I said, the players change, but the game stays the same. And yes, some actual scientists, like I said, I'm going to give you the evidence. I don't want you to blindly believe in anything I'm going to say. If I say, you know, scientists did this and they can be corrupted, I'm going to give you an example. And yeah, just a few figures, some of them that worked within governments, all right? Some of them that worked within governments, and the significance of this is today we're being told to blindly believe that the governments and the scientific establishment, the mainstream scientific establishment, because there's a lot of good scientists that are being silenced or totally ignored on this, but we are being told that we should just blindly believe them about what's taking place. Well, the reason why I'm sharing this right now is to help you understand that in the past they deceived us, and that uh, the tobacco or the smoking cigarettes basically pandemic of that that we are dealing with today is a result of them and their surreptitious activities. So that immediately is grounds to question them moving forward. 
So with that said, we have Frederick Seitz over here. He's a former president of the National Academy of Sciences. And he has received numerous prestigious awards, guys. Then another guy, he worked for the National Cancer, of, uh, the National Cancer Institute. Okay, he was the former deputy director of the National Cancer Institute. And then he's on Big Tobacco's payroll. And he's actually the current editor-in-chief of the journal Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology. Another guy, this guy was a former chief science advisor in the FDA in the United States for 25 years, guys. Dr. William Gary Flynn. He's also the former president of both the American College of Toxicology and the International Society for Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology. And he also was a former advisor and consultant to the World Health Organization. And here we have another guy, also had influence over the World Health Organization. So it's important that I'm pointing this out. One of the reasons why I use these examples is so you can understand that despite the World Health Organization's very high level of authority that people blindly trust, oh, it's the World Health Organization, they can still be influenced, okay, by toxic influences. And we have Dr. Ragnar Rylander, he was a former advisor and member of the World Health Organization's Expert Advisory Panel on Occupational Health. He was also an advisor to the Swedish Board of Health and Welfare and the Swedish National Food Administration, so he worked within the government. And he also served as an editorial board member on several scientific journals. And then fast forward to a bit more recent times, Dr. Helen Wigton Taba, he was a former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Health in Malawi. So high-ranking politician over there. And you'll find as we go on with this, these these agents of deception, they have their tentacles in governments all over the world, guys. And he was a former executive board member of the World Health Organization. Okay, this dude, he successfully prevented laws that were going to actually limit the big tobacco companies' influence in the so-called third world or developing countries. And he did this by arguing that cigarette smoking and tobacco use, it only affected more wealthy countries. And today we know, of course, that while that was true at the time that he said it, which I think was in the 1990s, it's not true today. Developing countries are the ones suffering the most from cigarette smoke. And they're using a lot of the tactics they used on the United States and England that, that a lot of researchers have since unearthed and exposed. They're using that now, actually, on developing nations. And his brother was the president of the International Tobacco Growers Association, and they had interest in the tobacco companies. And then the media and different scientific publications, like I said, they used... When you've got a, a billion dollar piggy bank, guys, you can have huge influence over people's perception, over what's constantly being shouted on that proverbial megaphone. And yeah, you see, these are real ads. Now, scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. So it's also very famous, you see a few more examples yeah, the other, on the right hand side. Cigarettes do not cause cancer. Leading doctors in the field of cancer research insist. And then this was also a very famous campaign by Camel Cigarettes. More doctors smoke Camel than any other cigarette. In every state of the union, doctors in every branch of medicine were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? In this nationwide survey of general practitioners, surgeons, throat specialists, diagnosticians, and so on, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. So my reason for sharing this with you guys is to help you understand, not to make you unnaturally paranoid, but awareness is the first step towards being able to defend ourselves successfully from those who mean to use propaganda to indoctrinate us, okay, to exploit us. And another example I just want to run through very quickly to further illustrate my point is obesity. Like I said earlier, obesity is one of the top preventable causes of death right now in the world, with roughly around 4 million people dying every single year. And according to this study, which was again produced by the World Health Organization, the number one reason, one of the number one reasons behind the obesity epidemic is actually because governments have deregulated the market. Deregulation means that you are basically giving the fox access to the hen house. So when you regulate something, that means that you set up rules. Okay, You will set up protective rules so that the population, the society, does not become susceptible to the propaganda and the very dodgy tactics of these fast food companies. Well, what we find is that, according to this report, and I've done the research, it clearly is true, 
that governments, instead of giving them free reign, they are allowing them to do very dodgy things to brainwash people into buying their food. Because all of this stuff is based on brainwashing. It really is. It's, uh, it's something we need to be made aware of. I go into meticulous detail in the book. And I'm slightly going into it, yeah? But it's very important that we learn how to defend ourselves from these guys. Uh, because they, they just don't have our best interest in mind. And a lot of us think that we are living based on free will. But we actually are operating on unconscious emotions. That's why Ronald McDonald is a smiling clown. Because it appeals to children emotionally. That's why Spider-Man on the cereal box, on this unhealthy GMO cereal, kids want that. Because Spider-Man creates unconscious emotional excitement. And they found over here that governments could slow and even reverse the growing epidemic of obesity by taking measures to counter fast food consumption. As you can see at the bottom here, they also explain that this will have serious implications, uh, positive implications on diabetes, heart disease, stroke and cancer, which are killing millions of people. So they, they have been asked before to do something about killing, uh, about things that are far more dangerous than coronavirus, but they are not taking the same actions. And so they're deregulating this industry. So this whole notion that the governments around the world are doing this for our public safety and health, it needs to be questioned based on evidence, based on historical evidence. And yeah, you can see again another scientific study. Guys, I'm not going to obviously link this stuff. You can go look it up for yourself, right? I'm just saying, because I want to help empower you, but I'm not sure to babysit you. And as you can see by the study, ban on fast food TV advertising would reverse childhood obesity trends. Just banning fast food ads. Back in the day, the cigarette companies also had ads on TV. When they began to realize that this was uh, brainwashing people, brainwashing young people to smoke cigarettes. You know, some of you may remember the Flintstones cartoon from back in the day. In the Flintstones cartoon, they used to actually have the Flintstones smoking cigarettes, advertising cigarettes. The Flintstones have been brought to you by Winston. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. It still tastes good like a cigarette good. And that's a subtle way to actually get towards the children. It's very, very clever. And eventually, enough people spoke out about it, and then governments were forced to regulate it and prevent it from advertising. The same thing can happen with fast food. But they don't care. It's not about your public health. It's not about our public safety. And here's another study, processed food, and this was recently, January 6th of this year, processed foods are highly correlated with obesity epidemic in the US. And yet, yeah, also the World Health Organization says processed meat causes cancer. And yet, what, what happens, right? I don't know about where you guys are, but yeah, in South Africa, throughout this whole lockdown process, McDonald's and KFC have been open. Think about the logic behind that. You have these organizations, fast food companies, that are clearly linked to the obesity epidemic and yet they are allowed to sell their junk food, their poison while everything else gets locked down, while people are in unemployment I mean it's, it's just, it's illogical guys it's antithetical to, to the appropriate course of action for people's public health and then of course you also go to the shop and all these people wearing masks and they're scared shitless but if you look in their all the stuff that they're buying, all the processed food and shit, they're killing themselves without even knowing it because we are being led astray, right? The, the problem that we are faced with, it's not a pandemic or an epidemic of a virus. It's a pandemic and an epidemic of ignorance. And even deeper than that, it's a pandemic and an epidemic of deception. There's a deeper root cause for our ignorance. It's not natural. It's not innate. It's deliberately being perpetuated against us. But I'm going to get into it. And this lady over here, just to, for anybody that wants to explore it a bit more, she did a brilliant job with these two reports. And she showed you yeah, with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the American Society for Nutrition, how they are being financed. I mean, these are the people we turn to for guidance. We turn to for health guidance. They are being financed by all of these dodgy companies. Coca-Cola, which has a long history of manipulating science because of their sugar products and like vitamin water. Go look up the evidence. Vitamin and water is bullshit. There's nothing healthy about it, guys. But with the right propaganda, people will believe it. PepsiCo, the Sugar Association, McDonald's, and so on and so forth. And even over here with the American Society for Nutrition, they publish four journals in the field of nutrition, guys. 
And once again, you see Mars Candy Bars, who have been implicated in child slavery. Yeah, you see McDonald's, Monsanto, which was voted the most evil corporation in the world. And for those who are wondering why you haven't heard from them, they've been absorbed and merged with Bayer, which is another very corrupt company. And just some quick examples so that you guys can be aware of how this works. Right? Don't blindly, just because it's a news outlet, it's a media outlet, doesn't mean that you can blindly trust this authority. Learn to question things. Over here, for example, diet fizzy drinks are better than water for weight loss. Scientists say, they love that scientists said it. Scientists said it, authority said it. That's what that translates to. And then as you can see, a recent study that said Diet Coke can help you lose weight was quietly funded by Coca-Cola. And they did this through ILSI Europe Institute, which is the International Life Sciences Institute. It's a front group. Okay, like I said, the players change, but the game stays the same. The tactics are the same, guys. And another classic propaganda technique over here by Coca-Cola, taking a page out of the playbook of the big tobacco companies. Coke court funding scientists to deflect blame for obesity away from their sugary drinks. And the way they would do this is that they would focus almost entirely on exercise while trivializing how their sugary drinks and their unhealthy products contribute to obesity. So in other words, inattentional blindness, right? You hijack their focus, and in this way, then you can distract them and make them forget that your product is potentially causing problems. The same with the big tobacco companies where they funded scientists to focus on indoor air pollution as being the major health hazard rather than smoking cigarettes indoors. And this is clever because there is some truth to what they are spreading. Yes, it is true. Indoor air pollution is a major health risk. Just as if you don't exercise, that's also a health risk. But when you begin to trivialize and undermine how, you know, the tobacco companies are smoking cigarettes is obviously dangerous for your health indoors, or how Coca-Cola sugary products are also dangerous for your health, and they undermine the role that um, the diet plays, then you are engaging in a skillful level of propaganda. So we just, we need to become wise to this kind of behavior. And once we do, it becomes a lot easier to understand what's going on. Even right now, in the context of this so-called pandemic, what we have is experts who should be uh, given a platform, like Newt Butowski, who's challenging and he's very critical of the lockdown, who's instead being censored by the media, by the establishment media, or just outright ignored, as are many other authorities, and we're going to get into that a little bit later on. And then by way of comparison, they'll fixate and focus on police brutality, or on uh, racial division, and so on and so forth, which are which are problems, don't get me wrong, it's significant, but by way of comparison, why are they fixating on one and then undermining or choosing to ignore this particular argument with the pandemic? It's to induce inattentional blindness, guys. And I assure you, when the history books are written, if we don't become wise to what's going on yet, if we don't start to pay attention and take this a lot more seriously and look more deeply into this, this world is going to be changed in unprecedented, almost irreversible ways, I assure you, and not for the good, for the bad. Here's another one. New study shows children and adolescents who eat candy are less overweight or obese. Well, damn. That's awesome, isn't it? And then, over here you see the Associated Press. How candy makers shape nutrition science. And then they explain that the paper was actually funded by a trade association representing the makers of Butterfingers, Hershey and Skittles. So it was another front group, guys. And anybody that wants to explore this a little bit more, again, I use scientific principles in my life every day. And this entire investigation is rooted in science. You are going to find overwhelming scientific evidence. Most of the sources and citations linked directly or that I have used are directly coming from prestigious, well-respected scientific publications and journals. But there is scientific bullshit out there. I wrote this blog, people got real butterhood. But it is what it is. If something's aligned with reality, if it's aligned with the truth, and I'm telling you something, and it's aligned with reality and the truth, the problem's not me. The problem is you having a problem with the truth, right? That means you need to fix something with your perception. If we're not aligned with the truth, what are we aligned with? Deception. The same. So anybody wants to look us up, I'll link it for you. Scientific bullshit, how science, and I said science because it's obviously bullshit science, is used to deceive the public. Alright, let's officially now that I've 
lay that groundwork to open your mind and say, wow, they've done this bullshit before. Maybe we should be a bit suspicious. So let's start with investigating the theoretical study and those behind it that kickstarted the international lockdowns. Because that's really what kickstarted all of this, right? Shouldn't we look into what initially motivated these insane policies? I mean, the news headlines were just outrageous. Act only to save more than 30 million lives. I mean, that is some scary shit, right? Without interventions, one model predicts that COVID-19 could kill 40 million this year. You'll notice our underlined model over there because this is a mathematical model. A theoretical mathematical model, which is a very poor substitute for concrete science, guys. And it's something that they didn't mention in the headlines, because they know nobody's actually reading most of these articles, is that this report was never published in a scientific journal, and it wasn't peer-reviewed. Think about that. This was used to justify lockdowns all around the world, and it was never even published in a scientific journal or peer-reviewed. It's mind-blowing. It's, it's surreal. It's difficult to apprehend, to believe. It's so outrageous. And yeah, you go, it was just a report, guys. That's all it was. Okay, this is the actual website, report number nine. Imperial College London's website. So let's take a closer look. Let's do the job that the media should have done from the very beginning. Instead, they blindly uh, proliferated the story everywhere. They shared it, they spread it like wildfire and scared the shit out of the whole entire world. Let's do what they should have done, which is question, right? Question authority. Doesn't matter who the authority is, question, investigate. Who's the, who was the lead author behind this? A guy named Neil Ferguson. Now this more recently came out and you'll notice that I'm going to use establishment media headlines. That's not because I'm saying you should trust him or they're credible. Because even a broken clock can be right twice a day. I'm simply using the information against them. And I know that a lot of people are beholden to authority. So if I can prove my point using the information, then it's even better. And yet more recently where they show that his predictions, as you can see they call him Professor Lockdown, Neil Ferguson, have been described as totally unreliable by other experts, impossible to read. And then when other scientists have tried to replicate the findings using the same model, they have repeatedly failed to do so. Okay, that right there is just alarm bells, red flags. And like I said, this is more of a recent report. This didn't come out as soon as the, that phony study was produced, that mathematical model was produced, which is what the media should have done. They should have questioned it. But as you are going to find, they're on the payroll, baby. That's it, they're on the payroll. But we're going to get into that later. So let's dig a little bit deeper. Who is the Imperial College London? Do they have any conflicts of interest? This is, as a researcher, one of the first things you do is you look for conflicts of interest, potential conflicts of interest, follow the money. Who could potentially profit from this? Well, all of these companies, GSK, Eli Lilly and Company, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, they are set to profit from the pandemic because they are the ones producing the vaccines. They are going to make a killing on this, lots of money. Well, the Imperial College London is currently, and when they produced that model, were in partnership with all of these companies, direct partnership. That's called a conflict of interest, guys. The media should have reported this. Okay, and then beyond the obvious conflicts of interest with those partnerships, Imperial College of London itself is set to profit from the pandemic because they are producing coronavirus vaccines, guys. As you can see over here, this is uh, from their own website. They will be receiving a further 18.5 million pounds from the UK government to develop a coronavirus vaccine. That's, that is just outrageous. You cannot go, for some, go to somebody for intelligent advice when that advice that they are giving you is ultimately going to benefit them. It's going to profit them. That's a major, just an obvious conflict of interest, guys. The next thing is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now you're going to say, oh, you know, Gavin, these conspiracies about Bill Gates, about William Gates, leave the guy alone. Well, as you're going to find, the man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm going to get into that in a bit more detail later on. So just be patient, put that on the shelf. But the same month that they produced that phony, that, excuse me, that phony model, the same exact month that they produced that ridiculous phony model that said millions of people would die, that exact same month, 
The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave them over $79 million. Why is that significant, Gavin? Because the Gates Foundation, based on this investigation, brilliant investigation, from a, a publication known as The Nation, and I'm not trying to rhyme, <laughs> that just came out as it did, which has been around since the 1860s, so it's, in some, it's not some random blog, it's a legitimate investigation. And they found that close to $2 billion in tax-deductible charitable donations from the Gates Foundation was made to for-profit businesses, including companies in which the foundation held investments, such as GlaxoSmithKline. That's GlaxoSmithKline. And then all of these over here are different pharmaceutical companies and vaccine producers that are not only going to profit from this pandemic, a number of different ones, but also several who are in direct partnership with Imperial College London. As you see over here, Eli Lilly and Company, Pfizer, GlaxoSmithKline, and then Janssen Vaccines from Johnson & Johnson. Huge conflicts of interest, guys. But now let's put that on the shelf. Like I said, we will come back to Bill Gates and what role he's playing in all of this because he's playing a big role. All right, so again, let's take a little bit of a closer look. Let's do what the media should have done. Again, this article only came out like I think two or three months after that model was initially put out. This should have come out on the same day, the next day, excuse me. The media should have been on top of this, guys. That's their job. And I'm being rhetorical here because the media historically, since their inception, have been there to lead people astray. It's a tough pill to swallow. I'm going to link a blog that will help to demonstrate that. Because I don't just make theoretical claims. I research. I align myself with reality to the best of my ability. Okay? Nobody can entirely understand reality. We don't know how many dimensions, galaxies, and so on and so forth there are. But in this particular topic, I'm on the money. Okay? So let's take a, look, a closer look at who Neil Ferguson is. The Imperial College London virus modeler and government scientific advisor. Well, if you take a look at his history, this guy's got a terrible history of bad predictions. On several occasions prior to this event, he had terrible predictions again. So this is a red flag, right? When somebody has a history, let's say somebody has lied to you before, and they've done it at least on three occasions, the next time they make a promise, you're a bit suspicious, right? And let's say that this person who comes up to you and they, they tell you a lie, but you don't know who they are, but people that you trust, you entrust them as being your advisors and helping you understand the truth and protecting you from deception. Let's say that this person comes, they lie to you, and these people, they don't tell you. Why aren't they telling you? That's the media's job. They're supposed to tell us that this dude is, he's dodgy. He's got a bad history of prediction. So if we look at some of them over there, there was one where they killed a bunch of innocent cattle, sheep, and pigs. Cost the economy about $10 billion. Well, they found in 2011 that his model made a serious error in their judgment. What is more significant than even that, though, is that in 2009, guys, roughly 10 years ago, there was another pandemic declared that people don't even know about. The 2009 swine flu. That was officially declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. And it was unbelievably controversial. And we're about to get into that now, because history is repeating itself. And over here, you see that him and his team, they put together a swine flu model that predicted about 65,000 people in the UK alone would die. And that was a significant benchmark in the World Health Organization's decision to issue a pandemic. But in the end, the UK death toll from swine flu stood at around 457. That is a huge error in judgment, guys. And then there's also another one where you predicted around 50,000 people would die from mad cow disease, but to date, 177 people have died. And yeah, is a news headline from back then, just to help you understand the propaganda. The propaganda machine was going on then. It's just gone to another level this time around. And because more of us have access to the internet, more of us are more plugged into the proverbial matrix now. And I'm not saying the internet's a bad thing because it's done more good, in my opinion, than bad. But as you can see, this headline, yeah, very similar. Swine flu will infect a third of the world's population. First detailed study virus predicts. And as I said, those who do not learn from history, that's why I'm sharing some history with you so you can understand how this game works, guys. If we don't learn from history, then we are doomed to repeat it. So let's take a look over here. This is 16th May 2010. Billions wasted on swine flu pandemic that never came. And you see how over here, how did the World Health Organization get its prediction, which came from Neil Ferguson in the Imperial College London, of 7.5 million people dying? So wrong. It didn't come even near that figure, guys. So again, a dubious history. 
Now we can almost copy and paste this information into what's going on today, right? Schools and stadiums were closed in Mexico, tourists from Egypt to Singapore were quarantined, and the surgical mask became a universal fashion accessory across Asia. Yet predictions that the global death toll from swine flu could reach 7.5 million were well off the mark. At the most, the virus killed about 14,000 people, and some of those had pre-existing conditions or had been infected by other dangerous bugs as well. Against the background death toll from seasonal flu of up to 500,000, the swine flu strain was practically invisible. But it gets, it gets better. And by better, I mean it gets worse. Based on this investigation from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, they found that key scientists that were advising the World Health Organization on the pandemic influenza, on declaring a pandemic, they had financial links to the drug companies, the big pharma companies, that stood to profit from the organization's decisions. Boom, major conflict of interest. And they did this study or this investigation in conjunction with the British Medical Journal. And as you can see what they say over here, and this is just mind blowing, that the media is not talking about this. And it's going to snowball. It's going to, you're gonna be like, wow. It's, it's shocking as this presentation goes on. Key scientists advising the World Health Organization on planning for an influenza pandemic had done pay work for pharmaceutical firms that stood to gain from the guidance they were preparing. These conflicts of interest have never been publicly disclosed by the World Health, World Health Organization, and the World Health Organization has dismissed inquiries into its handling of the AH1N1 pandemic as quote-unquote conspiracy theories. Authorities love to do that, because they know they have the authority and people will blindly believe them. They're just conspiracy theorists, right? That's what it is. And eventually the World Health Organization receives so much pressure, which is what we need to do now. We need to create enough awareness and enough pressure to where they can't run and hide and use their, oh, it's conspiracy theorists and so on and so forth to dismiss what is legitimate questions and investigation. And eventually they did have to um, acknowledge this, which I'm going to show a little bit later. And who was part of the team that had conflicts of interest that were previously on the payroll of the pharmaceutical companies that profited from it? None other than Professor Neil Morris Ferguson. Okay, the dude, he was working, or he had, excuse me, past financial links where he did consultancy for GlaxoSmithKline. And we're going to hear that name repeatedly. It was also with Hoffman LaRoche, but you, you are going to repeatedly hear that name, GlaxoSmithKline. And we're going to explore who they are, because that is a dodgy big pharmaceutical company. Unbelievably corrupt. And yeah, you can see... Again, another article, there's the name GlaxoSmithKline. And it also notes how that more than half of the scientists that were advising the British government, they also, on their own task force, they also had links to these big pharmaceutical giants. And you are going to find what's going on now is this same scenario on steroids. Big pharma all day, all day. This dude over here, he was actually the president at the Imperial College London at the time during this pandemic that was declared off of the phony model by Neil Ferguson. He was the president, the rector of Imperial College London. And then he was also the top senior advisor to the UK government, huge conflicts of interest. At the same time, he was working for GlaxoSmithKline and he's still working for GlaxoSmithKline today. So again, huge conflicts of interest, guys. And if you take a closer look at him, his name is Sir Roy, Sir Professor Roy Anderson, this dude has got his fingers in many, many pies. He still works for GlaxoSmithKline. He's currently an advisor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He works also for the World Health Organization, and he's still working at the Imperial College London. So we got a, people like this in the background pay attention to. And as you can see, they did profit. Okay, GlaxoSmithKline, $2.6 billion boost from the swine flu vaccines. Most of them never even got used, guys, these vaccines. People don't realize it. That, it gets polarized and the debate gets shifted instead of people focusing on the fact that because when you I'm going to go into these companies they are unbelievably corrupt they should be questioned based on the fact that they are corrupt it's very simple it doesn't have to become oh you're pro-vaxxer anti-vaxxer killing people not killing people because you aren't vaccinating we don't have to go down that path let's we can all understand corruption right conflicts of interest we can all agree that that is unethical this kind of behavior and I'm going to get into it so just bear with me and this was serious, guys. Just to put this into context and perspective, this isn't me just speculating. This was serious. The EU to pro forma over false pandemic. As you can see, 4th January 2010. 
And over here, this dude, he was a director at the World Health Organization, and he was very vocal against it. He was very outspoken about all of this, in which I have also been, uh, well, at least I should say to myself, because I haven't been <laughs> posting on social media when I'm having my debates in the shower. But he spoke about all these leading causes of preventable death and how that's not being prioritized because of some insipid swine flu. And we have a very similar scenario today. I'm going to get into all of it, guys. So just journey with me. I'm your guide down the rabbit hole, okay? As you can see at the end, it says, Governments and public health services are paying only lip service to the prevention of these great killers and are instead wasting huge amounts of money by investing in pandemic scenarios whose evidence base is weak. Another guy over here, October 9, 2009, an oncologist and chairman of the Drug Commission of the German Medical Association, he said, and I quote, The health authorities have fallen for a campaign by the pharmaceutical companies, which were plainly using a supposed threat to make money. And another guy who was very vocal at speaking out against the World Health Organization and the conflicts of interest with the big pharmaceutical companies was the epidemiologist, Dr. Wolfgang Wodog. And he's also actually been very vocal about how phony this whole COVID-19 pandemic is. And we'll unfold that more as we go on, because I know not all of you are entirely convinced yet, and you shouldn't be, not until we go into more of the evidence, which we will be doing. And as you can see over here, January 26, 2010, as quoted in Spiegel International, uh, he explained that millions of people worldwide ended up being vaccinated for no good reason, guys. All right, it was absolutely unnecessary. And according to him, the big pharma companies earned an additional $18 billion in revenue. $18 billion. So for those people out there who are saying there's no financial incentive here, there is huge financial incentives. Huge financial incentives. People have no idea how profitable the vaccine industry can be. And he explained that, you know, annual sales of Tamiflu alone jumped to 435%. And this actually wasn't the end result of the profits either. But that's an astronomical figure. And uh, in the Parliamentary Assembly, you can see over your document 12110, you can find this online, 18th December 2009. Dr. Wodog, he actually brought this forward to the European Council. It's entitled Fake Pandemics, a Threat for Health. And uh, a number of individuals, high-ranking individuals, high-ranking officials, they signed off on this statement, which is that in order to promote their patented drugs and vaccines against flu, Pharmaceutical companies have influenced scientists and official agencies responsible for public health standards to alarm governments worldwide. They have made them squander tight healthcare resources for inefficient vaccine strategies and needlessly exposed millions of healthy people to the risk of unknown side effects of insufficiently tested vaccines. And this is so important for people to understand. Whatever side of the fence you're on, if you're pro-vaccine or not, you have to realize, it's indisputable, okay, that fast-tracking a vaccine is dangerous. It is very, very dangerous. It has to go through many, many uh, trials and tests before it can be officially made available. And right now, you have all of these dodgy companies, which have terrible histories, unethical histories, consistent immorality and being unethical in their procedures and how they do their business, that are racing to produce a coronavirus vaccine. All right, it's, it's a danger. And an excellent example of this can be found in this uh, scientific publication. It was peer-reviewed, all right, for people who want to fact-check it. Entitled, Deaths Following Vaccination, What Does the Evidence Show? And if we take a look back in 1955, guys, you should go look this up for yourself. There was something known as the Cutter Incident. And it was a polio vaccine that was not manufactured appropriately. And as a result, because this wasn't safely done, there were 51 cases that we know about, 51 cases of permanent paralysis and five deaths among those who were vaccinated. So people who got vaccinated had experienced adverse effects as a result of this. And then there were 113 cases that we officially know about of paralysis and five deaths among contacts of people who came into contact with vaccinated individuals. So this is significant, right? It shows that vaccines are obviously not risk-free. And if they aren't done appropriately and correctly, they, there's obvious dangers there. And this isn't even old, guys. This is 1955. That's not really that long ago. So we need to consider the other side of this debate. Then in 1976, they presumed that there was something that had pandemic potential. 
Alright, they're compared to the Spanish flu, just like they're doing now, which is outrageous. I'm going to get into that later on. And they mandated a vaccination program in which approximately 45 million people were vaccinated in just 10 weeks with what was known back then as the swine flu vaccine. Well, if you actually look a little bit closer into this, guys, the virus itself, the flu, excuse me, it turned out to be relatively harmless. Uh, I think there were like a handful of people in total that ended up dying from this. Very, very, very small number. But by way of comparison, about several hundred people developed something known as Guillain-Barre syndrome, which can result in paralysis or even death, guys. And that's precisely what happened. In fact, 53 reported deaths were associated with this vaccination campaign back in 1976. So there is danger, is what I'm saying. And the, the moment that you begin to implement this propaganda campaign that is largely rooted in fear, just as this happened back then, it was also rooted in fear, you're actually putting people's lives potentially in danger because now you have these dodgy companies, as I already said, who are racing to produce a coronavirus vaccine. In 1976, guys, this wasn't long ago. The 50s, that wasn't long ago. So to presume that they are now in a position where they can produce vaccines in record times and there is no danger is very, very naive. So we need to be made aware, aware of that. I can tell you right now, if they start to mandate a vaccination program, there is no way in hell that I will do that. And that's not because I'm anti-vaccine, right? It's easy to dismiss somebody, oh, he's one of those. No, it's because I look at the evidence and I realize that it is dangerous to fast track a vaccine. And not only is it dangerous to fast track a vaccine, the companies that are behind this program right now that are at the forefront of this have a history of immorality and being unethical and experimenting on civilians and corruption. So all I'm saying to you, I'm not trying to entirely undermine your faith in the healthcare system by any stretch of the imagination, but question things, okay? Question obvious dangers. And then over here you can just see that, I mean, this wasn't just random rumors that were circulating around society. A number of professionals, highly respected professionals and experts, and that's also going on now, they came together and they challenged the World Health Organization and forced them to address what was taking place. It's happening now too, but you just aren't being made aware of it. I'm going to go through that with you in this presentation. We're going to hear the other side of, of the debate and listen to the other experts and what they also have to say. Because that's just as important. It's just as significant. Okay, they are also authorities. Why aren't they getting a platform to voice their opinion and their professional opinion? Why aren't we getting the opportunity to listen to them? So they had to address this. You can go look it up. It's online. And for those who want to dig a little bit deeper into that, because it is fascinating, there's this documentary of yours called Trust Who. And that's how I became wise to the fact that this took place before. It took place before, and history is repeating itself, guys. So who is GlaxoSmithKline, right? All right, it is the top pharmaceutical company based on global vaccine revenue, making astronomical amounts of money. But let's get, like I said, let's not get hung up on this debate about pro-vax versus anti-vax. Let's just simply take a look at whether this company is corrupt or not. So let's start off with bribery, right? Fine $490 million for bribery in China. And then over here you can see in Italy a very similar situation where over 4,000 doctors face charges in an Italian drug scandal with once again GlaxoSmithKline being implicated. Um, it was a total figure of 4,440 of them and it included more than 2,500 general practitioners and some 1,700 specialists. That's, that's a big deal, guys. And this is why I say you must always question authority. Look at the reach of that. Over 4,000 doctors? It's just mind-blowing. And this OVI is actually a very good article to help illuminate how GlaxoSmithKline operates. And we're going to read through this, so just bear with me. The pharmaceutical group GlaxoSmithKline has been fined $3 billion after admitting bribing doctors and encouraging the prescription of unsuitable antidepressants to children. U.S. Attorney Coleman Ortiz said, and I quote, The sales force bribed physicians to prescribe GSK products using every imaginable form of high-priced entertainment 
from Hawaiian vacations and paying doctors millions of dollars to go on speaking tours to tickets to Madonna concerts. GSK also paid for articles on his drugs to appear in medical journals okay, and independent, so-called independent doctors were hired by the company to promote the treatment according to court documents. So here we see the manipulation of the scientific and medical establishment. The prosecution said the company paid $275,000 to Dr. Drew Pinsky, who hosted a popular radio show to promote the drug on his program, in particular for unapproved uses. GlaxoSmithKline claimed it could treat weight gain, sexual dysfunction, ADHD, and bulimia. Dr. Pinsky, who had not declared his GlaxoSmithKline income to his listeners, and that's a recurring theme that we need to pay attention to, guys is that they constantly conceal their relationship with these medical authorities and scientists. That's a huge red flag. And he told, that he, he told his listeners that Wilbertrin could give women 60 orgasms a night. A study of 25 people using the drug for 8 weeks was pushed by a PR firm hired by GSK, which generated headlines including Bigger Than Viagra. It sounds too good to be true, a drug to help you stop smoking, stay happy, and lose weight. Now, when a GlaxoSmithKline funded doctor refused to remove safety concerns about the drug from an article he was writing, well, GSK simply removed his funding. One speaker, a Dr. James Pratko, he was paid nearly $1.5 million by GlaxoSmithKline over three years to speak about the drug. He also produced a DVD funded by the company which was claimed to be independent. Again, recurring theme. It was shown more than 900 times to doctors. Now, despite the large fine of $3 billion, that is far less than the profits that were made from their drugs. Avandia made two, uh, excuse me, $10.4 billion in sales. Paxil took $11.6 billion and Wolverton $5.9 billion during the years covered by the settlements. So what's happening here, essentially, guys, is that this organization, this company, which is corrupt as hell, I mean, and you're going to find that these are tactics employed consistently which suggest they are actually a policy. And because they are just getting a slap on the wrist, of course they continuously do it. It's like an investment. Okay, sure, every now and then we'll get a fine, but we're still making way more in profits. Right? I mean, if you and I did something like this, we're going to jail. But because corporations serve as a mask for agents of deception, for exploiters, they just get a fine. Nothing happens to them directly, to the shareholders behind the company, to the decision makers of the company. Almost never does anything happen to these individuals. And this whole system has to be reformed, guys. You are going to become very much aware of how corrupt this whole entire system is by the end of this presentation. There's another one, Senate report links diabetes drug Avandia to heart attacks. The FDA scientists estimated in July 2007 that Avandia was associated with approximately 83,000 heart attacks since the drug came to market. GlaxoSmithKline also undertook attempts to undermine information critical of Avandia, and GSK executives attempted to intimidate independent physicians focused on strategies to minimize or misrepresent findings that Avandia may increase cardiovascular risk and sought ways to downplay findings that a competing drug might reduce cardiovascular risk. And if you look into the information, they knew that it was dangerous, guys. They knew that this was dangerous, and they sold it anyways. Now, if those articles don't convince you how corrupt GlaxoSmithKline is, I hope to God, whether you believe there is God or not, it's inconsequential, but I hope that you will understand how serious and severe and dangerous this company is and how dodgy and unethical from this article. UK firm tried HIV drug on orphans. GlaxoSmithKline embroiled in scandal in which babies and children were allegedly used as laboratory animals. Now as you can see here, towards the bottom, one of the experiments involves giving children as young as four years old a high dosage cocktail of seven drugs at one time, guys. Orphans. Another looked at the reaction in six month old babies to a double dose of measles vaccine. And this is important to take note of, because too many people are trying to interpret the world 
through the tribal lens of left versus right, black versus white, rich versus poor, and so on and so forth. It doesn't work that way. There are predators and agents of deception, and you have to learn how to pay attention to their behavior so that you can begin to learn that they come in all shapes and sizes, and that's the real enemy. And one of the things they do, predators, is they go for the most vulnerable in society. That's why orphans, if you look at pedophiles, they also, they will target orphans because these are a vulnerable segment of the population. That's why they did these experiments on them. And then at the very end, yeah, I just wanted to include this quickly because it is interesting and relevant. Most experiments were actually funded by federal agencies, so by the government, the US government, like the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Well, guess who was the director at that time? Your boy, Anthony Fauci. And uh, just wanted to include that, because everybody acts like this dude is a knight in shining armor. No, there's plenty to do it to him if you look close enough. And he has another example, just so you don't think that was an isolated incident. In Argentina, once again, going for the vulnerable, the poor in Argentina. They tested on thousands of babies from poor families. As you can see here, the firm failed to get proper consent from the children's parents. And if you dig a little bit deeper into this, what you'll find is that 12 children, 12 of those children who participated in what they called Protocol Compass, and that was the GSK vaccine experimentation, 12 of them died. Now again, through the legal system, they were never found guilty of wrongdoing. But what do you think is going to happen when poor people from Argentina go to court go in the legal system against a multi, multi-billion dollar organization, potentially multi-trillion dollar organization like GlaxoSmithKline. You think they're going to get justice? Of course not, guys. Of course not. But GSK is not alone in this by any stretch of the imagination, guys. Corruption and bribery, they are common. They are common, endemic for the big pharmaceutical companies. In fact, I would argue that they are policies. They are part of their playbook. Take a look at this article over here, for example, that I just showed with you, where children as young as three months old were experimented on and used as, and I quote, laboratory animals, alongside GlaxoSmithKline, was the US drug firm, the pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. Something similar happened, again with Pfizer, in Nigeria, where the Nigerian government sued Pfizer for $7 billion over, and I quote, illegal tests on children. If you look deeper into this, 11 of those children died, guys. Okay, 11 innocent kids died. Just take a moment to think about that. And now this company is being tasked and has been tasked with public health and safety, but not only that, they are tasked with providing us with the coronavirus vaccine. Don't you think we should potentially question the safety, the integrity of this company? I think so. They got away with only paying 45 million pounds and the victim's families made it very clear that they did not consent, okay? But of course, Pfizer claimed, now that the Nigerian government knew about it, and the parents were fully informed. And I can almost guarantee you they implemented very similar tactics to GlaxoSmithKline, which is you target those who are illiterate or poor who don't fully understand what you're saying. You entice them. And if you look a little bit deeper, you see I've got an ex-employee claimed that Pfizer bribed Nigerian government officials to avoid any backlash, to avoid people speaking out and finding out what really took place. That, that is the nature of these organizations, guys. That, this is a dodgy industry. Extremely dangerous and dodgy industry. And then some WikiLeaks cables that were leaked also corroborated this further. That Pfizer, they knew what they had done was wrong, and so they tried to cover it up. And yeah, again, Pfizer fined for a decade of bribery. They were fined $60 million dollars Mickey Mouse slap on the wrist in the grand scheme of things. This is a multi, multi billion dollar company, extremely rich company. They got a little fine, $60 million, by US regulators for bribing doctors and government officials in Eastern Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. So, this is why I said this is it's a policy. You can clearly see these tactics are part of their playbook, right? You can absolutely see these are part of their playbook, guys, undoubtedly. And the reason why is there's no real repercussions. They aren't being held accountable properly. I mean, what is $60 million? Do you really think they care about $60 million? It's an investment. If you or I does anything like this, we are going to jail. But when they do it, it's perfectly fine. Just get a little slap on the wrist and you move on. And behind these organizations, 
They are families, powerful families, they are powerful individuals, and they aren't being held responsible. It's a very, very corrupt system, and I know you may feel powerless in, in dealing with all of this, and understandably so, but awareness is the key, guys. Just spray this. Make your friends aware of it. Make your family aware of it. Talk about it. Okay? How do you get how do you overcome the darkness of deception with the light of truth? It's very simple. I study revolutions historically. It is always preceded by awareness. So for now, don't say what can I do? Just spread the information. That's all it is. Snowball effect, dominoes. What's the dominoes for? And we have Eli Lilly and Company over here, also bribery. And, and this is a, a common theme, bribery. Always bribing doctors, always bribing scientific officials. And by the way, Eli Lilly and Company, during what was known as MK Ultra with the Central Intelligence Agency, when they unethically experimented on civilians, innocent civilians, without their knowledge, they were the ones that supplied the LSD. I know this shit might sound crazy to those who have not ever heard of that, but go look it up, right? As I said earlier in this presentation, don't blindly believe anyone, but don't blindly dismiss them either. Go look into it. See if it's aligned with reality. See if it's aligned with the truth, because it is. Now we have Sanofi bribery again. And, and this is such a red flag because they have a consistent policy, these companies, of bribing healthcare officials. Bristol Myers and Squibb. Also bribery, and if we take a closer look at Bristol Myers Squibb, what do we see again? Experimenting on innocent civilians. Over here, Guatemalans are suing Bristol Myers Squibb before US court for having been infected with syphilis without their consent. It's just, it's so insane, guys. It's like, it's like being in the twilight zone, in the, or a crazy movie, a, this crazy story, right? It's outrageous. And go look into it. Don't blindly believe me. I want you to go look into it. And as you can see, this was a very recent story. Last year, 2019. And if you take a closer look, because it gets even a little bit crazier, we have one of the most prestigious universities in the world that have been implicated in this, which is Johns Hopkins University, who were also involved in MK Ultra with the CIA, does unethical experiments on the civilian population. And then, who else? The Rockefeller Foundation. And the Rockefeller Foundation so many times, for those who may recall, I think it was 2017, I did a presentation where I focused a little bit on that. That's where this ultimately goes, guys. These, these foundations, many of them, it's just basically the wolf putting on the sheep's clothing. They know that you blindly believe in appearances, that we blindly believe. I don't want to be patronizing or condescending, right? That's how deception operates, guys. It will hide itself in the best possible disguise that it can find. And that's what many of these foundations do. All right? But we're going to get into that in the second part of the presentation. Now you have Novartis, $700 million for bribery. And now you see Johnson & Johnson fines $70 million for bribing doctors. And by way of extension, that's why we have to constantly question the scientific establishment and the medical establishment because you have this monster in the corner there, a trillion dollar industry, and you can buy a lot of influence with a trillion dollar piggy bank that are influencing these doctors and scientists in terrible ways. And we are going to get into that because it is shocking to say the least. Now we have Johnson & Johnson found liable also in fueling the opioid epidemic in the United States. Then another company, right, Purdue Pharma, they were also implicated in the opioid epidemic in a massive, massive way. They are the makers of OxyContin. And uh, behind, of course, the Purdue Pharma is the Sackler family. And that's, like I said, it's so important to understand, guys. Behind these powerful corporations, there's powerful families or these powerful individuals. And those are the people. Because we talk about corporations and countries and intelligence agencies and so on and so forth as if they are real people. 
or in religions and all of these different um, intangible groups as though they are people or you know scientific establishment. science said this religion said this no there's people behind them and that's what we need to be concerned with each of these are like vehicles right so science science is a vehicle it depends who's driving that vehicle that's where the destination goes very simple same with religion you can get somebody who can use religion for a good thing, drive that vehicle in a positive way, power others, feed the homeless, so on and so forth. Or you can get somebody who will drive that vehicle and indoctrinate and manipulate and exploit people. That's, it's all about who's driving the vehicle, guys. That's what we need to be more concerned with. We need to look beyond the surface appearances. You know, we have Johnson & Johnson. They were fined $4.7 billion dollars. Because their, pay, their baby powder was linked to cancer. And it wasn't just linked to cancer. As you can see, j and is battling 9,000 cases on allegations that its talc-based products cause cancer. Well, according to this Reuters investigation over here, Johnson & Johnson knew for decades that their baby powder caused cancer, that it was linked to cancer, that it had asbestos. And they tried to cover it up. Guys, this is just... it's. It's mind-numbing levels of corruption. And the fact that they aren't being shut down shows you how complicit, and if not complicit, how irresponsible governments are in the administration of justice. Of course you should be shut down when something like this happens. Right? It's just logical. But no, now these are the companies that have been tasked with not only continuing their policies and taking care of public health, taking care of public health, but they are the ones at the forefront of producing a coronavirus vaccine. I mean, don't you think that we should be somewhat suspicious based on evidence, based on reality? And there's never going to be real justice in the system until we begin to realize that the highest, at the highest peak, at the top of the proverbial pyramid, it's deception. We're not living in a world that, uh, in a world that is ruled by integrity and truth, guys. It is our job to dethrone deception to dethrone those who are unethical and immoral and then instead enthrone integrity and truth because you know we're so focused on politics and left and right and following this leader and this no the true leader of this world is integrity it's a human principle it's humanity it's a human principle you follow human leaders guess what they are going to lead you astray eventually because human beings are flawed if you follow human principles then you will find your way you will find your purpose we got Takeda Pharmaceuticals in Japan, very similar scenario. You will find six billion dollars of a bladder cancer cover up for their diabetes drug, Actos. I mean, it's it's just crazy, guys. Just snowballs. AstraZeneca takes six million dollar hit. See, what is six million dollars to these companies? It's it's a joke. Imagine somebody finds you one dollar for doing something wrong. Do you, is it really going to take a toll on you? Of course not. Six million dollars after faking conferences. Faking conferences, guys. That is my faking conferences to bribe doctors. It's just outrageous. I mean, it's it's so crazy. It really is. And yeah, this is more current events where it's still going through the, the legal system, the trustworthy legal system. Justice Department investigating claims that drug companies funded terrorism in Iraq. I mean, it's just outrageous. And who are some of the companies involved, which are of particular interest in relation to the topic at hand? Johnson & Johnson again, Pfizer, Roche, and then AstraZeneca. See, these companies have no moral compass, and yet they are associated, and they are in the field where that is the number one thing we should be concerned with, besides the actual expertise of helping people, is morality. Do you actually have a concern for human well-being? Clearly not. Over here we have Merck and Company to pay more than $650 million to resolve claims of fraudulent price reporting and then kickbacks. Once again, bribery. Right? It's a recurring theme. And, and look guys, I'm not trying to undermine your faith entirely in this establishment. But this should light a fire under our asses to understand that we need to demand that there are serious repercussions, a zero tolerance policy, and that this whole entire system is reformed. And this is just, that's really the tip of the iceberg. I'm focusing on this particular scenario. But in my book, I go into much more detail about how ubiquitous this is. How it infects every part of the system. Okay, it comes from the top of the proverbial pyramid. And it, that infection just spreads downwards. 
but it comes from the top. And the way it's going to change is not from the top, it's from the bottom, it's from us. And it can be changed, alright? It can be changed. The power in the people is more powerful than the people in power. No joke. And then yeah, Moken Company. I mean, there, there's no level too low that they won't stoop to. They published a fake journal. The big pharma company paid publisher Elsevier to create something with the look and feel of a peer-reviewed publication to serve as a marketing tool. I mean, this is just insane levels of deception, you guys. And these are the people tasked with helping us with our health. And I'm not, I'm not trying to freak you out. Again, I'm not trying to scare you. I don't want to completely and entirely shake your faith and induce panic. Let me actually go into that very quickly. Because as some of you know, I used to suffer from anxiety and PTSD. I had panic attacks daily. I know how horrible it is. That something like this, it can trigger you. And if you feel that way, then maybe put it down for a little bit. Go take a breather, calm yourself. That's a Always be mindful of how you are feeling on the inside. But if you can stick with it, by the end of this, this is going to be empowering. It's just that disillusionment is a difficult process, guys. But it's followed by enlightenment, which is empowering. And that's my, that's my whole purpose here. I want to empower you with the truth. And, and very quickly as well, there's so many people out there that they think they're doing a good job just sharing the truth, but they slap people in the face with the truth, so to speak. And that's just as counterproductive as ignorance, guys. Fear can be just as counterproductive as ignorance. So think about your delivery with people. We don't want to scare the shit out of people to where it traumatizes them. All right? We have a duty. For those who know, you have a duty to empower others. And it's not enough just to know the truth. You have to know how to deliver and administer the truth in a way in which you help people to get better rather than making them more sick. And, I mean, this is a very powerful industry, guys. It's a multi-trillion dollar business. It's a multi-trillion dollar business. As you can see, over here, profitability of large pharmaceutical companies compared with other large public companies. And this study over here from West Health Policy Center in conjunction with Johns Hopkins University, they found that these big pharmaceutical companies, they could lose $1 trillion in sales, guys, and they would still be the most profitable industry in the world. Just take a moment to pause and contemplate that. They could lose $1 trillion in profit and still be the most wealthy industry, most profitable industry on the planet. Mind-blowing. This is also, again, uh, this encapsulates, once again, how dodgy and unethical they are. Because there are millions of people. Over here, this report shows that 58 million people, according to Gallup, uh, adults, they report the inability to pay for needed drugs, and this is just in the United States. There's hundreds of millions of people in the world that are in that same boat, maybe even more than a billion, who knows? And yet, these companies are inflating the prices. It's not necessary. This report was just from a few months ago, November 2019. So they can actually get these life-saving medications to people, but they're more concerned with profit. This is a very dodgy and dangerous, dangerous industry, guys. It needs to be reformed. And the key in doing that, you might be saying, well, Gavin, what the hell am I supposed to do? We can all help to spread awareness. And if you study history as assiduously as I do, the key to all revolutionary change and positive change is awareness. That is the first step. And we can all contribute in that regard. And here we go, just to show how ubiquitous the influence is in this publication, Conflicts of Interest and the Patient-Doctor Covenants, 90% they show, excuse me, clinical practice guidelines hold the greatest potential for influencing patient care, right? The guidelines. Well, for some guidelines, 90% or more of the committee members that create these guidelines have financial links with the companies, the big pharmaceutical companies, whose products they are espousing, making the guidelines little more than a marketing tool, guys. Over here in this study, study affirms pharma's influence on physicians, almost 94%, almost all, excuse me, it was 94% to be succinct, of the family practitioners, internists, pediatricians, cardiologists, general surgeons, and anesthesiologists surveyed said they accepted drug company money or gifts. Loads of influence here, guys. Huge influence. And this right here, for me personally, really embodies probably more so than any other slide I've shared with you thus far, how menacing the influence is. 
The pharmaceutical industry funds about half of the costs of continuing medical education programs in the US. I'm not trying to shake your faith entirely in the medical industry, but you need to question authority, guys. And here's an excellent example that was published in the study Pharma Influence Widespread in Medical Schools. A textbook that was given to students was published by Purdue Pharma. All right, Purdue Pharma, which has been uh, implicated massively in the opioid epidemic. Last time I checked, they actually, I think, are going to shut down. It was so bad. But look into that. Don't quote me on that. But Purdue Pharma has been implicated in the opioid epidemic in the United States. The make of OxyContin. And in addition, the researcher found that the lecturer, Dr. Roman Jovi, had received money from Purdue Pharma as well in the past. This is who's educating these doctors. That's dangerous, guys. So we have these unethical, documented, verifiable, dodgy companies educating, rather indoctrinating in all likelihood, these medical practitioners and doctors. Much of what the drug industry does fulfills the criteria for organized crime in US law. And they behave in many ways like the mafia does. They corrupt everyone they can corrupt. They have bought every type of person, even including ministers of health in some countries. So there is a huge amount of corruption. In, in my country, for example, Denmark, we are regarded as having very little corruption. But yet we have thousands of doctors on industry payroll although we are just 20,000 doctors. So this is an effective kind of corruption. The drug industry buys the professors first, then chiefs of department, then other chief physicians and so on. They don't buy junior doctors. So when several thousands are on industry payroll, it's really, really bad. Again, I'm not trying to completely undermine your faith, but question what's going on. Be mindful that there is a, there is a dodgy industry that is influencing our lives in astronomical and unprecedented ways. And yet again, in the United States, who is the leading lobbying industry? For those who don't know what lobbying is, because they use language, language like George Collins said, by and large, is used to conceal the truth. Lobbying is bribing, guys. Okay, guys? That's, okay. That's simply what it is. Lobbying is bribing. It's where you give financial incentives to politicians to act on new legislation, passing new laws that are favorable to you. And what do you see who's at the top? Pharmaceutical industry. In fact, they almost spend twice as much as the next industry. Again, showing their influence. And if you take a little bit of a closer look, for example, yeah, in the United States with the CDC Foundation, they are receiving money from all of the big pharmaceutical companies and of course the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Go look it up. This is open knowledge. It's there on their website. You just have to go seek it out. Go, don't go to the CDC's website because they don't list this stuff. The CDC's foundation, which handles this kind of thing, they do. And then if you look at the foundation for the National Institutes of Health, it's stacked with big pharma representatives. Stacked, guys. Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. And who do we see at the very bottom here? Who's that lady? Jillian Sackler from the corrupt Sackler family, guys. They also have in direct partnership, the FDA, the National Institute of Health, are in direct partnership and they founded the Biomarkers Consortium with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. And the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, guys, it's a trade group representing all the big pharmaceutical companies. And as you can see over here, in 2017 alone, they spent $128 million dollars on lobbying, which essentially, like I said, it's bribing, lobbying the US government. Same thing in the UK, in whatever country you're in, if you scratch close enough, if you investigate deep enough, and wherever you are, whoever you are, I encourage you, look into this. We need to collectively stand together and find a way to expose the darkness of deception, guys. And the NHS is the same thing, except they're more secretive of, uh, about it based on what I've looked into. Uh, you see $57 million into UK patient charities, which could influence NHS drug decision makers, report fines. Then yeah, we have the Africa CDC, and the influence over here, yeah, it's, it's more indirect, it's more skillful. So five of their partners currently, we have CEPI, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, Project Echo, and Chattanoas. So let's take a closer look at them, right? We have to investigate. You never take things at their surface appearance. That's not how we establish the truth, ever. CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, if you take a closer look at them, 
They were founded by the Gates Foundation, which I've already explained is in partnership, or has huge investments and also is in partnership, excuse me, with the big pharmaceutical industry. They were founded by the Gates Foundation in cooperation with the Wellcome Trust, which also has a very close relationship with the big pharma industry. And they are in direct partnership with an organization called the IFPMA, which is the International Federation Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. Very, very powerful big pharma um, trade association. It's a very, very powerful company. And they partner very closely with the Gates Foundation. So essentially, and we're gonna get into this more detail now, I just wanna to touch on it just very quickly. They are a front group. Okay, they portray themselves as a non-profit, but it's very much a, a front group, and we're going to explore that a little bit more later on. Then we have, like I said, the Gates Foundation, huge investments in the pharmaceutical industry, so that's a major conflict of interest, very, very obviously, and you're going to see the Gates Foundation everywhere in all of this. His influence, that uh, foundation's influence is ubiquitous. It's all over the place. It's prolific. But we will explore that a little bit more later on. So the next one is USAID, right, which is uh, from the US government, so-called from the American people, right, taking your taxpayers' monies and essentially giving it actually to corporations. It's not so much to benefit, to genuinely benefit the innocent. And they are currently being financed or in partnership with, once again, the Gates Foundation, Merck and Company, uh, Pfizer, experimenting on Nigerian kids, and which led to their deaths, that Pfizer. And then we have Johnson & Johnson, Roche and then GlaxoSmithKline. So it's, it's a bit more strategic, it's a bit more indirect, but there's still big farmers' influence, undoubtedly. The next one is Project Echo. And I mean, of course, when you see, when you look at these, you think Project Echo, I mean, it's so innocuous, that doesn't sound dangerous, that doesn't sound suspicious. And that's precisely how they mean to operate. They want to insulate themselves. That's how deception operates. They try to hide themselves behind as many masks as they possibly can. They are currently in partnership with Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck and Company. And I think Bristol Myers Squibb, which as I said earlier, got caught experimenting on innocent civilians against their consent, infecting them with syphilis in Guatemala, they are specifically focused on Africa. So this is probably their go-between, it's Project Echo, to get to the Africa CDC. And then the last one is Chatham House. And uh, Chatham House, also they receive generous funding from Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and again, you see this organization, the IFPMA, and then you see this over here, the European Scientific Working Group on Influenza. And that sounds really legit, right? That, I mean, that sounds like a legit organization. Science is in the title, right? The European Scientific Working Group. Well, if we take a closer look at them, guys, we see that they are financed by the big pharma industry. We see Hoffman LaRoche. AstraZeneca, GlaxoSmithKline, Sequoia, Sanofi, Mylan, and Janssen, which is a Johnson & Johnson subsidiary. So it's a, it's a front group, guys. Like I said, the players change, but the game stays the same. And I'm going to repeat myself because I want it to sink in. I want you guys to understand how these agents of deception operate so that we can intelligently defend ourselves against their insidious manipulation and thus create a better world. Alright, that's why we're here. Stop acting so small, stop playing so small, we got to change this world. And if you take a closer look, it's, it's an influential group, guys. For example, you got this guy, he's a part of the European Scientific Working Group on Influenza, Professor Roman Primula. Alright, he is the current Deputy Minister in the Czech Republic. So, I mean, it's, it just shows you, they, they've got their ways. And of course, when you hear that, as a researcher, it sounds legit, so you don't really, you know, look into it. But remember, deception hides itself. It always hides itself behind surface appearances, behind authority. Oh, that sounds legit. No need to question it. No, no, no. Always question if you want to find the truth. And we have the UN Foundation. Also, close partnership with a bunch of dodgy companies. I mean, it's just outrageous. From a moral standpoint, how can you be in partnership with, with, with these companies knowing what they've done? All right? Pfizer experimenting on Nigerian children or on orphans in the United States. Takeda Pharmaceuticals covering up how their product caused cancer. Johnson & Johnson also uh, covering up cancer. I mean, it's, it's just, it's outrageous, guys. And it is, that's not the only one. The UN Foundation is also in partnership, last time I checked, with Nestle and, uh, and Mars, both of which have been implicated in child slave labor, exploitation for cocoa production. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. So, 
showing you all of that, it's to help you understand that Big Pharma, guys, Big Pharma is like Big Tobacco, but on steroids. I mean, I've studied Big Tobacco in and out, a lot of it I document, like I said in the book, and I document, in an, I document it in the same way that I'm sharing this presentation with you, is to help you understand the patterns so that we can defend ourselves against the psychological manipulation that is meant to essentially indoctrinate us and exploit us. Okay, now with that knowledge, with that understanding, about how dodgy the big pharma industry is and how influential and how it focuses on buying doctors, bribing scientists and so on and so forth. With that understanding, let's begin to take a closer look at the scientists advising the governments around the world and the World Health Organization. Let's take a closer look at their links to the pharma industry. So let's start with over here, Professor Neil Ferguson, right? Mr. Mr. Allstar, who helped kick off all of this madness with his ridiculous theoretical model. So he's a former consultant, paid consultant for GlaxoSmithKline and Alfred LaRoche, and he comes from Imperial College London, who, like I said, they're in partnership with the big pharmaceutical companies. And the first major red flag, I mean, aside from his past history, right, we, we can actually start, let's start with his past history. Already 2009 swine flu, he produced a theoretical model they claimed that 7.5 million people would die. Because of this, it resulted in billions of dollars being spent on vaccines. And in the end, about 14,000 people died. I mean, the moment somebody does this, naturally, whether you are the media, whether you are government, whether you are the World Health Organization, you should have suspicions. I mean, this was ridiculous. This guy did this. He's got past relationships, past links to the pharmaceutical industries that will profit from a pandemic. And he produced this ridiculous model just 10 years ago. And now he's doing the same thing, right? Again, over here, this, this research paper, which was never published in a scientific journal, never ever peer-reviewed, which claimed that 40 million people would die. As if the original prediction he made 10 years ago when the swine flu was not bad enough, he says 40 million people will die unless we start to do these stringent lockdowns. These... these Crazy quarantines and lockdowns and shut down the world economy and forced unemployment, unless we do that. Well, since that time, other researchers, other scientists have looked into this study, this mathematical, ridiculous study, and they claim that it's totally unreliable and it's impossible to read. So, in my opinion, Professor Neil Ferguson, he needs to be investigated criminally. Because he's putting, he, not, is he, he's not just only doing it now, he's already done it. He's put people's lives at risk. And I guarantee you that people have died prematurely as a result of his fear-mongering and his social isolation policies. So these this big red flags is what I'm saying here. Obvious conflicts of interest, right? Obvious conflicts of interest. But rather than focusing on this and the media going into depth and exploring this more as they have done, what we find is this ridiculous tabloid headline. Right? Remember what I said? inattentional blindness. It's a tactic to obviously induce inattentional blindness. Oh geez, people are starting to become aware how illegitimate all of this is in this guy's terrible history. So let's come up with this tabloid news headline. And don't get me wrong, this has its place and its position to just help illustrate and help us understand how this guy, he doesn't believe the shit that he's feeding us. Right? The stuff that he's trying to sell us, he himself doesn't buy into, which is to do these lockdowns. But beyond that, this is just a tabloid so the ridiculous headline. There's far more significant important things going on with his character that we need to look into. Then beyond him, there's this lady of yeah, Maria Zambon. She's the director of reference microbiology for public health. Maria Zambon also comes from Imperial College London and she has done past work for Sanofi, Novartis, CSL, which is uh, the owner of Sequeris, and GlaxoSmithKline. And she was also involved in the whole swine flu pandemic thing. She was one of the individuals whose advice encouraged the World Health Organization to declare the swine flu to be a pandemic. So just, just huge red flags. And now they're advising the government again, like they didn't do a bad enough job the first time around. It's crazy. And then we have another guy from Imperial College London, and he currently serves on CEPI. And we're going to go into who CEPI is a little bit more later on. Essentially, it's a big pharma front company. That's pretty much what it is. We're going to get into that later. And he's also worked for Takeda Pharmaceuticals and also the Gates Foundation. And just to illustrate one more time, guys, and I am going to, like I said, repeat myself because I want it to resonate. I want this to sink in. 
it's a problem that these people are coming from Imperial College London, not only because of the partnerships they have with the pharmaceutical companies that are going to profit from this, this pandemic, but because they themselves are profiting from it, right? They just, as you can see over here, where they posted that they have received a further 18.5 million pounds in taxpayers' money from the UK government to create a coronavirus vaccine. So just obvious conflicts of interest. And then a fourth person, so we have four people that are from Imperial College London that are now advising the UK government <laughs> on something that's going to benefit them. This lady over here, Professor Alison Holmes, she's one of the directors of the National Institute for Health Research, and she's also done past work for Merck and Company. Then we have Dr. Mary Ramsey, she's the head of immunization at Public Health England, she's done past work for GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer. And remember, I want you to recall how dodgy these organizations are. From a moral standpoint, how I would never, ever do work for these companies. And then these two over here, they are a couple, and together, they were, between the two of them, they've done work for Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and GlaxoSmithKline. This is Robert West and Susan Michi. And then we have this dude over here, a little bit higher up the totem pole. He's the chief medical officer for England, Jonathan Fantam. He's uh, the deputy chief, sorry, medical officer for England. And he's held a high ranking positions in GlaxoSmithKline, often the Roche and Sanofi guys. And then the big dog, Sir Patrick Vallis, he's the chief scientific advisor for the UK government. And he came from being the head of research and development at GlaxoSmithKline. Now some people will say, oh, you know, well, he, he used to work there. What's, what's the big deal with that, Gavin? The big deal, as I've already shown, so evidence-based, aligned with reality, aligned with the truth, is that GlaxoSmithKline, they have a policy, as do other big pharma companies, they have a policy, clearly, as you can see, it's an unwritten policy, because you can't put that stuff out there, but based on their history, they have a policy of trying to make experts, scientific advisors, doctors, and medical authorities appear as being independent, without disclosing their interests with GlaxoSmithKline. So when somebody is coming from GlaxoSmithKline, that's a red flag. It just, it warrants further investigation and, and scrutiny. Then beyond the UK government, we have obviously the United States government, the White House Coronavirus Task Force, right? Let's take a closer look at them. So we have Robert Redfield, he's the director of the CDC. As I already explained, guys, the CDC Foundation are very close to the big pharma companies, either receiving funding or in partnership with them. And we have Dr. Stephen Hahn, the head of the FDA. And a number of individuals who are formerly uh, former heads of FDA have also got close relationships with the big pharma companies. I'm going to mention two of them, another two ones in this presentation. As I said, the FDA is currently in partnership through the Biomarkers Consortium with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, which is a huge lobbying organization for the big pharma companies. Another red flag. I mean, it's just the conflicts of interest are just outrageous. And then these two dudes from the NIH, Right, we pretty much all know who Anthony Fauci is and then Francis Collins who is the director of the NIH. And the NIH is also in partnership with this lobbying group, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. But if you take a look at the NIH's foundation, you, they are just packed. The board members are its just big, big pharma companies. It's crazy. I mean, like I said, their tentacles are just reaching everywhere. And given the history, given their dodgy tactics, covering up cancer, experimenting on civilians, bribery, 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 and more bribery. Those are red flags, guys, right? And then if we take a closer look at Anthony Fauci, we see that he has either worked closely in collaboration or been instrumental in PEPFAR, which is the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and in the Decade of Vaccines collaboration. Then if we take a look at PEPFAR, Anthony Fauci has been described as the so-called architect of PEPFAR. Well, you know, PEP4 works very closely with the big pharmaceutical companies. Currently, they're in partnership with Merck and Company, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and then Gilead Sciences, which are all set to profit from this. And once again, we have the Gates Foundation. You can find the Gates Foundation's fingerprints are just all over this, guys. And then beyond that, we also have the, de the Decade excuse me, of Vaccines Collaboration, which is the Gates Foundation and the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. Well, if we take a closer look at Gavi, it was founded, two of the founding members of significance to us here is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the IFPMA, right? the big pharma conglomerate pretty much that, uh, that represents all the pharma companies, the International Federation Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. And 
they are founding with a partner, although they are not shown at the forefront that way. If you take a look at the actual paperwork, the IFPMA was a co-founder, a co-founding member of the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. And Gavi is in many ways. It's another front group, guys. We're going to get into it in more, more detail later on. So he, he very much clearly has links to the big pharma companies as well, guys. Then we have, of course, um, Deborah Burks. She's the ambassador at large of PEPFOR which is significant, as I already explained, who's behind them. And she's also a board member of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And again, if we look at the Global Fund, it's a partnership. It was founded by the Gates Foundation. And it's also a partnership with a bunch of private industry partners, but one of them is to cater pharmaceuticals. So they are, the, the influence of big pharma is there, is what I'm saying. It's more indirect, but it is there. Then we have uh, the U.S. Secretary of Health, Alex Azar. Well, Alex Azar, he was a, a former big pharma lobbyist, and he was the president of the U.S. division of Eli Lilly and Company, which I explained earlier, Eli Lilly and Company, that's the company that uh, supplied the CIA with the, uh, the LSD that they were using in MK Ultra, and he's a former board member of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Then we have Joe Grogan, and this is another dude, another former lobbyist for Gilead. So we see the influence of the big pharma companies. It's, it's just everywhere, guys. And that is, like I said, it's a red flag. You can't have the companies that are set to profit from this. You can't have people who have either past or present relationships with them then advising governments. It's a, an obvious conflict of interest. I shouldn't have to even explain that. And Gilead of the IEC, they are announcing a $3,120 price tag for the COVID-19 drug that they are developing. But this drug was developed using taxpayer money. And that's another topic for another day. But if you look into it, that's precisely what happens. Taxpayers pay for the development of these drugs that they have to pay for. The corruption is, it's so, it's, it's profound. It's mind-numbing. It's, it's so disturbing, guys. And then it's no surprise Donald Trump... He, he ended up naming this guy to be his so-called vaccine czar, to be in, uh, in charge of so-called Operation Warp Speed, which is to fast-track the vaccine. And then Yai in South Africa, who's advising the South African government, take a closer look at them. And whatever, I'm not going to go through every country, guys. Obviously, that would take days to, you know, for you to watch a presentation going through every single country. But wherever you are, whoever you are, take a closer look. And you are going to find the influence of the big pharma companies in one way or another. So here we have Professor Muhammad Yunus Musa. He's the chief specialist and head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And he has done work for Pfizer. You know, Pfizer experimenting on kids without parental consent in Nigeria, which resulted in 11 or 12 of their deaths. And then we have these two individuals together. They chair the Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And that's Cheryl Cohen and Anne von Gottberg. Von Gottberg is probably how it's pronounced. And they've both done work for Pfizer. And they've both done work for Sanofi. And then Anne von Gottberg has also done work for Novartis. And then Professor Helen Rios. She's a big time player. She's very influential and she serves on many different groups. As you can see over here with the Gavi Alliance and CEPI, we're going to get into them a little bit more later on in detail, then also the Gates Foundation. So she chairs the Gavi Program and Policy Committee. She also chairs the Scientific Advisory Board for CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. Uh, she chairs the African Regional Immunization Technical Advisory Group as well, which is uh, for the World Health Organization. And then she's a member of the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group. So she, she's very influential, guys. Very influential scientist. And we're going to see you again momentarily. Oh, yes, and just so people understand, the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group is also a lot of influence with Big Pharma over there, if you look into it. But it, it goes deeper than this, guys. We, there's a far more than material profit involved here, and we'll get into that in the second part of the presentation. And then the chair of this group is this dude over here, Professor Shabir Madi. And, I mean, this cat, he's just a, it's like a prostitute for the big pharma companies, it looks like. See, Janssen OVR, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Sanofi, Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Novavax, and he's also done work with the Gates Foundation. And these relationships are either very recently, or they are currently happening, right? Some of them are a little bit further back, but I mean, all of it is, 
it's something we should be concerned with. Because when you look at the track record of these big pharmaceutical companies and their policies of, of just deceptive marketing and corruption and experimenting on civilians and covering up cancer and so on and so forth, it's red flags, guys. It's huge red flags. Then we have SAGE, the Working Group on COVID-19 Vaccines. This was just established in June, so it's very recently. We take a look at some of their members, and again, the influence is there, but it's, it's very indirect with some of them. So you see here we have Dr. Hannah Noyanek. She's the Chief Physician at the Finnish Institute for Health and Wealth, and she currently works on studies funded by the Innovative Medicines Initiative. So you're probably saying, yeah, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, that sounds innocuous. That doesn't sound like a problem. That sounds legit, right? Well, if we take a closer look, for example, the Innovative Medicines Initiative that's financed <laughs> by the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. That's another big pharma group. And then for the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, they are, they are either in partnership or being funded by AstraZeneca, Novartis and GlaxoSmithKline. In fact, GlaxoSmithKline is one of their top 10 donors. So again, the influence is there, it's just more indirect. That's how deception operates, guys. It wears a mask. It presents itself as a sheep, but inwardly it's a wolf. And they know that. They know that we are beholden to appearances, unfortunately. Most people can be easily convinced just by appearance. And another example of this is over here, Dr. Falake Ulayinke. And we see she's with John Snow Incorporated, the Aspen Institute, and then the Maternal and Child Survival Program. All of which, I mean, it sounds legit, right? There, there can't be a problem there. Well, if you take a closer look, right, we see big farmers influence everywhere and the Gates Foundations influence everywhere. All right, we just, just got to become wise to these tactics, guys. Just got to dig a little bit deeper. Then we have this dude, Professor Peter Smith. He currently works for Sanofi and he's also an advisor to Takeda and CEPI. And then another individual who's also advising the UK government is this guy again, Professor Nicholas Grassley of the Imperial College of London, and also who's advising the South African government, we have Professor Helen Rios. Then we have Helen Talbot, she's a former principal investigator in Sanofi vaccine trials. And yeah, we have this dude named Professor Adam Finn. Um, he's either presently or in the past, he did paid consultancy work for GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi. And the reason why I say either past or present is because the source from which you get the information, which is Congress Med, they don't actually specify. But he's also a very influ influential individual, excuse me. He's the current head of Bristol Children's Vaccine Center. He's the current president of the European Society for Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And he's also the current chair of ETSAGE, which is a group that actually advises the European region on immunization for the World Health Organization, and they are put forward as being quote-unquote independent. But if you take a closer look, I mean, clearly they're not so independent. If this guy over here, he's done work for the pharmaceutical companies. If you take a closer look, three of their members have got either past or present links to the pharmaceutical industry. Remember this dude that I pointed out earlier with the European Scientific Working Group on Influenza, which is essentially a front group for Big Pharma? Well, he's also a part of this so-called advisory independent group. And then there's also Professor F Federico Martignon Torres, and he's with Sanofi, Glaxo uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Novartis, Pfizer, and Merck and Company. And then the big boy, right? I mean, this is an important guy that you've got to have on the payroll, or have some influence over, the Director General of the World Health Organization, so-called doctor, because he's not a doctor, just take a closer look into it, Tedros Adhanom. And this dude over here for the past 15 years, he's worked for these different organizations. And again, if you look at it on the surface, right, the surface, it looks legitimate. You know, we've got you know, from 2005 to 2009, he was the co-chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. In 2007 to 2009, he was the chair of the Rollback Malaria Partnership. 2008 to 2009, he was a board member of Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance. 2009 to 2011, he was the chair of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. 2011 to 2017, to 2017, he was a member of the Aspen Institute and currently, he's a steering member of every woman, every child alongside Melinda Gates. So it sounds legit, I mean, what an outstanding record. But if we look deeper, what do we find? Once again, 
The Gates Foundation is involved in every single one of these organizations, either partnering or has directly founded these institutions, and also the big pharma companies, right? I mean, in, essentially, when, when you look at this dude, what you have to realize is he has a guy that for the past 15 years, he has worked extremely close with the big pharma companies, very, very close with the big pharma companies and the Gates Foundation. That requires some scrutiny and some further investigation for obvious reasons. And then also, if we see who's financing the World Health Organization, collectively, when you take into account the Gates Foundation and the Gavi Alliance, which are, they are pharma, big pharma partners. We're going to get into that in more detail in, in a little bit, guys. But like I said already, the Gates Foundation has huge investments in the big pharmaceutical industries. And then the Gavi Alliance was co-founded by the IFPMA, by the big pharma industry itself. So these are big pharma partners. So we have two... Big Pharma partners that are donating, and that money cannot be used however the World Health Organization wants. It has to be used for certain purposes. We need to look into that. Donating over $900 million, which means that their collective input makes them the top donors of the World Health Organization. That's a red flag. Especially when the World Health Organization is the one that is behind the declaration of the pandemic. I mean, the conflicts of interest are just everywhere, guys. And then no surprise, yeah, who does the World Health Organization name to, to head their coronavirus vaccine drive? A guy from GlaxoSmithKline, ex-GSK chief, Andrew Whitty, right? Now, beyond this, because what we have to understand, this is setting a very dangerous precedent, guys. If we don't start to speak out, in spite of the, uh, of the censorship, if we don't start to inform our family members about what's really going on, and I'm going to get into uh, the disease itself, all right? I'm just, this is just the beginning. I want to help you understand the conflicts of interest. We are still going to climb a mountain. This is just the beginning, all right? Tip of the iceberg. But beyond what's going on with this COVID-19 thing, it sets a dangerous precedent that in the future, there's going to be more pandemics declared because they see how easy it is for them. And when they see how profitable, how rich it makes them, it's going to just encourage them to do it again. And they're already talking about that now. So yeah, you see China researchers discover new swine flu with quote unquote pandemic potential. And this is a danger because there's a group called the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework Advisory Group. You've probably never heard of them before. But their job is to train governments around the world on how they react and respond to when a pandemic is declared. And if you take a closer look at them, I mean, I looked through the list, and it's not too difficult to find this information on the World Health Organization's website. It's fairly easy. It comes up in the search results. And you see at the bottom here a disclaimer, and they try to make it sound like they're so aligned with integrity and just benevolent. We want to do the right thing. Nice World Health Organization. And they explain that in order to enhance its management of conflicts of interest, as well as strengthen public trust and transparency, we've made all of these bios available for you to download which to me is undoubtedly the result of them getting uh, into trouble in the past with the so-called swine flu pandemic of 2009-2010, where they did not disclose the conflicts of interest, which they claimed was an accident. Oh, we just accidentally forgot to disclose those conflicts of interest. So I have no doubt that's why they did this. But if you look a bit closer, so I went through all of these bios and you find nothing, right? So it seems, okay, well, maybe they've turned over a new leaf. <laughs> and this was easy to find, but you know what was not easy to find? was who is financing the group itself, this pandemic influenza preparedness group? Well, it's the big pharmaceutical companies. I mean, that's it, just, the level of deception is mind-blowing. Oh, you know, we're trying to be transparent in our conflicts of interest. We, we gave you these bios to download. Very easy to find. But if you dig deeper and you look at who's actually giving them the funds, what do you find? Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline, Hoffman LaRoche, Novartis, Aquarius. I mean, it's, it's just the level of deceit. It's so surreptitious. It's outrageous, guys. It's, it's insane. And I actually couldn't find this information on the World Health Organization site. It took me a while to find it. I had to go digging for it. I originally found it on the IFPMA's website. Because on there, they brag how they have provided the World Health Organization with nearly 90% of pandemic influenza preparedness funds. And this significantly contributes to securing pandemic doses for the next pandemic. So what they are saying is they have secured contracts pretty much that their vaccines will get used the next time the pandemic is declared. 
Do you guys understand how dodgy and corrupt that is? It's outrageous. I mean, it's... So I feel like I'm living in a twilight zone. It's just, it's crazy, man. This stuff is, it's insane. So what do we have here? We have a very extremely, profoundly dangerous alliance, guys. Where on the one side, we have this dodgy industry with a terrible history of corruption. Like I said, experimenting on innocent civilians without their knowledge, covering up cancer, bribing doctors and government officials on the one end. And then on the other end, we have all of these trusted authorities, trusted universities like the Imperial College of London, the World Health Organization, we have the Gates Foundation. And this is precisely why I said earlier, never blindly trust authority. Learn how to distinguish between truth and authority, between integrity and authority, because they are not the same thing. All right, and I've clearly demonstrated this for you. Now, with that said, what role does Bill Gates play in all of this, right? Oh, his intention is purely humanitarian. I mean, we see this guy everywhere. Bill Gates, he calls for the nationwide social isolation policy to slow the coronavirus spread. Bill Gates calls on the US to lead the fight against the pandemic that could kill 33 million. Holy shit, that is scary. Bill Gates says mass shutdowns are needed to stop the coronavirus spread. Man's got no medical background whatsoever, but we all need to listen to Bill Gates, right? Can't, can't get out of lockdown until we get a vaccine. It, it is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. Well, as I mentioned briefly earlier, this investigation by this dude named Tim Schwab, shout out to whoever you may be, you did a very good investigation here, shows that Bill Gates, through the Gates Foundation, has major conflicts of interest with all the big pharmaceutical companies because he, he owns investments, he owns stocks in these companies. He also gives them charitable donations, which are tax-free. <laughs> I'm somebody who's good with words, and this kind of shit, it leaves me speechless. And over here, you can see all of these companies they own stocks in. And over here, up to $2 billion in tax-deductible charitable donations were given from the Gates Foundation to for-profit businesses, including companies in which the foundation holds investments, such as the GlaxoSmithKline. Mind-blowing, guys. And in the investigation, it shows that the so-called charitable grants, they actually have been more of an investment because he has made more money in return. Okay? He's not just giving his money away, guys. In fact, Bill Gates in the past 10 years alone has almost doubled his net worth. Think about that. So now when you begin to view Bill Gates as a financial partner and spokesman for Big Pharma, which the evidence shows he is, guys. When you have investments in a company, okay, two plus two equals four. When you have investments in a company and they profit, you profit. Then his actions begin to make much more sense, guys. He's a brilliant public relations man. That's what he is. Look at some of the headlines over the years. This all makes so much more sense. Right, GlaxoSmithKline and Novartis, they're going to join Bill Gates in his push to fight drug-resistant malaria. This headline from 2018. Yeah, from 2017, Gates backs Big Pharma push to wipe out tropical diseases. And yeah, in more modern history, what's going on right now, Gates Foundation, he enlists Novartis and GSK and others in COVID-19 uh, to fight off this disease. And it sounds really noble, really benevolent. It sounds like it's rooted in humanitarianism, but they're profiting, guys. It's a good business plan. And if we actually take a closer look at who Bill Gates surrounds himself with, this becomes resoundingly clearer. So for example, the current president of the Global Health Division at the Gates Foundation, Trevor Mundell, he came from Novartis, guys. Prior to him, it was Tachi Yamada. He came from GlaxoSmithKline, and when he stepped down, stepped down from the Gates Foundation, he went to Takeda Pharmaceuticals, which the Gates Foundation is still in partnership with. Oh yeah, Dr. Susan Desmond Hellman. She was the CEO, she just stepped down this year from 2014 to 2020 of the Gates Foundation. And she's still the current senior advisor. And she's also a board member of the Gates Medical Research Institute. And at the same time, she's the current director at Pfizer, guys. Dodgy, dodgy Pfizer company. And then we have Penny Heaton. She's the director of vaccine development and surveillance at the Gates Foundation. 
and she's a previous head of clinical research at Novartis, and she's a current board member of the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group. She's also worked for Merck and Company and Novavax. Then we have this dude, Roy Anderson, right? I mean, he's been in the background for well over 10 years during the so-called swine flu pandemic of 2009. He was the rector of Imperial College London when they produced that ridiculous model, which back then they claimed that millions would die and something like 14,000 people only died. He was also advising the, the UK government back then, so huge conflicts of interest. So he still works for GlaxoSmithKline, all right, to this very day. He's also a current chair for the World Health Organization's Neglected Tropical Diseases Program. He's a current advisor to the Gates Foundation, and he, he still does actually work at the Imperial College London. Okay, he's their professor in infectious disease epidemiology. So he's still in the background, this dude. Still a big time player. Now beyond these personal relationships where these people are working with the Gates Foundation and they're part of the Gates Foundation staff and they're not just the staff, they are key decision makers. Bill Gates has actually set up a number. He's been behind co-funding or co-finding all of these organizations and they are all in partnership right now. All of them are in partnership with the big pharmaceutical companies, guys. Just go look it up. The Gavi Vaccine Alliance, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, CEPI, the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, and then the Global Fund. They are all in partnership with the big pharma companies. In fact, two of them, okay, Gavi and CEPI, they were actually co-founded by Bill Gates and Big Pharma in partnership, guys. Go look into the history. Now, Big Pharma's role has been mostly downplayed in this regard, but if you look into it, they were founded in partnership. And this is a tactic that is reminiscent of the methodology of big tobacco front groups. They like the ultimate front groups, is what I'm saying. And if you take a closer look, just to further make my point, for example, the Vaccine Alliance, Gavi, one of the current board members, she's the head of GSK GlaxoSmithKline's Vaccines Global Health and representative also of the IFPMA. Same with Susan Silverman. She's the president and general manager of Pfizer vaccine, Vaccines, and she's also a representative of the IFPMA. And then the same with Dr. Joan Benson, except she's, um, now she's with Merck & Company. She's the executive director of public health partnerships at Merck & Company. Then another one. So these are the two most prolific, right, that poor, are portrayed as these non-profit humanitarian organizations. And this was founded as a non-profit association. I actually looked at the founding documents. And they are portrayed as providing independent research. But again, if you actually take a look at the individuals that are on CEPI, for example, this guy is a strategic advisor, and all of these individuals I'm going to share you with are advising CEPI. They are all big pharma players. He's a former president of GSK Vaccines, and he's a current roundtable member of the IFPMA. Here we have uh, Professor Gene Lang. He's a research and development associate vice president at Sanofi Pasteur, also an advisor over there, another advisor for CEPI, Professor Johan van Hoef from Johnson & Johnson. We have Dr. Catherine Jansen. She's a senior vice president and head of vaccine research and development at Pfizer, formerly Merck & Company. And then we have also this dude, Ali Alouesh. So huge conflicts of interest, guys. And it's essentially what he's done is he's taken this big pharmaceutical monster that everybody was becoming aware of how dodgy this industry is. Because like I said, through all the headlines I've shared with you, the stories, all the investigations, all the fines for bribery, for corruption, for concealing how their products have caused cancer, for experimenting on children, people were becoming aware this is a monster. But now that Bill Gates has come into the equation, he's helped to legitimize and change our perception of this industry by branding it as humanitarianism. It is brilliant public relations work. And that's what Bill Gates is. If you look closely into him, the guy is like Edward Bernays of the 21st century. I mean, it's, it's truly the behavior of a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's why I said before, if you just study the behavior of predators throughout history, rather than saying, you know, are they, what skin color are they? What political party are they a part of? What religion do they follow? These things are inconsequential because a predator can use any of those things to disguise themselves. And that's what they rely on. Our prejudices and our ability to be fooled by figures of authority. Look beyond the surface appearance, guys. Investigate. That's how the truth is established. And when you begin to recognize that the Gavi Alliance and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are in partnership with the big pharmaceutical companies, guys, what you realize is they are actually donating, donating more money to the World Health Organization than any other government. They are the top donors when their collective inputs are put together. 
That's a huge conflict of interest. Huge conflict of interest. And like I said, this is this is reminiscent of front groups, big time. They are like the ultimate front groups because so many people blindly believe in these authoritative structures, and we shouldn't. And of course, you know, people will because as I said earlier about inattentional blindness in that loud voice through the media, through the figures of authority, people will believe that he's giving away his money because we, that's what we told he's he's giving away his money to the poor people. Oh, you great man. But the truth of the matter is his net worth has doubled almost in the past 10 years, guys. Now, just to help you understand how this works, this is actually from Gabi's website. To help you understand how he has done some of this business, because it's very clever, we take this graph, for example, and what you see is private money that has been put in. There's only been 21% and the rest is public. Do you know what public funding means, guys? It means funding coming from the public sector, which is the government sector. Where does government get its money from, boys and girls? From your pockets, from taxpayers. So when you think of Gavi, you need to think of taxpayer-funded institution. Okay, taxpayers are funding this organization that invariably is profiting the big pharmaceutical companies who are already a trillion dollar industry. And if you take a look over here, this is on Gavi's own website. In the past four years alone, $9.2 billion in donations, and that's overwhelmingly come again from taxpayers. You see at the top of the list over here, the United Kingdom, UK taxpayers. And then the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation puts in a sizable significant contribution, don't get me wrong, but if I put in a dollar and I get $10 back, that's called a clever investment, right? And if you look at the Gates Foundation, their worth has gone up, not down. People think Gates is just giving away his money, and now. And of course, it's all of these countries that are supposedly um, more wealthy countries, right? The taxpayers in these wealthier countries are putting in this money, and it's under the auspices, the belief, the claim that it's to benefit the poor people in poorer countries. We're going to get their vaccines and it's going to help save their lives. Well, according to Doctors Without Borders, who has for years and years been fighting with the big pharmaceutical companies and pointing out how corrupt Gavi can be and how it can serve like a front group, <clears throat> and not in, you know, in those very frank terms that I put it as a front group, but they have challenged them and their corruption and how they work deeply with the big pharma companies and benefit the big pharma companies. As you can see in this article from him, Negotiations between companies and the largely taxpayer-funded Gavi Alliance, okay, largely taxpayer-funded Gavi Alliance, for the newest vaccines have not resulted in deeper price cuts that would help more children benefit. And he's talking about children in developing countries. And they explain that the lack of transparency by these companies on vaccine manufacturing costs and their focus on profits above ensuring sustainable prices for vaccines for low-income countries are at the roots of the problem. So that this front of humanitarianism, it's, it's a deception. It's a lie, guys. And that's a huge red flag because that shows you right away the caliber and character of the people we're dealing with here. But it gets worse. Doctors Without Borders has also fought a lot with these pharmaceutical companies because they are free riding on publicly funded research, taxpayers' research, guys. Th just think about how crazy that is. So we have a trillion dollar industry, clearly not hurting for cash that are developing their products that they profit from with taxpayer money. Not only does that show you how corrupt they are, but how corrupt the governments are by giving them taxpayers money to develop new drugs, new products that they then patent and then sell back to the taxpayers. It's, it's insane. And yeah, another article, this one is more recently from December 2019, in which Doctors Without Borders explains that Gavi needs to stop giving millions of subsidies and millions of dollars in subsidies to Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline for pneumonia vaccine. Why do these companies, a trillion dollar industry, why do they need to be subsidized? If they are trying to just do humanitarian work, why should they get these special subsidies? You see over here, $1.5 billion subsidy fund. That's, that's just crazy. That's taxpayers' money. So my point being major is this is just a very clever, sophisticated system whereby they're taking taxpayers' money and they're putting it in the pockets of the pharmaceutical companies. And let's just quickly spotlight, how can a humanitarian organization, a so-called humanitarian organization, work with companies like Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline? Give them subsidies, give them financial incentives, give them their track record. 
which is totally in conflict with human well-being and the concept of humanitarianism, right? Experimenting on innocent civilians. Hello? And towards the end of this article, and this is significant for everybody to understand, because they are alternative suppliers. See over here Kate Alder, where she explains, instead of throwing more money at Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline, Gavi should start supporting countries to prepare for the alternative supplier that promises lower pneumococcal vaccine prices for all countries. So essentially, the so-called non-profit Gavi, what they are just doing, guys, is they're taking taxpayer money and they are funneling it off. They are enriching the big pharmaceutical companies, which in turn also profit the Gates Foundation. Right, it's all verifiable. So when the Microsoft co-founder tried to tell us that Bill Gates is a ruthless schemer, he was not lying. And don't get me wrong, he's got the perfect appearance, guys. Very innocuous appearance, non-threatening, doesn't seem like he could home a fly. But that is precisely how the proverbial wolf in sheep's clothing operates throughout history, guys. That's what they do. They want to provide you with this non-threatening uh, image and appearance because they know people blindly believe in surface appearances. All right, that's how the fox gets access to the hen house. So we have to become wise to their methodology. And then just to illustrate my point quickly, because I know there's some people that are going to just desperately cling to this perception that Bill Gates is this great hero, he's this great humanitarian who's concerned with public health. Right? That's the ticket that he rides on, public health. But somebody who is genuinely concerned with public health, would they really have massive investments with over $250 million in the Coca-Cola company? The Coca-Cola company, that same Coca-Cola company, which I showed you earlier, has a history of manipulating science through very dodgy tactics and through uh, front groups and have been directly implicated in the obesity epidemic, guys, particularly most recently in China. All right, directly implicated in the obesity epidemic. In addition to them, the Gates Foundation also has huge investments in Arcos Dorados Holdings. What is that? That's the parent company of McDonald's, which also is directly implicated in the obesity epidemic because fast food and obesity go hand in hand, guys, as numerous studies have shown. So somebody who claims to be a public health defender, how can they in good conscience be supporting and working with and having partnerships with companies that are directly implicated in the obesity epidemic. And like I said earlier, obesity currently kills around an estimated 4 million people every single year. Just think logically, guys. Right? Either he is ignorant about this or he is being deceptive about this, both of which are inexcusable completely. And then beyond that, just from an ethical standpoint, look at all of these different companies that he has, that he's also working in partnership with, or he has investments in, right? These big pharma companies, GlaxoSmithKline, which was caught experimenting on innocent civilians, also a terrible long history, well-documented history of bribery. Then we have Janssen Vaccines, from uh, the sub it's a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson got caught uh, covering up how their baby powder was causing cancer, guys. They were also implicated in the opioid epidemic, and they also have a history of bribery. Then we have Merck and Company, publishing a fake scientific journal. Right? It's just, there's no limit yet to, to the insanity. Takeda Pharmaceuticals, also covering up how one of their products caused bladder cancer. Pfizer, also experimenting on innocent civilians to the point where 11 or 12 of them died. Children in Nigeria. How can you, as a humanitarian, through your foundation, know this, work with these dodgy companies. And if you look into it, he has worked with these companies whilst they have engaged in some of those uh, horrible, corrupt practices. It's, it's just, it's not logical, guys. Look at reality. I know the media is very convincing and he's got this great image, but look beyond the image and look at actual reality. So why isn't the media reporting on any of this, right? This, we... We need to understand it's the media's job to explain everything I'm just, I've already explained to you now. Obviously, that's their job. They need to explain what's going on here. And that's where you start to see, once again, the Gates Foundation influence. You see over here, $20 million to the BBC World Service Trust. Now, this, this is headline 2011, but just more recently. And you can find these grants on the Gates Foundation's website to verify and fact check it for yourself. 
where they are currently serving out two major grants, which amount to over $5 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation through BBC Media Action. And we have the, te the Daily Telegraph, also currently serving out a major, a major grant from the Gates Foundation of over $3.4 million. Then NPR, the National Public Radio, they are also currently serving out a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Here we have a prestigious publication for French and African audiences. You can see over here they are currently serving out a grant and they've received well over $3 million since 2016 alone. The Guardian, right? In the past, The Guardian, I mean, you've noticed in this presentation that I've used some of their articles to expose the dodgy practices of GlaxoSmith Klein or Pfizer, but now they are definitely silent. Well, The Guardian is currently in partnership with the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation. Through this website over here, it's, it's like a shoot off of The Guardian, it's called Global Development. And you can always, you must just look closely, guys, and you'll see Global Development is supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So when you're reading articles on The Guardian, you need to look for that in the corner. Well, they're also in partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, which probably explains why they aren't doing the exceptional job they've done in the past at exposing the current practices of GlaxoSmithKline. And then they're also in partnership with the IFPMA, right, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. So again, we're seeing this, the tentacles, the influence, just it's all over the place. Then over here, we have uh, the European Journalism Center, which is heavily financed by the bull and Melinda Gates Foundation, usually finance, in which they give grants to different organizations and journalists. Over here, for example, we see the number of grants were awarded to uh, Society in France. I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but that's in Germany. There were two in the Netherlands, CNN, which all of us are familiar with, and then Ellie in the UK, and then the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which I find to be interesting because they did a, f a fantastic job in 2009 exposing what was going on the potential conflicts of interest between the vaccine manufacturers and the advisors in the World Health Organization, but now they're just completely silent. And I mean, I just wondered to myself if it could be because of that. Now, if you take an actual closer look at this program that the Gates Foundation is, uh, is working with and, and giving the grants to through the European Journalism Center, it's called the Innovation and Development Reporting Grant Program, what you find, guys, is just all kinds of uh, organizations. Now, he gives the grants to journalists, but these journalists are affiliated with all kinds of media outlets. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy when you see the influence that the Gates Foundation has in all of this. So, for example, over here we have The Independent, uh, Reuters, Al Jazeera, BBC News, The Telegraph, HuffPost, National Geographic, Wired, Rolling Stone, CNN, uh, Financial Times, Do His Spiegel, Channel 4 Television, The Economist. It's, it's just all over the place. Of course, The Guardian, as we already explained. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them. There's Reuters also, Vice. But it's, it's really, it's crazy, guys. And you can find all this information out on the website. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to make it very clear that if you take a look, I haven't obviously investigated every single project these people are working on who received the grants. But if you look at the work, some of it seems really noble and, and legit, right? So I don't want to make it out to seem that all of these journalists are like, you know, they're on the take and they have sinister intentions. I'm sure they really believe genuinely and earnestly in what they are doing. But if you take a closer look, like for example, I checked this out. One of, this is one of the grants and all the information is available for those who want to check it out a bit more. Where they worked on this called Medica Mentalia 2 vaccines and they focus on vaccines and of course that invariably is to promote Bill Gates view of what should be taking place in the world so he's again he's making investments guys people think he's just the guy's very clever he is a brilliant businessman absolutely brilliant at what he does I mean he's conniving he's he's insidious he's he damn right sinister in my opinion I mean he's a wolf in sheep's clothing this cat is a predator Okay, he looks like Mickey Mouse, but inwardly he's a wolf. And um, you can see they won awards, yeah, and, and so on and so forth. So invariably he, he's promoting his agenda and his outlook. And he has another example just to further reinforce my point, where through the Gates Foundation, they finance PBS, an education program through PBS, and what they do is they promote Microsoft's interests. 
So he's, he's a clever businessman, guys. It goes deeper than material profit alone. Okay, we're going to still get into that. But my point being is, he has an agenda. When he's giving his money, it's not because, oh, you know, I'm just a nice old man, I'm going to help the world. No, he has an agenda. Okay, there's, there's some, he has a purpose, he has a motive. And then over here we see also Gates Foundation Viacom partner for quote-unquote message placement on TV shows. And Viacom is the parent company of MTV, VH1, Nickelodeon and BT, and then also CBS News, CNET, ZDNet and Comedy Central. And one of the projects that they worked on together, as you can see over here, <laughs> just to show once again how influential the Gates Foundation is. On, uh, on the program, the very popular TV show ER, where George Clooney, Mr. Hollywood A-lister George Clooney, he had his return on ER. Well, this was actually financed and <laughs> the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation quote-unquote helped to develop the script for that particular show. So, I'm merely pointing this out so you can understand how prolific, how ubiquitous, <laughs> how almost omnipotent the influence of the Gates Foundation is. It's, it's absolutely insane, guys. I mean, you think you're just watching ER and you're being entertained. Oh, there's George Clooney. Well, they actually have a subtle message there that you probably aren't even picking up consciously that they are putting there. And like I said, in my book, guys, I go into a lot of detail about this because it goes, it's, it goes much deeper. They, they know these little mind tricks and if you don't know them, guess what? You are easy prey. And unfortunately, most people don't know them because our education system is not an education system, it's an indoctrination system. It's another story for another day. But essentially, you need to learn how to defend yourself from these influences. And you're going to partially, uh, I hope that you have partially learned some of that in this because awareness is the first step. But you'll learn more about that in the book. And yeah, also through uh, the Staying Alive Foundation, which is the MTV's founda foundation, they are currently serving out a grant for the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then beyond them, they, the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation is also in partnership with Viacom through this program called Get Schooled, and that's where they focus on education. And I'm not going to get into it now, but the Gates Foundation is also involved in educating society. And he's also got huge investments through the Gates Foundation. Again, they have huge investments in Group Televisa. And Group, or oh, excuse me, Grupo Televisa, you can see over here amounting to over $97 million. This is, from what I understand, the most influential media outlet in Latin America. So again, influence, influence. And then also you're in Africa, right? See over here. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has signed off on a $4.7 million grant to promote data journalism in Africa. And then just to quantify this and put it into context to understand just how, how far-reaching the Bill Gates Foundation is, because this is just what I managed to dig up. I'm sure it goes so much deeper, but this helps to quantify through Professor Magda Kanigna, her book Journalism Without Profit, in the section Who Holds the Purse Strings. She explains that around $300 million a year, okay, $300 million a year is used on media projects, is used by the Gates Foundation. That is just a massive amount of money, guys. Do you, do you realize the amount of perception control you can buy for $300 million? A lot, okay, a lot, absolutely a lot. And then we also have, of course, Big Pharma's role in this. Never, never to be underestimated in anything that it does. Big Pharma, you can see from this report back in 2008, they spend more on advertising than they do on research and development, which is no surprise, given what we know about the Big Pharma industry. And the significance of this is wherever you see the advertising, you know that that television station is receiving money, all right? And then beyond that, if we look at, let's say, for example, CNBC at their, uh, at their board of directors, at their board members, we see once again this, this influence, right? The, the, <laughs> the tentacles. So yeah, we have Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's a contributor at CNBC. And he's also a current director at Pfizer. And beyond that, he's also a former FDA commissioner. So earlier I explained about the FDA commissioners having their links 
to the pharmaceutical industry. Well, there's another one right there. Then we have Joseph J. Wonk. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Johnson & Johnson. And then he's a current member of the CNBC's Global CFO Council. And the same with Robert Davis. He's also a member of the Global CFO Council. And he's the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Merck & Company. So these are just obvious conflicts of interest. Why is CNBC not reporting on this stuff? Well, do you think when they've got board members like that, that are making decisions about what the company's going to do, they're going to actually report on the criminal wrongdoings that I've shared with you thus far? And then Thomson Reuters, right? Reuters is considered to be one of the most prestigious news outlets out there, undoubtedly. Well, if you take a look at their board members, it's a similar scenario. He was actually the former CEO, but he, and he is currently the chairman of the board of directors, but he was the former CEO, he stepped down just recently, James C. Smith of Thomson Reuters, and he's the current director at Pfizer. So he's sitting at, he's on the, he's the chairman of the board of directors at Reuters, and then he's also the current director at Pfizer. And we have Thomas H. Glosser, he's the former CEO of Reuters News, and he's the current director at Merck & Company. And then Manvinder Singh Banga, who's on the board of directors for Thomson Reuters and GlaxoSmithKline. These are the decision makers. They, they decide the direction of the company. Do you think that they are actually going to allow their, the other financial interests that they work for, the big pharmaceutical companies, to be exposed? No, obviously not. Come on, guys. Then if we look at the Thomas Reuters Foundation and who is supporting them, who's giving them, uh, who's funding them, who's financing them, who do we see? We see the Gates Foundation. And like I said, the Gates Foundation is just, it's all over this stuff, guys all over this and uh, that is so significant because Reuters is considered the number one and the most popular international digital media brand in Europe so it has huge influence right huge influence and then for anybody that wants to understand a little bit more because I can't go into all of it now I want to focus obviously on the topic in question of how dodgy the media is because since its inception the establishment media has been there to mislead you to misguide you. Okay, you can learn more about that in this blog that I wrote called Fake News Kings 20 plus times the government and media, CNN, BBC, Fox, etc. got caught brainwashing us. And I mean, I go into many, many different examples. So I highly encourage you to go and check that out. Then, of course, beyond uh, the traditional media, we obviously living now in the age of the internet. All right? so, and the two most popular websites are Google and YouTube, both of which are owned by the same company, which is Alphabet Inc. So if we take a look at them, what we find is very similar relationships again, right? Google partners directly with GlaxoSmithKline, guys, in a bioelectric venture called Galvini Bioelectrics. And this is something that people don't realize. Google's parent company, which is Alphabet Inc., they currently are involved in the big pharmaceutical industry. They're not just involved with internet stuff, they are also involved in the big pharma industry now. And we're going to get into that momentarily. So the point of, of pointing this out and putting that out there, do you think that a financial partner of yours, you're going to now expose them? I mean, really, it's highly unlikely. Then we have over here Google's sister company, Verily, is teaming with big pharma on clinical trials. And we see over here they partner with Pfizer, Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, and Sanofi. So these are, these are just very obvious conflicts of interest, guys. Can we really uh, expect Google to be fair in the administration of search results, in the search results they provide us with? Obviously not. And of course, there's been research and evidence that have come out showing how Google manipulates the search algorithms. If we take a look at this company, Verily, which again is a sister organization of Google, both of which are, are owned by their parent company, Alphabet Inc., what did we find? Well, the current chief scientific officer, so the current CSO, and the president of research and development currently at GlaxoSmithKline, he also sits on the advisory board of oh, oh, Verily, guys. Then we have another guy, another former FDA member. He sits on the board of, uh, of Verily as well. Well, excuse me, he's the head of clinical policy and strategy at Verily. And he's a former FDA, he was the former FDA advisor. And this guy's done all kind of paid consultancy for the big pharma companies. He was notorious for his consultancy with the big pharma companies. So again, just, <laughs> you can see the conflicts of interest here. And then beyond that, we have the president of Google Customer Solutions, which is Mary Ellen Coe, and she's currently a board member of Merkin Company. And then over here, Robin L. Washington, she's the senior vice president and CFO of Gilead Sciences, 
and she's currently a board member of Google's parent company, Alphabet Inc. So the, the conflicts of interest here are obvious, guys, in, in so many different ways, right? With different news media outlets, with, with Google, the internet search giant, with governments, with scientists. Like, it's alarming. It's, it's quite surreal when you think about it. It's like a, it's like a bad script to a low-budget movie where you've got this octopus with its tentacles and it's just reaching in every government and scientists and Google and it's outrageous guys, completely outrageous. Then Bill Gates once again, he's also working in partnership through this company called Adidas, uh, interesting company to look into, but we're not going to get into that now, but again he's in partnership with them. He also has investments in Google, so through the Gates Foundation he has over 42,000 shares which amount to over 49 million dollars. Google. So again, just <laughs> conflicts of interest everywhere you look. So is it really a surprise, guys, when we see these kinds of headlines, right? With a YouTube CEO, YouTube, which is owned by Google, which is owned by Alphabet Inc., when they will claim that we'll ban any coronavirus content that goes against the World Health Organization guidelines. They're all in bed. Of course, they're all operating together. So naturally, yes, they're going to go after whoever's challenging them. It's, it's really not rocket science. Such as in this particular instance, we have the epidemiologist, Newt Butowski. They censor him. Now, this is an actual authority. He's an epidemiologist. He's somebody you want to hear from. But because he opposes the lockdown, then they censor him. That's a huge red flag. You're actually going to find throughout this, guys, that there are numerous figures of authority and experts that are speaking out against this, but they either being undermined through the media or totally ignored. And then Facebook, of course, is also involved in this. Facebook to remove misinformation about the coronavirus. Well, let's take a closer look at who is behind the whole fact-checking policy, right? Facebook is fighting back against fake news with PolitiFact as a partner. I'm sure all of you have seen this at some time. This has been disputed by third-party fact-checkers. Before you share this story, you might want to know what independent, independent fact-checkers disputed its accuracy. So who is this? Well, they come from the Pointer Institute, PolitiFact. And it's the home of the so-called International Fact-Checking Network. While PolitiFact and AfricaCheck were actually funded and started by a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And boom, there is the initial grant that got them started. It's, I mean, you can't even make this stuff up, it's so silly. It's so ridiculous, it's just, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy, guys. It's, it's like living in the twilight zone. So when you see these news headlines from PolitiFact, that's claim that there's no evidence that the Gates Foundation will profit from a coronavirus vaccine, but yet, when we look at this investigation, and we look at their, their portfolio, and who the company, who the Gates Foundation has financial investments in, that it's the pharmaceutical companies that are set to profit from what's taking place in coronavirus funding, that means that they're wrong. You're lying. Either you are wrong out of the innocence of ignorance, or you are lying. Alright? So guys, please, spread this like wildfire. And then over here, another one. Reuters is their other fact-checking partner. Reuters launches fact-checking initiative to identify misinformation in partnership with Facebook. Well, like I already said, if you look at Reuters board members, they're pharmaceutical guys again, right? And then also, the Gates Foundation is one of their top donors. So there's just these huge conflicts of interest. Oh, we're going to fact check ourselves. We're going to fact check our partners. And we're going to... It's just, it's crazy. It's, it's so ridiculous, all of this. But don't worry, guys. Facebook will start warning users who engage with harmful, and I quote, harmful information, as The Guardian reports, which is currently in partnership with the Gates Foundation and the big pharmaceutical industries. It's just, it's crazy. They're going to tell you what to believe, the figures of authority, the fact-checkers, the independent fact-checkers. And I mean, this is just so dystopian when you look at it. It's, it's obscene, it's outrageous that this is even going on and people aren't outraged by this right now. Mary, you like to post with false information about COVID-19. That post was removed because it had harmful false information. The World Health Organization which is being financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the big pharmaceutical companies, they have a web page with common rumors that you can share with friends so everyone can stay safe. It's like a bad science fiction movie. 
Then we have the Soviet, the European Journalism COVID-19 Support Fund. This is a partnership between the European Journalism Center and the Facebook Journalism Project, okay, where they essentially give financial grants to journalists who will help them, and I quote, provide essential coverage to inform citizens and fight misinformation about COVID-19. Well, guess what, guys? Since 2012, Bill Gates has given the European Journalism Center more than $14 million in funding. And there are the grants. Okay, these are just huge conflicts of interest, guys. It just, it's, it's mind-blowing. All of the stuff that I've shared with you thus far, the conflicts of interest are alarming. Just profound. But of course, they're going to constantly tell you that, you know, during this coronavirus pandemic, that stuff is fake news. It's fake news. And like I said earlier, with that loud voice on the megaphone, it commands our attention. And any figures of authority, they must be telling us the truth, right? Those conspiracy theorists, those fake news spreaders. But then when they do it, and they get caught doing it, such as the CBS did over here, where they admitted using footage from Italy, where things were just going crazy, and there was so much panic, they tried to pass that footage as being in New York to make it look worse than it was. When they do this and it's fake news, why don't they get censored? Why don't they get banned? Right? Double standards. And I'm going to get into these double standards very quickly, just to make it very clear, again, why we are being manipulated or how we are being manipulated and why we should question these authorities. So for example, over here, there's been numerous studies that have been put forward by credible, well-respected researchers and scientists. People with good, clean records, guys where they have conducted studies, real-world studies, and tested people for antibodies to see how many people are infected. And they found that there's a lot more people infected than we previously thought, and a lot of these people aren't very ill, which suggests that it's not that deadly. And this is a positive thing. It's a good thing. It can allow people to relax a little bit. But the moment that these scientists put forward these studies, they are taken to town by the authorities, by the media, as you can see some of these headlines. Criticism and doubts about the study from Heinsberg. Why experts are questioning two hyped antibody studies in coronavirus hot, hot spot. Never mind the fact that they are experts themselves that conducted these studies. And then controversial studies find COVID-19 may be far more widespread. See those key terms, guys, to cast doubt in your mind. Now, by way of comparison, so let's put that on a shelf, okay? We see how they dealt with these scientists and these researchers. They put forth some real world studies, but then by way of comparison, a theoretical model that says tens of millions of people will die, which I already made very clear guys, it was never published in a scientific journal. It was never peer reviewed. And it was put forward by a guy with a history of terrible predictions and a conflict of interest with the big pharmaceutical companies that will profit from this pandemic. When that story gets put out, the media does not question it, and they spread it like wildfire. That tens of millions of people will die. And you know how irresponsible that is, guys? Because it evokes fear. And not only is fear dangerous, which I'm going to get into later on, because it is literally deadly, it also imposes a lockdown. It justifies a lockdown. And it justifies a high level of unemployment. It justifies changing our world in an unprecedented way, in a colossal paradigm shifting way. And the media, they don't question it. <laughs> they don't see any terms about you know, casting doubt and this criticism. No, instead they just spread this like wildfire. Then as I said already with the lead author of that mathematical theoretical study, Neil Ferguson, not only is he a past paid consultant for GlaxoSmithKline and Hoffman LaRoche, but just 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, not even long ago, with the so-called swine flu pandemic, he came up with another absolutely ridiculous mathematical model where he claimed over 7 million people would die, and in the end about 14,000 people would die. So he came up with that prediction, and then billions and billions of dollars were wasted on vaccines that went and profited the companies that he had formerly been a paid consultant for. And now he's doing something very similar. And you're trying to tell me that the media, 
They go to town on these credible scientists who have clean track records, but by way of comparison with a guy like Neil Ferguson, who has a terrible history, they just blindly accept his research and they spread it like wildfire. Guys, just come on. I mean, if, if you can't see what's going on here, how obvious it is, the double standards, the conflicts of interest, just think about what's going on here, guys. And they're doing it again. It wasn't just that one time they are doing it again. Do you understand what the media is doing? They are part of the darkness. They are part of the deceptive game. I'm not saying everybody working in the media is bad. By no way, shape or form. Same with governments, same with intelligence agencies. Most of these are decent people. They are simply under the spell of those at the higher level of control, thinking they are on the right side, the good guys. But if we take a closer look, they're doing it again. This is a more recent study. May 2020, earlier coronavirus lockdown could have saved 36,000 lives, right? Again, social distancing a week earlier could have saved 36,000 US lives. Study finds The Guardian, The Washington Post, CNN, right? All the big media outlets. And they're spreading this. You know, if they just started a little bit earlier, man. And, and this obviously is being spread and shared to legitimize the lockdown as being based on concrete science. And as I'm going to get into, guys. It is so weak. The evidence is so weak. It is mind-blowing that this has been allowed to proceed forward. So let's actually take a look at this study, right? What we first find is, once again, this has not been peer-reviewed. Of course, the media doesn't mention that, which is a very, very big deal. In addition to that, one of the lead authors, Jeffrey Shaman, he has conflicts of interest and financial ties and financial links to Merkin Company, who is going to profit from those findings, who is producing a vaccine, who is going to make lots of money in the process. And the study was funded in support from the National Institute of Health. Like I said earlier, if you take a look at the foundation for the National Institutes of Health, it is packed with board members from the big pharma companies, guys. Either past or present, we have Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, all of which are going to profit from this pandemic, guys. Huge conflicts of interest here. All right, very elementary conflicts of interest that we need to be made aware of. Huge conflicts of interest. And then at the bottom there we have Gillian Sackler of the corrupt Sackler family. All right, moving forward, also with the Washington Post, another very widely trusted authoritative media outlet. And we see on the left hand side you have Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, which criticize the lockdown. What does the Washington Post have to say about them? Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz aren't coronavirus experts, so why are they even talking about it on TV news? But Bill Gates over here, on the right-hand side, who has no medical background whatsoever, they constantly give him a platform. Right? Talking about 33 million people dying, he's calling on governments to help fight it, and they even feature an article from him. A huge double standards, guys. Just massive, massive double standards. But we shouldn't be surprised again, because Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, are working in partnership together. It's like George Collins said back in the day, guys, it's a big club. And you and I are not in the big club, but it's a big club, all right? And they're pulling the strings. Then beyond this obvious bias, the establishment media is also ignoring a lot of experts that are challenging these lockdown policies, guys. A lot of experts and if they're not you know ignoring them which is a subtle form of censorship they are outright banning them and outright censoring them I'm sure a lot of you guys remember this individual and and his buddy and they presented raw data and they were very clear about that see so this is raw data that I'm sharing with you guys it's not been peer-reviewed but this is to make sure that it gets out to the public and now we can start having a decision or start having a discussion about potentially opening things up because what we are finding and more research coming forward is showing it as well that there are uh, more infected cases than we thought. A lot of people are walking around and they don't have strong symptoms. We, we can't even, a lot of them don't even know that they have it. He comes forward and says that and the media just goes to town on him and they constantly point it out how it hasn't been peer reviewed, right? But like I said earlier, the initial model that justified and kick-started the lockdown policies, it was never peer-reviewed, but nobody said anything about that. 
I mean, really? Come on, guys. And the same with Newt Butaski, like I said earlier. This is an epidemiologist. It's somebody that we want to hear from. And he's also being censored. So what are these experts saying that is being ignored or censored by the establishment, right? What are they saying? Let's take a look into that. Well, I found four things that I believe we should explore and take a closer look at because they are really, really significant, guys. And I've looked very closely into them and I'm about to share it with you. And it is, it's mind-blowing. The first one is that the death reports are misleading or deceptive. Okay, we're going to explore it. The second is that despite what the establishment authorities and media are saying, this is actually comparable to a bad flu. The third is that based on actual scientific evidence, guys, concrete science, we have an abundance of concrete science that shows the lockdown itself is far more dangerous than COVID-19. The evidence is overwhelming. And I'm also going to go into the very weak evidence that supports social distancing and lockdown. It is so weak. It's just unreal that this is even going on. Makes me feel like I'm in the twilight zone. And then number four, predictions of millions of people dying without lockdown is based on theory and I quote, science fiction. So let's take a look at the first one, the death reports. Since uh, we had uh, close to 99% of uh, people dying have other causes that may have contributed to their demise, it's very difficult to dissociate and say that these people specifically died because they were infected. It's very likely that many of them would have died anyhow, if not immediately within a very short period of time because of these other causes of death uh, that uh, they had. People who die from corona have short life expectancy. Yeah. And they change the title. You take, you take a person which is 90 plus with uh, cancer, they die, and the statistics tells you corona. But the real reason, the underlying reason of death is cancer, is heart right. attack, is diabetes. But what we're not hearing is that these are deaths that would uh, occur um, anyway, uh, and that overall mortality in heavily affected countries hasn't gone up. So these are these deaths are occurring in people who are um, running out of time. They often have many comorbidities. That's what the case series in Italy shows. They may well be dying of a pneumonia. Out of a hundred people, if ninety-six. Do fine. The four that die, 90% of those four have comorbidities. Heart failure, emphysema, um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. They're on immunomodulating medications. They're immunodeficient, HIV. These are the people that are dying. You get some healthy people that die, but that's an infinitesimal number. Tiny. Many of the COVID deaths were either dead before they were tested, or else they had up to three other conditions. So this is nothing wrong with this. People die for all sorts of reasons, but the news should be stressing this and maybe they should be counting it as a 0.1 COVID death. Countries seem to be racing to have as many COVID deaths as they could. Someone dies in this country right now. They're not talking about the high blood pressure, the diabetes, the stroke. They say, did they die from COVID? There's, as you, I, we've been to hundreds of autopsies. You, you don't talk about one thing, you talk about comorbidities. Their vessels were narrowed. Their lungs were a smoker. COVID was part of it. It is not the reason they died, folks. They died from COPD. They had COVID. COVID didn't kill them. 25 years of tobacco use killed them. Doctor, I want to read for our viewers what the CDC says in part about how to count COVID deaths r relating to that last issue we just raised. In cases where a definite diagnosis of COVID cannot be made, but is suspected or likely, like the circumstances are compelling with a reasonable degree of certainty, it is acceptable to report COVID-19 on a death certificate as probable or presumed. So doctor, what's the problem with that? Well, in short, it's ridiculous. Let's just take influenza. If I have a patient died uh, a month ago, had 
fever, cough, and a diet after three days, and maybe have been an elderly, fragile individual. And there happened to be an influenza epidemic around our community. I wouldn't put influenza on the death certificate, and I've never been encouraged to do so. I would put probably uh, respiratory arrest would be the top line, and the underlying cause of disease would be pneumonia. And in the contributing factors, I might well put emphysema or congestive heart failure. But I would never put influenza down as, as the underlying cause of death, and yet that's what we're being asked to do here. CDC issued a special uh, document that's a guidance on filling out death certificates. And they've essentially gone away from their usual protocols uh, where you want to have some certainty about the cause of death. And they've said that even if there's suspicion that COVID might be the cause of death, that you should just put that as the cause of death on the, on the death certificate without any further scrutiny. Almost everyone who dies will die with coronavirus. If you have a, you're in a car accident and they test you, they might find coronavirus on you but you probably didn't die because of coronavirus. I mean, let's just take someone getting hit by a bus and they, they collapse along and they go into the emergency room and they're there for 15, 20 minutes. Blood work comes back, COVID test comes back positive, and they die 20 minutes later because of their collapsed lung. We're going to put that down as COVID-19? That doesn't make any sense. If a patient tests positive for COVID-19 and dies from another cause such as pneumococcal sepsis, it may be considered accurate to say that person died with COVID-19, not from COVID-19. Yet the CDC guidelines list as one more, they list this case as one more COVID-19 death and they go to the next questionable death. They label that as COVID-19 and it goes on and on. And each country may be different about what it counts as a death. So uh, some countries, it said, are counting uh, deaths where you can actually say this is what caused the death. Um, in this country, we're, we're only just getting clarity from the Department of Health made public just today on their website has gone up um, a description of what these deaths actually mean. That the, the deaths being daily reported that coming out on the news are in fact just they're just deaths in hospital that have occurred to people who have tested positive. So strictly speaking, um, if someone tests positive is in hospital and dies of something else, there'll still be a COVID-19 death. Aus meiner Sicht wird weltweit der schlimme Fehler begangen, virusbedingte Tote zu melden, sobald festgestellt wird, dass das Virus beim Tod vorhanden war, unabhängig von anderen Faktoren. Dieses verstößt gegen ein Grundgebot der Infektiologie. Es muss doch festgestellt werden, ob die Patienten mit oder an dem Virus verstorben sind. Dies ist auch ganz klar in den deutschen ärztlichen Leitlinien verankert, wird aber bei Covid-19 nicht befolgt. So as you can see guys, worldwide, we have a number of experts, credible authorities, credible figures that are coming forward and saying that the death reports are misleading. All right, why aren't we being told about that other side of the story? And then just to complement that further, over here this article from The Telegraph, why have so many coronavirus patients died in Italy? And over here they're quoting Professor Ricciotti, and he explains that the way in which we code deaths in our country is very generous in the sense that all the people who die in hospitals with the coronavirus are deemed to be dying of the coronavirus. So there's that same theme, right? Just like we saw in the video. And then he explains, on re-evaluation by the National Institute of Health, only 12% of death certificates have shown a direct causality from coronavirus while 88% of patients who have died have at least one premorbidity, many had two or three. So that's just a recurring theme, right? You saw that in the video, it's undeniable. And when the media, I mean, obviously we know why this is happening when we see who's on the payroll, I mean, who's paying their bills between the Gates Foundation and the big pharmaceutical companies, we understand why this is not being focused on, but it's right there. And you've got all these leading credible, reputable experts these scientists, who themselves are authorities, that are simply being either totally ignored or censored. And it's, it's wrong, obviously, guys. Then, to further corroborate the video, we have this uh, coroner over here, which is somebody that examines dead bodies, autopsies, to ascertain what the cause of death was. And he's world-renowned, okay? He's exceptional in what he does. And based on his investigation, he claims, and I quote, 
that COVID-19 is a comparatively harmless viral disease. According to him, based on the fatalities that he examined, they had such serious previous illnesses. So again, heart disease, diabetes, and so on and so forth, cancer, etc. That, and I quote, even if it sounds hard, every one of them would have died in the course of this year. And that's a big deal, right? We have numerous experts that are saying the same thing. So it's outrageous when somebody has had cancer there. Let's say they have stage 4 cancer. And then they, they die because they, they die with contracting the flu. You know what I mean? It's, that's crazy, guys. At all times, we all have different diseases. Like I said, many people who have COVID-19 right now, they don't even know that they have it. That's what the evidence shows. But if they have a pre-existing condition like cancer, or let's say they have a heart attack or a stroke, you can't say that they're dying from COVID-19. That's just outrageous, guys. And then in the video that we watched with the testimony, two of the, the one doctor and then the one Nobel Prize winner, they used the extreme example just to kind of make their point that if somebody gets into a car accident and then they go into hospital and while they're in the hospital, they get COVID-19, well, they probably died because they were in a car accident, right? Logically speaking. And I thought to myself, well, let me just take a look and see something outrageous like this may have happened. And here's a news headline where... There is no certainty, but this guy was in a car accident, he gets rushed to hospital, and then he dies in hospital, and they attributed to his death, and they recorded it as COVID-19. So we can only speculate about that, but is it possible that this was wrongfully recorded? And then over here, the NHS found that up to a fifth, one in five patients with COVID-19, uh, they contracted COVID-19 in several hospitals. That's crazy. I mean, that shows you once again it could, how badly this could be potentially being misreported, right? I mean, it's a problem. We, if we cannot ascertain correct, authentic death reports, all of these arguments are just senseless. You know, it, there's, a, there's a clear agenda to inflate the numbers. And as I've shown you already throughout all of this, there's so many conflicts of interest. I mean, it just it stinks to hell, guys. And of course, you know, the media, the establishment media, they will constantly engage in some kind of elementary propaganda campaign. For example, this is a very simple method that has been utilized for as long as history itself pretty much records, where they'll take the opposition and they will associate them with a particular group because this creates polarization. There's already a strong sense of division between groups, so if you can more or less... Uh, associate them questioning, one side questioning, with one particular group, then you can relegate it to, oh, it's just, it's just those, those kind of people. So then you won't investigate it, you become dismissive. And yeah, you can see key terms that are used, conservative media, Trump, Alex Jones of InfoWars. And just before we move forward, because I do know that there will be somebody out there that's going to think, uh, you know, I'm sure he's a Donald Trump fan. And then, okay. I wrote a blog, yeah, this was back in 2018, in which I explained why, in my opinion, 10 reasons why I think Donald Trump is just another puppet president. Spoke out against him, I spoke out against Obama, spoke out against Bush, long before it was cool to jump on any Trump train and anything like that. So, I don't want to get caught up on this. Maybe you're a Trump fan, it's all good. Uh, I do recommend opening your mind and reading this blog, but I just wanted to mention this so people can understand we don't need to be interpreting through this lens of prejudice and tribalism where it's you or you with them, it's us. Let's rather focus on simply finding out what is the truth. We can see this corruption here, right? And I think we can all stand against corruption as a human principle. You don't have to be with a political party, a particular political party or religion or whatever to know in principle that standing against corruption is the right thing to do. And then again, you're just going to see these headlines because they want, to, they want to dismiss it. They want to make it a knee-jerk, impulsive reaction that the moment you see it, you just become dismissive and you oversimplify it. Oh, it's an anti-vax conspiracy theory. And then you have the leading experts. They always like to use these, these trigger terms because they know the leading experts, figure of authority, people will blindly believe, and they shoot down the conspiracy theorists because those people are crazy, right? And then the fact checkers. Experts agree, it's likely the opposite. While 
We just showed in the video that there are other experts who are being ignored largely that are saying that they are potentially being inflated. So we need to hear the other side of the narrative, right? But rather than just trading one figure of authority for another, I'm not, I'm not going to do what they do because that makes me no better than them. Let's actually take a look at the documents, right? They're online. And this is from the UK and the United States. And then we can actually find all of the stuff I'm going to share with you, you can find it in these documents and you can find them easily online guys just uh, do an internet search I'm not saying do a Google anymore because Google is corrupt as hell and we need to start utilizing other search engines because they are censoring a lot of content but you can internet search either one of these documents and look it up for yourself the examples used are mind blowing but just to further reinforce my point we can go through our world and data in which they actually summarize it and they do it quite well. Now, our Walden data is also funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And you can see they're trusted by all kinds of scientific publications and mainstream media outlets and prestigious universities and so on and so forth. Like I said, I can use their information against them, right? If this authority, if this one-sided narrative is constantly saying that, oh, it was just conspiracy theories, theories and so on and so forth but then you can use their information to show that no it's actually legitimate to scrutinize this to investigate this you know that's even better so as you can see over here under the section where it says what is counted as a death from COVID-19 and they explain let's take a look at two concrete examples of national guidance which is the United States and the UK both provide very similar guidelines for medical practitioners on the completion of death certificates and they do have hyperlinks so that you can go directly to the publications and fact check it. Now it explains that both guidelines state that if the practitioner suspects, key term, suspects that COVID-19 played a role in an individual's death, it should be specified on the death certificate. They proceed to explain that a laboratory diagnosis may not be required for it to be listed as a cause of death. So right there, they're saying that it doesn't have to be an official diagnosis, guys. And, and then it says in the UK guidelines, for example, it makes it very clear that practitioners should complete death certificates to the best of their knowledge, stating that, and I quote, if before death the patient had symptoms typical of COVID-19 infection. And let's just quickly explain, those symptoms are so ambiguous if you look them up, guys, that if you are panicking, there's something called the nocebo effect, which is when you start to fear something, you can create symptoms. Unwittingly, you can start to believe it. You can start to feed into it. Anybody that's diagnosed himself with Dr. Google knows you can start to think you're dying if you believe it. Okay, that's the nocebo effect. And there's lots of evidence that the nocebo effect is a real thing. It's the antithesis or the opposite of the placebo effect for those who are familiar with that. So again, and I quote, if before death the patient had symptoms typical of COVID-19 infection, but the test result has not been received, it would be satisfactory to give COVID-19 as the cause of death. So right there, again, it shows it's open for abuse. Then they go on just to make it very clear, because some people, they still want to believe that, no, the authorities, you know, that's not really happening. They wouldn't do these ridiculous death reports and so on and so forth. It explains, and it says even in bold, this means a positive COVID-19 test result is not required, I repeat, not required, for a death to be registered as COVID-19. Then they explain the US CDC guidelines also make this clear with an example, with the death of an 86-year-old female with an unconfirmed case of COVID-19. So it explains it was reported that the woman had typical COVID-19 symptoms, again this is very ambiguous, there's many different symptoms, five days prior to suffering an ischemic stroke at home. Now stroke, that's one of the leading causes of death in the world, guys, right? But they're saying, because they had symptoms similar to COVID-19, five days prior to them having a stroke, it's satisfactory to say that they died from COVID-19 rather than the stroke. And that's outrageous, guys. And it says that despite not being tested for COVID-19, the coroner determined that the likely underlying cause of death was COVID-19 given her symptoms and potential exposure, or sorry, exposure to an infected individual. So you can see how this can be abused, guys. It really is based on a doctor's speculation and prejudice. And if you look close enough into this, unfortunately, in certain countries, there are financial incentives where they get kickbacks if people go on ventilators or if they have COVID-19 patients. And yeah, is a perfect example to help further 
paint a picture about what's actually going on here. So this is from the Office for National Statistics in England. And they explain that the most common main pre-existing condition they found was ischemic heart disease with 541 deaths. Then they proceed to say this may be, this may in part explain the decrease in deaths resulting from ischemic heart disease in March 2020. So in other words, they're saying those deaths would have happened. But now there's a decrease in those deaths because instead we're attributing them to COVID-19. That's insane, guys. Heart disease is killing, has been killing tens of millions of people over the years. It is the number one killer. Cardiovascular disease is the number one preventable killer in the world. In the world. And now they're going to say that COVID-19 is instead taking his lives. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. Okay? And then we have over here once again the fact checkers. Right. The claim, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's guidelines for listing COVID-19 on death certificates in the absence of a test are resulting in a case overcount. Well, we rated this false because we fact-checked it. But then, if you take a look at Deborah Burks, she claims that, oh, there's nothing from the CDC that I can trust. And she believes they may potentially be inflating the death certificate. So either this authority is lying, or this authority is lying. All I'm saying throughout all of this, guys, is what we are being exposed to is a very limited narrative, very biased, a lot of propaganda, a lot of fear-mongering. And as I've shown you with the conflicts of interest, it's relatively obvious as to why. And if you take a look at the CDC, these are all different groups that fund them, or they are in partnership with. It's all the big pharmaceutical companies again, and a partner of the big pharma companies the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation, which has huge investments in the big pharma industry that is profiting from all of this. So again, conflicts of interest. Same thing with the NHS. So the fact that they have these rules in place of how they are going to statistically put deaths down officially, and then they have these conflicts of interest, these are all red flags, guys, right? All huge red flags. All right, second thing. Despite what the establishment authorities and media are saying, this is actually comparable to a bad flu, guys. So let's take a look into this testimony. We realize that uh, the number of infected people is somewhere between 50 and 85 times more compared to what we thought, compared to what uh, had been documented. If you take these numbers into account, they suggest that uh, the infection fatality rate for this new coronavirus is likely to be in the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. I think it will be like a severe influenza. And it's interesting with influenza. When the flu comes, we all say, oh, the flu is coming. Like every winter, it's in the papers, the flu is here, okay. And it usually kills in this country around 1,000, 2,000 people. But it's normal, it's influenza, we have it every year. And they're old and they're going to die soon anyway, so no one is very upset about influenza. If influenza was a new disease, we never had influenza before, and it suddenly hit the world in February this year, the reaction would be very similar as it is now to the COVID-19 disease. Do you think people are overreacting? Yes. Uh, you're a, you teach at the University of Manitoba. You're a, a former uh, chief medical officer, I understand. Yes. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about how uh, we're, we're coping right now? Well, I don't know what to think, frankly, but um, I'll tell you what I do think. Uh, first, I want to say that in 30 years of, of public health medicine, I have never seen anything like this, uh, anything anywhere near like this. And I'm not talking about the pandemic, because I've seen 30 of them, uh, one every year. It's called influenza and other respiratory illness viruses that we don't always know what they are. Uh, but I've never seen this uh, reaction. And I'm trying to understand why. Fatality of the coronavirus is similar to influenza virus. The rate of spread is fast. It will be comparable comparable to many other epidemics we had before and we were never crazy enough to self-destroy the economy the society and everything in the flu season no one cares about these people 
I mean, the, the total number of COVID deaths in Europe will be very similar to a severe flu season. Uh, and, you know, this is serious. Flu is a serious disease, but maybe we should just shut down the economy during the flu season. I mean, we, we need people. People should have been made to understand that the burden of death of flu is like coronavirus, especially when we correct for the fact that people who die from coronavirus are older on average than people who die from flu. Flu kills young people. It kills two or three times more people under 65 than does coronavirus. I don't think that there is a fundamental difference between COVID and flus. I, it may be that some more elderly people dying with COVID and some more younger people dying with some of the flus, but that, that is a gradual difference. All flus are different, but there's no fundamental difference. This is just like the flu. Because it's unknown, it's not. The flu has been killing people for 100 years since 1918, since the massive pandemic. But the flu is just, we know what the flu is. It's familiar to us. So we're not scared of it. Oh, it's just the flu. I've had several patients in their 30s and 40s die in the ER when I used to work in the ER from the flu. Oh, it's just the flu. But if it's coronavirus, it's coronavirus. We all need to be scared. I think it's on the order of point point uh, oh five percent to one point one percent which is roughly what in line with the flu this flu was no different from other flus why should we suddenly say oh no we have to change our life forever okay so these are numerous experts that are proclaiming this they constantly want to tell us that it's just, you know, conspiracy theorists and it's uneducated people that are comparing this to the flu. But there's actually a lot of prestigious, highly respected scientists, professors, doctors, epidemiologists that are comparing this to the flu. We have another guy here, Giulio Toro, just to compliment with the video. And then also Dr. Nico Ponio. Now, if we actually look at a severe influenza season, guys, it kills up to 650,000 people in a year. That's a lot of people. That's a large number. And I have no doubt that if the media was fear-mongering and focusing on this and the World Health Organization and everybody was freaking out, the same thing would be taking place. It just shows you when you hijack people's perception, this is the outcome. You can steer them like sheep to the proverbial slaughter. And the only defense against those who weaponize fear and weaponize ignorance and weaponize information against the population is that they start to become aware of what's going on. They learn, they educate themselves, they become disillusioned. Awareness is always the key, guys. And that's why it's so important, and I'm counting on you guys, to share this with your friends and your family members. And if it's, I know it's very long, feel free to just cut segments. You know, you find something really fascinating for two minutes, cut that two minutes and then upload it to whatever channel that you may have, your preferred social media channel. Now, it's also important to understand, guys, it's almost impossible to actually ascertain the death rate right now because this is such a premature uh, disease in the sense that it's, it's very new. We don't know how many people have it. Right? A lot of people who have it, they currently are asymptomatic or not showing any symptoms. So they don't even know. That means that there's no way to fully ascertain how many people have this. And because we can't do that, we don't know how high the death rate is. Now with the flu, we've had many years to more or less figure out, okay, what's the death rate? We've had decades to do that, right? This is fairly new. So the importance of me sharing that and explaining this to you is because it's impossible right now to figure out exactly precisely what the death rate is. Any time that they start to come with headlines like this, or you know, US health officials say that the coronavirus is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu, that's just fear mongering, guys. It's outrageous. It's, it's just a scare tactic. So don't buy into it. Remember, authority, don't confuse authority with the truth. They want you to just blindly believe what they say, question what they say, think critically. And as I was explaining, even right now in the United States, guys, if you look at the CDC's own website, there's the URL. Based on the official statistics from the CDC's own website, despite the high number of COVID-19 deaths, 
which could potentially be inflated, right? We've already gone through that. But in spite of that high number, more people have officially been designated to have died from pneumonia. This is according to the death certificates, which they claim is their most accurate statistics they have available. All right? It's on their own website. There's the URL. You can check it out for yourself. Now, something we have to just explore a little bit further that I need to provide some clarity and context on is when you do go check out this link, what you are going to find is it's slightly been changed. So you see this original screenshot that I've shared with you. It says updated June 8th, 2020. Then it says COVID-19 deaths, 92,922. Then over here it says pneumonia deaths, 104,699. Well, if you go to a more recent screenshot that I took, you see it says they updated July 14th, 2020. What you will notice is now it says all deaths involving COVID-19. And for the pneumonia section, it says deaths involving pneumonia with or without COVID-19, excluding influenza deaths, which is a mouthful, right? It's, it's a bit confusing. And remember, that's a tactic of deception. Truth is always about simplifying things making it easy for people to understand. Deception makes it unnecessarily complex. Now, if you take a closer look, what you will find that remains unchanged is the coding of the deaths. So look just below over there, where it says all deaths involving COVID-19. You notice in the brackets it says U07.1. That's the coding for COVID-19 death, and it's still the same on the previous screenshot I took for June 8th. The same thing will also be found under the pneumonia section, where it's J12.0 through to J18.9. It's the same on both forms. Now, to help you understand just how dodgy they can be, though, because they've clearly changed it, I'm going to quickly just school you and clue you up on something known as the Internet Archive and how it works. So the Internet Archive is a brilliant place to go when you find something shocking online that you want to save, you want to archive that image, you want to screenshot it so that it's always available moving forward. Because of course, you know, we live in the age of censorship where somebody might have their page deleted, something might be banned and so on and so forth. A URL might be changed. And that's precisely what the CDC, so, so dodgy, have done in this particular instance. They've decided to change the phrasing. Somebody probably became aware of it and then told them, look, no, we can't do that. You've got to change it. People will be go crazy if they find out that more people have officially been designated to have died from pneumonia than COVID-19. So if you go to the Internet Archive right now, I and many other silent heroes out there, I see you and I appreciate you, have saved that previous URL. So you can go in and you can fact check what I'm saying is what I'm trying to uh, simply put into context here. You can go look into it for yourself and see how they've changed it. And this will help you become wise to their ways and help you become aware of how dodgy they can actually be. And then if we look at the actual active cases right now, all right guys, uh, I just took this, I think maybe a week ago I took the screenshot. Uh, this is what we know about currently infected patients. And those who are in mild condition account for 99% of the population, guys. And those are just the ones we know about. As I already said, you know, according to you know, OVIC Healthline, and it has been fact-checked, <laughs> just to throw that out there, where they say that as many as 80% of people with COVID-19 aren't even aware that they have the virus. So we're talking about something that, yes, it may be more infectious, it may spread quicker than the regular flu, but it, it's not very deadly, guys. Okay, it's, it's just not very deadly. We need to be aligned with reality, not the propaganda and hysteria of the media and their conflicts of interest, or the scientific advisors and their conflicts of interest, or the governments and their conflicts of interest. And this study over here really helps to encapsulate just how absolutely ridiculous all of this is. I'm, I'm actually really glad that they put this forward and put it together, but unfortunately, you've probably never even heard of it. The media has not even covered this. Even though the lead author, John Ioannidis, who, this is one of the most respected scientists in the world, guys. He's one of the most highly cited, very well respected. And he has been a huge critic of the lockdown policies. Huge, huge critic. But have you heard anything from him? Probably not. In the videos, I've showed him a few times. Okay. But have you heard from him from the establishment media? Probably not, because they know that this guy is an authority 
that is well respected and he's challenging them so he poses a threat so what do they do they just choose to ignore it and in this particular study what they decided to do was measure the risk of dying from COVID-19 if you are under the age of 65 to driving your car and they found it to be comparable as you can see over here they found that the risk was comparable to driving between 13 and 101 miles per day in 11 countries and 6 states that's just, that's crazy guys 13 miles that means like if you go drive to the to a friend's house the chance of you dying on the way to their house let's say it's a friend that's living in a neighboring town or whatever uh, <laughs> the chances of you dying are comparable to the chances of you dying from COVID-19 it's outrageous that we were acting this way it's totally insane and I want to make it clear that this has not yet been peer-reviewed but even still then why is it that the media, they can spread a study, a mathematical theoretical study that was never published in a scientific journal, nor was it peer reviewed. And it came from a guy who has a terrible history of putting forward bad predictions and bad studies. Why can they spread that like wildfire, but you don't hear anything about this in the media? Again, it's, the double standards are just so obvious. So, so obvious. And what that essentially means, guys, if those studies are accurate, that means that more than 91% of the world's population, which is the, de the demographic of people under the age of 65, it means that we are being told that we have to be forced into lockdown, wear these masks and change life as we know it, go unemployment, etc, etc, because of something that is as likely to kill us as driving a car. We need to stand up against what's going on here because this is just insane. And if they get away with it, they are going to do it again. That's exactly how bullies and predators work. They like to see what they can get away with, and then they cross that line again, cross that line again. Now the third thing, and this is the big one, and we're going to spend some time on this, because they're putting us at risk, they're putting us in danger, guys. Based on actual scientific evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming, the lockdown itself is far more dangerous than COVID-19. So let's check out this testimony. Lockdown policies worldwide will create, will, 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 we're already in it, a, a, a devastating global economic depression. That depression will kill people, large numbers of people. A global economic collapse will cost lives of, of, I believe, millions of people. And not just in the United States, I mean worldwide. Literally billions of people's lives are at stake from a, a global economy that's not functioning well. There have been people who have delayed their chemotherapy as a result of the lockdown. They've, they've had heart attacks and not gone to the doctor. They've had, uh, there, there's, I just saw a report that uh, estimating, you know, nearly uh, uh, 75,000 people additional will have committed suicide or, or as a result of the, the lockdown, I mean, for these, these deaths of despair. Uh, wait, over wait, the next year. Worldwide or? No, U.S. If the economy is ruined, you have unemployment, you have poverty, you have bankruptcies, you have uh, uh, lots of diseases that are associated with this sort of social and economic disruption. We have strong evidence that that can lead to an increase in depression, in anxiety, in suicides, uh, in heart attacks, uh, in common things, in, in things that cumulatively could have a much higher impact on deaths compared to what uh, SARS-CoV-2 can achieve on, on its own. Suicide is spiking. Education has dropped off. Economic collapse. Medical industry, we're all suffering because our staff isn't here and we have no volume. These are all real things that I'm seeing every day. I don't, I don't read about this stuff. I'm seeing it in my clinics. We have clinics from Fresno to San Diego, and these things are spiking in our community. These things will affect people for a lifetime not for a season. Social isolation actually leads to upregulation uh, of inflammatory compounds in the body and downregulation of antiviral compounds. So you're basically increasing the person for viral infection by the amount of stress you're causing them from social isolation. And separate from that, we're telling people not to go out in the sun, which is vitamin D. Vitamin D is an antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially a recipe for actually hurting people. More People will die from the unemployment than from Corona. 
And these are different people, much younger. They are the bread provider of families. More people will die from unemployment. So my view is that shutdown is lunacy. Das fällt jetzt alles weg. Sie können davon ausgehen, dass diese Maßnahmen insgesamt die Lebenserwartung dieser 2200 Menschen verkürzen wird. Dann haben wir natürlich die wirtschaftlichen Folgen, die so horrend sind und für viele existenzgefährdend. Und letztlich haben wir natürlich die direkten medizinischen Folgen. Wir haben jetzt schon Engpässe bei der Versorgung. Es können Operationen nicht durchgeführt werden. Es können kranke Menschen nicht versorgt werden, optimal versorgt werden. Personal wird abgezogen oder fehlt in den Krankenhäusern, weil die Mütter auf ihre Kinder aufpassen müssen. Das sind alles Dinge, die natürlich auch noch schlimmer Folgen haben werden. Ich kann nur sagen, diese Maßnahmen sind selbstzerstörerisch. Und dass wenn die Gesellschaft die akzeptiert und durchführt, gleich dieses einen kollektiven Selbstmord. There's no doubt in my mind that when we come to look back on this, the damage done by lockdown will exceed any saving of lives by a huge factor. There is no question if you shut down the economy of the United States and other countries in the Western world, that this is creating hardship that at a scale that is difficult to imagine. I really worry that unless we manage to have a viable plan to exit from lockdown and shelter in place and reopen our world, the consequences will be far worse than coronavirus. Now, in addition to the testimony that they've shared with you, I want to go further into this. I want to help you understand that the true danger we face with, it's not the disease, guys. It's the fear mongering. It's the authorities. And this has been the problem throughout history. I've been on about this for over 10 years. For thousands of years, this has been the cancer. Okay, this has been the problem. If society was a collective body, this is a problem of gangrene. And if you don't chop off the finger or find a way to eliminate it, it's going to infect the rest of the body and kill the host. Now, I'm not saying we need a violent revolution. Don't take my words out of context, but we need a revolution of the mind. We need to wake up and realize who the real enemy is in all of this. It's not left and right and black and white and religion and atheist and so on and so forth. It's elitism, okay, elitism. So as you can see, and I just want to help you guys develop a very keen understanding of this so you can defend yourself. And like I said, um, we will go into some detail later on. I will share a blog with you that I wrote on how you can deal with depression and how you can deal with stress and so on and so forth because that is the key right now you got to defend yourself from the ignorance and the fear mongering so you see our psychological stress can not only increase susceptibility to infection but it also impairs wound healing and enhances hypersensitivity inflammatory states so that means that the fear alone can make you sick guys and it, it goes it snowballs it's way more than just that so stress contributes to a range of chronic diseases and these are all different studies you can go look them up all published or peer-reviewed stress levels linked to risk of liver disease death uh, stress and cancer through the they call it the master switch so stress aggravates cancer stress and diabetes are linked directly together inflammatory arthritis Anger stress dysregulation produces wear and tear on the lungs, so it also damages your lungs. Yeah, we also have an upper respiratory infection, so that means it can easily contribute to getting so-called COVID-19, guys, or pneumonia, or many other diseases. And then the big one, study finds how stress raises heart disease and stroke. And then beyond that, for example, they did a study over here where it shows that The largest ever investigation into low-level mental health problems suggests it can shorten life expectancy. So stress and anxiety, even low levels, prolonged period, that can shorten your life expectancy. 
Researchers from the University of Edinburgh and University College London studied data from 68,000 adults and they found that even small amounts of stress and anxiety could lead to an early death. Now, please, guys, I don't want to induce a panic attack or contribute to the fear mongering or make you further anxious. That's not necessary. Stress and anxiety are part of life. So don't, I know when I suffered from PTSD and depression and so on and so forth, you feel so alone in that. You feel very alone in that. So when you hear something like this, it freaks you out. But that's not necessary. Okay, everybody deals with stress and anxiety. It's a part of this life, particularly because the system, it constantly fear mongers, all right? It constantly produces these ridiculous news headlines and so on and so forth. So it's not necessary to give into that. If you feel like this is overwhelming you, then you can fast forward a little bit. But if you can handle it for a bit, I'm just trying to inform you, enlighten you, and thus empower you. And then later on, I will show, show you how you can deal formidably and intelligently with stress and anxiety. Again, yeah, yeah, I'll study. The evidence for this is just, it's overwhelming, guys, how dangerous stress is. And in this way, the media, the establishment media, the authorities, what they're doing is criminal. They're putting our lives at risk. They're putting our loved ones at risk. And that is what I'm going to get into right here. Okay, not just what those scientists and professors and so on and so forth um, explain to you, but we're, gonna, we're going to explore it in detail because I want you to understand how serious this is, guys. It's, it's criminal. It's criminal. Yeah, we see emotional stress as a trigger in SCDs, which is sudden cardiac death. Between 20 and 40% of sudden cardiac death, so that's like a heart attack, are precipitated by acute emotional stresses. And yeah, you see uh, just a quick example that I want to share with you. Mondays is the most likely time. The study actually showed SCD incidence peaks from 6 a.m. to noon on Monday mornings. And then conversely, the lowest is over the weekend, right? When we'll be chilling. So it shows that there's a strong component with stress, guys. Stress is, it's paramount. We are being misled where we're not actually being informed and properly enlightened about how to maintain good health. We live in a society that is in conflict with empowerment and enlightenment, unfortunately. And that is because it comes from the top down. It's policy. If you look close enough into everything, and I've shown you enough convincing evidence thus far, with the big tobacco companies and uh, with the big sugar companies, buying scientists, working with governments, deregulating, it's, it's just crazy. And the only way out of this, I don't want to overwhelm you and say, damn, you know, the world is screwed and it's Armageddon. And it's... No, guys, we just have to awaken. And right now... Partly why this is happening is because so many people are awakening. There's a deeper agenda here, and I'm going to get into that a bit later. And here we go also triggered by earthquakes. So just to make it very clear that sudden cardiac deaths, and this is happening to people right now. It's happening. They are putting people's lives at risk. It's untenable, it's indefensible, and it's unforgivable, in my opinion. Yeah, you see, and this was just from uh, April 16th, this article. Anti-anxiety medication prescriptions are up to 34% since coronavirus. And you don't have to even see headlines or studies to know that people are very scared right now. People are shit scared. And it's not their fault. They've just been misled by trusted authorities. And then yeah, you see, up to one in five hospitalized patients have signs of heart injury. And you know, the doctors, they are just puzzled by this. It's a mystery, mysterious heart damage. You know, they don't understand. They're also developing heart problems and dying of cardiac arrest. But when you see that the pharmaceutical industry, based on this study right here, shows the pharmaceutical industry funds about half of the cost of continuing medical education programs in the U.S. and who knows elsewhere what the statistics are like. It's probably comparable. That, to me, explains why they have become so idiotic. I mean, you cannot deduce. Based, I just showed you a bunch of evidence about the clear, very, very clear, crystal clear link between stress and it damaging the heart or causing heart attacks. So now they, they, can't, they cannot ascertain something so elementary and simple. It's a mystery. No, it's not a mystery. You are faced with unprecedented stress. So people right now are naturally developing heart problems. I mean, that should at least be considered, don't you think? I mean, it's been that way. We've got so much evidence that confirms that. But of course, these former funded doctors, they just don't know their arse from their elbow. And then beyond that, chronic stress obviously leads to anxiety and depression. The problem with that is depression is the number one cause of ill health and disability worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. 
That that's a big deal, guys. I mean, last time I checked, it's, it's something like several hundred million people suffer from depression, and who knows how many suffer from it that we don't even have statistics or we have an accurate uh, potential figure for. And then these guys over here, they did a study on the psychological impact of quarantine and how to reduce it. And they found that quarantine is associated with poor mental health, specifically post-traumatic stress symptoms, avoidance behaviors, and anger. And this was just for more than 10 days that this began to emerge, guys. They also found that children had higher post-traumatic stress scores, four times higher than those who were not quarantined. So this COVID-19, it's relatively insipid based on everything that I've shown you. Yes, yeah, some people will die, guys, but that happens with the flu. Okay, some healthy people will die, but that happens every day. Doesn't mean we have to shut down the world economy and act completely crazy and traumatize people and isolate them with these quarantines. It's counterproductive. It's not just counterproductive, it's an attack. That's what people don't realize, and I'm going to get into that later on. This is very, very skillful and deliberate. And it may not be deliberate on all government's parts. I don't want to even make that leap. There's a lot of good people within governments. There's a lot of good people within these banks and these corporations and even these intelligence agencies and even in the pharmaceutical companies. It's just that the higher echelons, they have sinister intentions. And yeah, we see social isolation also, guys, linked to type 2 diabetes. They did a study on mice, and that's relevant because mice have similar immune responses and also neurological responses as we do, and it showed it worsens cancer, social isolation. Here we go again, loneliness isolation is linked to a heightened risk of heart disease and stroke, up to 30% increased risk. A lot of people are going to be prematurely dying because of the stress and the social isolation, guys. And here we go again, linked to a higher risk of all causes of premature death. So I'm just putting into perspective right now, what's happening? It will far exceed. Millions of people sadly are going to die, they're going to suffer, they're going to be traumatized. Bad things are going to happen, but not because of COVID-19, because of the authoritarian reactions and measures being taken and imposed on us by the ruling class. And of course, unemployment. Rising unemployment causes higher death rates. We have a lot of evidence for that too. Unemployment tied to premature death study. Unemployment associated with 50% higher risk of heart death in heart failure patients. And this again is because for anybody that's ever been unemployed, it's very stressful. Right? It's very stressful for a number of different reasons. I mean, I'm financially struggling at the moment. It is very stressful. And I'm sure a lot of you are too. That's why we have to collectively stand together and figure out how can we change this? How can we awaken people to what's really going on here? And you have to have courage to do that, but at the same time, if you're standing with the truth, guys, it doesn't matter if they're standing with authority. If authority is wrong, they're wrong. Don't fear. Don't fear standing up for the truth. Heart attack related deaths were sharply after the 2008 crash. Yeah, another thing that's definitely going to turn out is global economic downturn linked with at least 260,000 excess cancer deaths. There's going to be a lot of excess deaths right now because people are either too scared to seek out the help they need, or they're being overlooked because COVID-19 has become the, you know, the main focus. Uh, we have to clear out all the hospital patients, we have to overlook people who have very serious illnesses because of COVID-19. It's, it's outrageous. Then of course suicide. People have no idea. Suicide is a major problem, guys. You know, we see 800,000 people commit suicide every year. I think the exact figure is actually 794,000, but it's roughly 800,000 each year. And that's one person around every 40 seconds. These figures also, they skyrocket when unemployment goes up or when there's social isolation or, of course, fear. All of those things produce high levels of suicide. As you can see, a study they did with the 2000 global economic crisis, this showed that suicide rates were severely impacted. And yeah, it's just a headline, unfortunately, this poor young lady, 19 years old, beautiful and charming, she killed herself because she just couldn't have faced the isolation. Same with this dude, yeah, and there's many, many stories. Wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear about all of them either because a lot of governments obviously have a vested interest to find a way to justify the ridiculous actions they've taken. There's another study, unemployment causes 45,000 suicides a year. Well, we're faced with an unprecedented level of unemployment right now, guys. The implications are just colossal. Yeah, also in Japan, there's a study showing the correlation between unemployment and suicide. 
Then of course there's household air pollution, which I mentioned earlier, right? I still gave you a low figure earlier per year. Over here, the World Health Organization claims 3.8 million people die every single year from indoor air pollution, guys. That's a huge, huge figure. And that will probably be exacerbated right now because of what's going on with everybody being forced indoors. Also this, this is another dimension that people are considering. This report over here from the US government showed that trafficking, which, and just to quickly put this into perspective, human trafficking is human slavery, guys. That's just a politicized term. And there are more slaves today than at any time in human history, and they come in all skin colors, just as they actually did throughout history, that most people don't even know about. And if you look into the actual information, there's more of them today than at any time in human history. Most of them are in India, but nobody's talking about that. And whenever there's a, a financial crisis, such as this one, guess what happens, guys? Unfortunately, that skyrockets. And you can be damn sure that's precisely what's going to be happening again now. The same with child abuse and child trafficking. I mean, this is a very skillful, indirect declaration of war. And those who are awakened are aware of this. Trying to wake everybody else up to it is the difficult part. And like I said, don't get scared. Fear is counterproductive. All right, it's absolutely unnecessary. We don't have to be scared, guys. We just have to stick together, realize that we are numbered them by at least like 100 million to one. Really, it's not the 1%, it's the 0.01%. And if we can simply awaken to this, then we can create positive change. I mean, they are the least among us. If you take a look at these cats at the highest levels, because way in the background, we have families like the Rockefeller family. If you take a look at them, these cats are not, I mean, what are, do they know Kung Fu? I mean, are they gonna hand-to-hand -to -hand combat? And, no, of course not. They're Mickey Mouses beyond all their manipulative propaganda. They, they derive their power through controlling our perceptions and working and playing us against each other. But beyond that, they have no power of their own. None. Yeah, we see, for example, India's lockdown reality, 92,000 calls of child abuse in 11 days. And domestic abuse calls are up. Yeah, in the UK, in France. And there's also a direct link, guys, studies show between rises in child abuse and mass unemployment. The, the evidence for all of this is overwhelming. So that's why I said it is unjustifiable. It is indefensible. And like I said, it's unforgivable. What they're doing is unforgivable because they are putting people's lives at risk. And it's not like governments have just started making stupid decisions. And I want to be a bit more precise because governments, there are good people within governments. It's more so the shadow government. And this is pharmaceutical companies and different intelligence agencies and different members of the government. It's, all, it's people within these institutions, secret societies. It's not all of them, it's members. And those ones who are maliciously and consciously and deliberately doing this are predators. And we need to find a way to stand together and help everybody become aware of this so that we can free ourselves from their rapacious influence. And we see again unemployment triggers increase in child neglect. And then of course our animal friends. They're also suffering because of this, guys. Cats and dogs, the, the relationship we've had with them, and how many of them have been abandoned? That's horrible. It's, 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 it's not right. And yeah, there's a study that shows just within the United States, they claim that 75,000, quote-unquote, deaths of despair, as was mentioned in the video, from suicide, drug, and alcohol abuse. 75,000 deaths from that alone, guys. And it's probably going to be larger. That's the sad reality. And yeah, we have a modeling study. It claims that the coronavirus lockdown could lead to nearly 1.5 million extra tuberculosis deaths. So it's important that we consider the totality of this equation. You know, in my mind, everything that we have seen, the conflicts of interest, the media propaganda, the fear mongering, it's, it's outrageous. And I just, I just hope everybody has the capability to still critically think just a little bit for yourself and realize just how criminal all of this is. And then the last thing that I want to look into, guys, 
experts who are not being given the appropriate platform to express themselves are claiming that predictions of millions of people dying without a lockdown, this is actually based on theory, and in the words of John Ioannidis, is science fiction. The, the turning point did seem to be that inter Imperial College report, which mm -hmm. forecast 510,000 deaths in the UK with a completely unmitigated approach, 250,000 deaths with a mitigated approach, which is roughly equivalent to what you're doing in Sweden. And then it suggests that it might be as few as 20,000 if we did a full suppression or lockdown. What was your impression of that paper? Um, I think it's not very good. The paper was never published scientifically. It's not peer-reviewed, which a scientific paper should be. It's just an internal departmental report from Imperial. And it's fascinating. I don't think any other scientific endeavor has made such an impression on the world as that rather uh, debatable paper. At what point did you break away from believing in the imperial model? How early on did you start suspecting it was wrong? From the very beginning, I never believed in it. Why? It didn't make any sense. And the, the problem is some people put out models that have no relation to reality, and then you can prove everything, including the opposite. Uh, we should use models that are actually grounded in reality. And if we do that, uh, we get realistic estimates. They can be 10% too high or even 20%, uh, but they will not be off by several orders of magnitude. These scenarios of 40 million deaths in the world and uh, two plus million deaths in, in the US uh, by doing nothing are, are science fiction at the moment. I, I cannot describe them uh, in, in any other terms. Border closures, school closures, social distancing, there's almost no science behind most of these. Why do you argue that a, a national lockdown, the kind of which we're seeing in the US, now in the UK, and certainly here in India, we've been having a national lockdown for the last four weeks. Uh, why do you believe that that's not the ideal model to follow? Because most of the measures countries take have no scientific foundation at all. They're just uh, politicians take them because they look strong, decisive, uh, active, uh, but the science behind uh, uh, closing your borders, there's no such science. The science behind closing schools, there's no such science behind. There's definitely no scientific evidence around lockdowns. There's no scientific evidence about closing borders. And even for flu, there's not very strong evidence that school closures really makes a difference in the long run. The evidence for the effectiveness of these interventions is quite weak and limited. There is no evidence around that doing any of these antisocial uh, separation or prohibition or whatever you call it has any effect on the epidemic. With one exception, it, it broadened or uh, flattening the curve, what people try to do, is broadening it. And that means it takes more time. And if it takes more time, in the end, you are putting more people at risk because nobody can, for extended periods of time, follow these uh, draconic um, strategies. The final number of infected people is the same whether you have a lockdown or not. No difference. You reach the final number slowly if you have a lockdown. But the final number is the same. The other thing with a lockdown is when you open it, you will have more cases. So the countries who pride themselves in having few deaths now will get these deaths when they start lifting the lockdown. You lift the lockdown, then it just starts growing again. Okay. Right. Uh, I mean, so it's not that the, lock the lockdowns are not a mechanism for disease eradication. Right. They're not a mechanism of disease eradication. They will never eradicate a disease. It'll only Good. delay when the, when the disease happens, now or later. You pay the cost now or you pay it later. And if you lock everybody away from everybody else, kind of wait until things get better and then let everybody out into the world, the virus is still out there.
we don't have antibodies, we'll just get it later. I mean, if, we, if all you do is flatten the curve, you don't prevent deaths or severe cases, you just change the dates. We don't wanna do that. Here's, here's the odd part, Bill, that I think people have a hard time confronting and accepting. We actually kind of want to get this and get it over with and be immune because that is the path to the all clear that doesn't require us to wait for a vaccine, which optimistically is 18 months away, but could be much longer. If there is a second wave, it is because the shutdown was preventing herd immunity to build. And the way to prevent that is to let the virus run its course right now and be done with it. Okay, now I hope that that video will help to illuminate and provide you with a bit more understanding. But to further help you see through the fog of deception and the fog of confusion, I just want to go through what the difference is between a lockdown and between no lockdown, because we're not being informed about this appropriately. So as you can see over here, this is very elementary childish propaganda that they constantly utilize with this particular graph, where they'll show without protective measures in red, because red symbolizes danger. It's, uh, it's something that is alarming. And then they always have a more innocuous color for with protective measures, green or baby blue. And what they are claiming is that without protective measures, the number of cases will skyrocket, right? Because more people will get sick quicker because not everybody's subjected to the disease, right? And then it's going to overwhelm the hospital systems. That's the claim. That's what they're resting on. A lot of this still is based on uh, theoretical evidence. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But that's the claim. And then they say that, well, with protective measures, we can hide away in our homes and then slowly we'll get the disease. Very, very slowly. No matter what, we still have to get infected. Now, what they aren't taking into account, what they aren't talking about, is the fact that during this time, months are going by. The longer you do a lockdown, right? And then all of those deaths from so-called despair, whether it be suicides, premature heart attacks. I mean, I showed you the evidence, the, si the actual concrete scientific evidence is overwhelming that lockdowns, forced unemployment, social isolation is extremely dangerous. And in all likelihood, I mean, like Michael Levitt, said himself, he has no doubt that this is going to far exceed. And many other professors and prestigious um, figures of that are also authority, but they're just being ignored, that it's going to far exceed anything that, uh, that could have potentially been stopped by the lockdowns. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. But where this also falls on its face, guys, the big, big place, because their whole argument rests on, oh no, you know, this would have overwhelmed the hospitals, is right now, if you look around the world, here we have Scotland, more than half of ICU beds are empty. And you see over here, all of our rooms are empty and hospital ER is vacant. Same as NHS Nightingale hospitals. Thousands of hospital beds are empty, despite non-COVID patients denied treatment. Up to four in 10 hospital beds for urgent treatment are empty, even though thousands of people with non-coronavirus illnesses desperately need treatment. Yeah, NHS hospitals have four times more empty beds than normal. And then also in the United States, Army Seattle Field Hospital closes after three days without treating a single patient. So again, the claims that they have, so on the one end, it's based overwhelmingly on theory, the studies that they have available, we're going to get into that in just a little bit. It's, it's actually mind-blowing how weak their evidence is, their evidence for these lockdowns. And then on the other hand, we actually have concrete scientific evidence how dangerous the lockdowns are, but they insist on extending this lockdown or doing these social distancing policies or changing the way the world operates entirely based on this very, very nonsensical explanation. And it, it falls on its face, guys. All right? It's going to overwhelm the hospital system. Well, the hospital systems right now are, are underwhelmed. They're not overwhelmed. Now, beyond that, let's, because this is actually where a lot of the justification originates from for these social distancing policies is the Spanish flu, right? We've all heard about the Spanish flu, right? But it's being completely, grossly misrepresented and entirely taken out of context. So let's investigate Spanish flu propaganda and why it is deceptive and misleading. So we're going to look at examples of communities and countries that actually defied lockdowns that you aren't being told about. We're also going to look into reports of those that were treated with homeopathy having much lower death rates than conventional medicine. And then we're going to look at several major reasons why comparisons between then and now, between COVID-19 and the Spanish flu, are just completely idiotic and misleading. 
And like I said, we've all heard about this over and over again, right? The World Health Organization, oh, and I quote, the worst is to come. They liken COVID-19 to the Spanish flu. And Neil Ferguson from Imperial College London, who was behind that obscene, ridiculous theoretical study, which was never scientifically published in a scientific journal or peer-reviewed, he also compared it to the Spanish flu. And then we have, of course, Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates says, these are the four big lessons from the Spanish flu that we should heed during the coronavirus pandemic. And then also on his Facebook and his Twitter, he shared that you need to read this book about the great influenza, the 1918 Spanish flu. And then also the media, just everywhere, The Guardian, BBC, Express, Mail Online. And what this essentially is doing, guys, because it's, again, it's a very very low level propaganda technique. It's classical conditioning, which is where you are targeting the associative memory. What's the associative memory? If you hear a certain song and it reminds you of somebody, it's because you developed the memory. So it associates the two. Example, back in the day with the big tobacco companies, they would manipulate people's associative memory by associating their toxic cigarettes with doctors. So people trust doctors, right? thereby they can manipulate your associative memory. And this is really how the overwhelming majority of propaganda through corporations, governments, and so on and so forth is actually facilitated. This is how they do it. They manipulate your associative memory. And for those who want to look a little bit deeper into this, I mean, I go into meticulous, assiduous detail about this in my book because it's so important to understand the methodology. And I use many examples from war, to product placement in movies, you know, like Superman, you'll quickly have a swig of beer or something. That gets your associated memory. It just takes a few seconds. Very powerful stuff. And if you want, though, you can just quickly look into classical conditioning online and you can learn more about how, how this works. So let's take an actual look at where these justifications for these lockdowns and social distancing policies are coming from, right? This is what the media, again, should have done. They should have looked into this information and scrutinized it and picked it apart. So yeah, we have the medical school for the University of Michigan, in which they explain that this study that they conducted, along with others that supported our conclusions, became the basis for the CDC's pandemic response guidelines. So it's imperative that we know about this, right? Let's take a closer look. It's called Non-Pharmaceutical Interventions Implemented by U.S. Cities During the 1918-1919 Influenza Pandemic. And if you read, in this publication, in their own study, they acknowledge that even the most rigorous non-pharmaceutical interventions are unlikely either to prevent a pandemic or change a population's underlying biological susceptibility to the pandemic virus. So they, right away, they acknowledge it. However, a growing body of, and what's the key term there, boys and girls? Theoretical modeling research. Theoretical modeling, which is a poor substitute for concrete science. So we have this theoretical modeling, a lot of the theoretical modeling, as to why social distancing works. Theory, and then all of that science I just shared you with, concrete, evidence-based science. Evidence, theory. And instead, the authorities are going with the theory over the evidence. Think about that. And then they also explain that, you know, this growing body of theoretical modeling research suggests that non-pharmaceutical interventions might play a salubrious role in delaying the temporal effect of a pandemic. Now, in fact, based on their own study, if you look a little bit deeper into it, I learned this ironically from the BBC. It didn't come out now. It came out like it, maybe two years ago or something, this article. But it's fascinating because what they found is that some communities in 1918 also appeared to have escaped the virus against all logic. The 737 people living in the town of Fletcher, Vermont, that they studied, they defied advice to avoid contact with the outside world, and they held a dance and attended a county fair in a neighboring town. The town even hosted a wedding for a soldier from a military camp in Massachusetts that saw 28% of its population hit by the Spanish flu, and they suffered 757 deaths in that same month as the wedding. Yet despite this, the 120 guests that attended the wedding, uh, the residents of Fletcher appeared to have dodged a proverbial bullet. So they never got sick, guys. They were subjected 
to a very high death rate or a population that was subjected to a very high death rate and infection rate of the Spanish flu. They danced with him, they partied with him, and they were perfectly fine. And then they explain, and this good fortune is perhaps the greatest lesson that the escape communities of 1918 have to offer modern health public officials. Many communities that implemented rigid protection and quarantine measures were still hit by the pandemic. So what they're explaining is, this they couldn't quite make sense of. These people didn't social distance, they didn't lock down, they defied the lockdown orders, and they managed to stay relatively healthy. There were no deaths. None of these people died, right? And then they're also saying in the same token that some of the communities did stringent lockdowns and they still got sick and many of them still died. That right there is significant. The media should be making us aware of this. Let's have a balanced debate about this. Have a balanced discussion. And then beyond the United States, because we constantly hear about these studies in the United States, what about Denmark? Have you heard anything about Denmark? Well, Denmark had the lowest excess mortality during the influenza pandem pandemic of 1918. And in the study, it says that there are no indications of public health interventions to reduce the impact of the flu in Denmark. So they didn't do that, and yet they had the lowest excess mortality during the influenza pandemic of 1918. We should be made, we should talk about this, right? Because, oh, you know, this, the Spanish flu, we, this is why we need a Spanish, I mean, this is why we need to lock down, this is why we need a social distance. What about this evidence? What about these studies? And this is also another good example to look at, guys, is China and then British India, when India was ruled by the British authorities. These were the two most populated countries at the time, and they were expected and anticipated to have similar outcomes as a result of the Spanish flu. But what happened with British India is they had by far the highest death toll. I mean, I think it was something like 15 million. You'll have to look up how many people died or were attributed as dying to the Spanish flu. Whereas China actually had a relatively low death rate, lower than the United States, lower than the United Kingdom and many other countries. Now the thing is they are they pretty much almost border each other. So what was the difference, right? And I mean, also if we look at India, they had what could somewhat be considered social distancing. Uh, there wasn't a deliberate policy of this, but because they were under colonial rule, there were severe restrictions on how many people could be together in meetings and so on and so forth. And then also by 1919, after this massacre, then they were on full-on martial law, full-on lockdown. And it's also important to point out that there was this massacre because there's so many other factors behind why people will die from a so-called uh, illness such as Spanish flu or whatever it may be. Like, even now, we're being totally misled about this so-called Spanish flu where it's just, oh, this evil virus came running through the world and it just killed everybody. It's being taken out of context, guys. The, the media and the authorities love to give oversimplified examples they, they don't want you to think critically, right? But if we look at this study, what did China do, right? Well, how come China had this low death rate? Now, there's something very important that is being overlooked that we aren't being told about again by the media is that during those years, quoting the study here, modern medicine was undergoing its early phase of development and a high mortality was expected in cases of viral infections affecting the lungs, guys. But then they proceed to say, well, how did patients in China manage to survive better? And it's because they didn't actually rely on modern medicine. This is what they believe, based on their study, is that we think the likely explanation is that traditional Chinese medicine may have played an important role. It's a fascinating study to look into. And they just explain some of the tactics used in this one particular area by the local government. They had people use lime water, mung bean powder, and uh, different natural remedies, guys. It's definitely very interesting and worth looking into. And this becomes especially fascinating to me when I consider what was documented in the Journal of the American Institute of Homeopathy in May 1921. Now, this is a scientifically published peer-reviewed journal that's still in circulation today. And these were self-reported, so we should never blindly believe any authority, but it's worth looking into. I mean, it's shocking to me that the media makes no mention of this because it's, it's quite fascinating. It's worth exploring deeper. And what they reported, and I just kind of picked a few of them out here, but you can look this up easily online, 
is in a plant of 8,000 workers, we had only one death. The patients were not drugged to death. Again, remember, modern medicine was undergoing its early phase of development, guys. And a high mortality was expected. And there's still loads of medical errors today, as I explained earlier. So in a plant of 8,000 workers, we had only one death. The patients were not drugged to death. There's another guy, Dean W.A. Pearson of Philadelphia, collected 26,795 cases of influenza treated by homeopathic phys physicians with a mortality of 1.05%, while the average old school mortality in that region was around 30%. Yeah, we see another quote, my low death rate at Camp Lee was due entirely to the fact that I avoided the use of aspirin absolutely. I was complimented by the chief medical officer as having the lowest death rate in the hospital. After the medical chief had noted the effect of aspirin on the blood and the results which I was having in using homeopathy, he discouraged the use of aspirin and the death rate came down very rapidly after that ruling. Well, as you're going to find, there was a study convened that showed a high number of deaths could potentially be attributed to the overprescription, the overprescribing of aspirin. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. And then finally at the bottom here, Murphy of Lansing, Michigan, he treated 325 cases of influenza in a camp where the mortality had been roughly 20%, while the mortality under his homeopathic treatment was less than 3%. So this is significant. I realize these are self-reported. Because again, it was not as assiduous the way that they kept statistics and reported back then by way of comparison today. But this is still significant. In order to have a balanced debate, a balanced argument, and this is a prestigious journal, we should be made aware of this, right? There's another factor here. And that's a totally another element that is being overlooked in relation to disease. We are completely overlooking the fact that we have this brilliant immune system that if you give it the appropriate food, the appropriate nutrition, you don't overstress it, you don't overwhelm it with unnecessary things, it can actually take really good care of you guys. But that's been entirely overlooked in the age of Big Pharma, where it's just about, you know, Big Pharma will keep you healthy. Come to us, we've got, you know, pay and we'll, we'll give you what you need. All right, and then this investigation of your, this, this which was published in Infectious Diseases Society of America, Aspirin misuse may have made 1918 a flu pandemic worse. And what they found through this research, the author was Karen M. Stocker, uh, unfortunately the motivation behind the improper use of aspirin is a cautionary tale, she explains. In 1918 physicians did not fully understand either the dosing or pharmacology of aspirin, yet they were willing to recommend it. Its use was promoted by the drug industry, endorsed by doctors wanting to quote-unquote do something and accepted by families and institutions desperate for hope. In medical areas to this day, it's a big problem, guys. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. So in this way, those doctors that were relying on homeopathy, they may very well be telling the truth because back then they didn't realize that the overprescription of aspirin, it can obviously be very, very deadly. They didn't know that back then. As she explains, in 1918, the U.S. Surgeon General of the U.S. Navy and the Journal of the American Medical Association, so the authorities that we just blindly trust, they recommended the use of aspirin just before the so-called October death spike. And this is significant to understand, guys, because again, it's, it's more complex. How many of you even know that this was considered a problem back then? I, I presume very few of you, because we aren't being told about the whole picture. And then even today, medical errors and medical mistakes are a leading uh, killer. Yeah, you see, between 5 and 8 million people die every single year due to medical errors and medical accidents. All right, medical errors or medical accidents, which they term in a very, a very politically correct term. It's adverse outcomes. And, but it is, it's medical mistakes or medical um, accidents. They see between 5 and 8 million people die every single year as a result of this. Take a little bit closer look, we see ineffective care was responsible on average for 25% of deaths caused by the conditions examined. This means that, there, that many individuals suffering from HIV, tuberculosis and mental illnesses are getting access. But the quality of the care is so poor that they are dying from that care. And you see over here, nearly one in five hospitalized patients who went to the hospital to get better were instead harmed in the process. 
overall 134 million adverse hospital events occurred and again that's that very politically correct term that they're using but it's clearly medical accidents or errors leading to approximately 2.6 million preventable hospital deaths annually and then it explains that even when treatment coverage is high for a condition harm may come from the treatment itself for example over 120,000 HIV patients who are connected to treatment end up dying from substandard and falsified medicines every single year. Now this, uh, it needs to be pointed out, this is in LMIC country, which is lower and middle income countries. Nonetheless, those who live in so-called first world countries, you don't get a free pass. Because if you look at this study from John Hopkins University, they explain that more than 250,000 deaths per year in the United States are due to medical errors. And this research was published in the British Medical Journal. That's pretty mind-blowing, right? So we have this, this exaggerated threat and danger about, and it's being totally taken out of context, but we aren't told about other dangers from the authorities themselves. And I'm not trying to undermine your trust in these institutions. I'm not trying to contribute to the fear mongering. All I'm saying is you need to question the reality that is being presented to you. Now beyond what I've just shared with you that show that uh, there's a lot more to the Spanish flu that we aren't being told about, right? I'm going to explain five reasons why comparing the 1918 Spanish flu to the 2019-2020 COVID-19 is just, it's completely ridiculous guys. It's rooted in propaganda. The first is that most, de most deaths during the 1918 flu, the Spanish flu, were actually attributed to a secondary infection of pneumonia. How many media outlets have actually told you about this? I'm going to get into that. And then today, what people are noting, experts are noting, is that it's pre-existing conditions. Those are the people that are mostly dying. So if, yeah, you see, for example, a number of studies have ascertained this already, you can look into it. All you have to do, guys, like I said, where I have a publication or a study that's showing uh, the headline. You can look it up yourself. I'm not going to link that. That's going to take me forever. It's unnecessary. And as you can see over here, what really happened during the 1918 influenza pandemic? The importance of bacterial secondary infections. And you know, the study bacterial pneumonia was the main killer in the 1918 flu pandemic. This is a big deal, right? Unless they are providing this context and explaining it to us, the media, then they are misleading us, right? Of course, this is a, of course you should mention that really, you know, during the Spanish flu, the reason why so many people died was actually a secondary infection of pneumonia. Oh, really? Wow, that gives me a lot more context. Instead they just say, oh, this killer virus came running through the wall and just killed everybody. And now that's similar to COVID-19 somehow. And it's most certainly not. And then as I said, correspondingly, to show how polarized, how polar opposites back then is compared to now, most people are dying now with pre-existing conditions. So on the one end, right, with the so-called Spanish flu, the pre-existing condition was the 1918 influenza and then a secondary infection of, back, of pneumonia came along and that's been attributed with the high deaths. Well now, we have pre-existing conditions, a number, one, two, sometimes three, so these are two totally different examples, and it's inappropriate to compare those two, obviously. Yeah, we've got nearly 99% of Minnesota deaths were patients with underlying conditions. And yeah, also 9 in 10 dying had existing conditions. And like I said earlier with this guy, the legendary coroner in Germany, where he explained that, you know, COVID-19 is a comparatively harmless viral disease. And according to him, the fatalities he examined had such serious previous illnesses that, and I quote, even if it's not hard, everyone would have died in the course of this year whether they had COVID-19 COVID or not, guys. Okay, what's the second thing that just shows how ridiculous these comparisons are? The age demographics. That's a big deal, guys. In the 1918 flu, it was mostly young people under 65. Mostly young people under 65, whereas now it's over 65. Again, polar opposites. I mean, it's ridiculous to make these comparisons. So you can see in the study of the threat of pandemic influenza, in the 1918 pandemic, most deaths occurred among young adults. Persons less than 65 years old accounted for more than 99% of all excess influenza-related deaths in 1918 through 1919. 
Whereas now what we are finding is over 65s account for 90% of coronavirus deaths recorded in Ireland, for example. And similar findings in other parts of the world, there's more than 90% or over the age of 60 in Canada. So it's ridiculous to make these comparisons. It's a fear-mongering tactic, guys. To make this association, this outrageous association, it's a form of propaganda and classical conditioning. Third thing, the reliability of the death reports. Once again, we have totally different scenarios. So in the first case with the 1918 flu, this was actually censored by governments. People don't realize that. It was censored by governments in most countries who were in World War I at the time, which is also a significant factor that's being overlooked. I'm going to get into that. And then today, based on expert testimony, which I've already shared with you, it's potentially being inflated by multiple governments. So we take a look over here, and this is just an interesting piece of information for people who like to learn. I know there's a rare breed out there, but if you like to learn, yeah, what you find is the term Spanish flu was a misnomer because the disease did not actually originate in Spain, guys. The disease was rampant in Germany, Britain, France, and the United States. But wartime censors minimized the early reports of illness and mortality in these countries. During the 1918 flu pandemic, Spain's king, Alfonso XIII, he actually became very ill. And his illness and recovery from the disease was reported to the world because Spain was neutral and was not under wartime censorship restrictions, while outbreaks of flu in other belligerent countries were concealed and covered up. This created the wrong impression that Spain was most affected and caused the pandemic to be dubbed as the Spanish flu. Okay, and this is a good article that if you just want to verify what I'm saying from an authoritative source, history.com. As the 1918 flu emerged, cover up and deny helped it spread. So they could have prevented a lot of diseases and deaths from taking place, but they covered it up, guys. That's significant to know, right? And as you can see here, they explain that the wartime censorship was more entrenched in European countries because Europe had been fighting since 1914, while the United States had only entered the war in 1917. But the truth of the matter is that the propaganda was prolific. Or just everywhere okay it was going on in the United States even before they entered the war you look at an organization in the United Kingdom for example Wellington House where they had the most respected authors celebrities working for them such as the writer of Sherlock Holmes for example he was involved with them and then in the United States they had the Committee on Public Information also known as the Creel Committee and when you see how far reaching their impact was how sophisticated their propaganda was it will help put into context and perspective why we need to always maintain vigilance and why we always have to question these governments. Right? Question, what are they up to? I mean, back then, they used what we now recognize as Hollywood. A lot of people don't realize the foundation of Hollywood and the film industry, a lot of that was largely rooted in government propaganda. They were found to be very useful in that particular context. They also had this campaign called The Four Minute Men where they used celebrities like Charlie Chaplin to get everybody all excited and involved in the war. And, and later on, Charlie Chaplin would, would become a bit more disillusioned. And that's another story for another day. And they would also even use scientists. Like, you know, we have Charles Edward Merriam. He was a political scientist. And to help you understand how the, the, their propaganda works and how dangerous they can be and why you should always question the narrative, guys, this over here, this political cartoon, which was commissioned by the Committee on Public Information, which was the propaganda office of the U.S. government. This political artwork, which you can find in Library of Congress, is the URL. You can go look it up for yourself. You can go fact check it. As you can see at the bottom there, what does it say? It says, the enemy's liar at work. Don't help him. So that's the message they want to broadcast to people. Well, if we take a closer look at what the so-called enemy's liar is writing, what do we see over here? Sickness spreads in camps. What they are talking about, guys, is the Spanish flu, what we recognize today to be the most deadly pandemic in human history. Over here, they were trying to trivialize it. They were trying to suggest that there's nothing going on, it's just rumors. There were probably some smaller media outlets, those crazy conspiracy theorists, that were talking about the strange sickness that was spreading in the military camps, because that's where the Spanish flu began to spread before hitting the United States population. And in this, what do they say? No, this is the enemy's liar at work. Don't help him. Do you understand how dodgy and dangerous that is? So now in hindsight, historically speaking, we have the privilege 
to be able to look back and see that, wow, not only did they cover up the fact that the Spanish flu was being proliferated and spreading, but they did it through very, very dodgy, surreptitious means of propaganda. I mean, this is just disgusting. And there's no reason why we should not believe similar methodology is not being used today. So essentially, they were covering it up. And just once again, highlighting how polar opposite it is. Because that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, we have, as Michael Levitt said, people seem, governments seem to be racing to see who can have the most COVID-19 deaths. Totally different scenario. And then over here, also, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, Deborah Burks, obviously not a fan of her, but just to explain, because she's considered a figure of authority where she herself believes that the CDC may be inflating coronavirus statistics like death rates and case numbers. So it's just totally ridiculous to make this comparison between the Spanish flu back then and today with the coronavirus. We have two total opposite happenings here where on the one side, they completely suppressed the information about how many deaths there were, and now they are potentially inflating them. I was the fourth thing, the historical context. This is so important, guys. That's why these ridiculous, oversimplified explanations that are given to us by the media, especially about something from like a hundred years ago, you, right away you need to know, okay, there must be, is there something more to this? This is investigative journalism 101. What's the context? What else could, what are the other factors? Well, this was during World War I. World War I, at that time, was the most traumatizing event globally, collectively for people in history, right? It was malnutrition because people were low on food supplies, so they had to ration food. Obviously, if you're not getting the appropriate nutrition, you're more susceptible and likely to getting sick. There were unsanitary conditions. There was also poor healthcare systems, whereas today we don't have this huge global war for the first time in history. I mean, that was the, that's World War I, right? It was unprecedented. And that means it's also unprecedented in terms of the psychological stress. And, and don't get me wrong, there's a huge amount of stress going on now too because it's being imposed and created artificially by the authorities. It's not necessary to react this way. And then, oh yeah, we, you know, we have significantly improved healthcare systems and conditions as well, guys. So again, World War One, that's a big deal that needs to be taken into consideration. And then the other thing is, this was just coming out, and not even entirely coming out, but of the age of imperialism. And this was brutal, right? It created rife conditions for people to get sick. When people are suffering or they're at war or whatever, your immune system is compromised because you're unhappy. I've already shown you very clearly, guys, stress and well-being are deeply connected, right? If you are chronically stressed, then your immune system is chronically compromised. And yeah, they showed in this published study, remember the professor I told you about earlier, he was a former director at the World Health Organization. He was very vocal against the 2009 pandemic that was declared and the conflicts of interest of big, big pharmaceutical companies, once again by Neil Ferguson and Imperial College London. Which is outrageous. I mean, you would think that they would have the creativity to use a different group. It's just, it's like a bad movie script. And over here, they document that stricken by war and hunger, poor, frail, and undernourished people paid the highest death toll. That's key to understand, guys. If you're already in a position where your immune system is obviously compromised because you don't have the appropriate nutrition, you're living in unsanitary conditions, you're impoverished, Unfortunately, you have a higher likelihood that you're going to die. It's not just that the Spanish flu is coming or COVID-19 is coming and it's so deadly. There's other factors that we need to consider. And then they explain mortality figures from the Spanish flu showed a 31-fold variability according to the nutritional and social status of the respective populations. In a hypothetical reoccurrence of the Spanish influenza pandemic, 96% of all deaths would occur in the developing countries and only 4% in the developed world. And that clearly is not what's going on here today, right? Most of the deaths that have been allegedly attributed to COVID-19 are happening in the so-called developed world. Again, totally different scenario and completely ridiculous comparisons. Now, even on Wikipedia, guys, which as manipulated as Wikipedia is, you can even see on there where it explains a 2007 analysis of medical journals from this period of the pandemic found that the viral infection was no more aggressive than previous influenza strains. So we're being totally misled again, right? Taken out of context. Instead, malnourishment, overcrowded medical camps, 
and hospitals and poor hygiene, all exacerbated by the recent war, this promoted bacterial superinfection, which was the secondary infection of the pneumonia that I told you about. This context is so important to keep in mind. And then if you look into history itself, what you'll find is there is such a close relationship, guys, with major outbreaks of disease and war. And this needs to be considered, okay? It needs to be considered. The Hundred Years' War, for example, this gave break to the bubonic plague, right? Or the Black Death. And then, in addition to that, what we find, if you look at this study, by Sharon DeWitt and James Wood, is that, again, even in this particular instance, it, had, it was selective in that it was going with people or going after people. I mean, I don't want to talk about it like it's a big boogeyman, but it was killing people that had compromised immune systems. That's how disease works, guys. Try not to give in to all of the stress because then you are setting yourself up to become sick. Don't give in to the fear-mongering. Don't give in to the illusion. All right? Remind yourself that if you do the appropriate things for your immune system, and don't overthink. One of the things that happened to me when I got sick, guys, because they couldn't figure it out at first. They just, even with the, the violent reaction, allergic reaction to the augmentin that I had, that is rooted mostly in uh, potential. And it makes sense because that's when all the problems started, but there's no certainty. So because I couldn't ascertain absolutely what was wrong, my mind started to just work overtime, work overtime. I thought I was being proactive and constantly researching what could this mean, this feeling over here. But what you do when you do that is you start to actually overwhelm your immune system further because it operates unconsciously. It doesn't need you to overwhelm it with your conscious worrying. It's counterproductive is what I'm saying. So remind yourself that if you just do the appropriate things, try to love, try to make time for happiness. Don't get, I mean, stress is a part of life, sure. But do your best to minimize the stress, do daily rituals, I'm gonna go into that later, that will help to keep you feeling positive, whether it's exercise or just doing some meditation, basic breathing exercises, positive visual, visualization, and, and then your immune system will take care of the rest. It doesn't need your added input. Okay, it's evolved over thousands of years to take care of these complex tasks for you. And yeah, again, infectious diseases during the Civil War, the triumph of the quote-unquote Third Army. And over here in the study, it explains altogether two-thirds of the approximately 660,000 deaths of soldiers were caused by uncontrolled infectious diseases. And that's so important to realize, guys, is they go hand in hand. And here's another study did with comrades, war and infectious diseases. And here we have also war and epidemics, a chronicle of infectious diseases. All I'm saying is the media, again, they're not providing us with the proper context. Things are more complex than they appear. Right? Whenever it's, it's oversimplified in such a way that it's just, oh, you know, this evil disease came running through, and because most people don't understand how disease itself works, and it's just all of this, uh, these alarm bells of fear-mongering and propaganda, if it's oversimplified like that, that's a red flag right away. We need to dissect things. We need to consider what could the other potentialities be involved in. And then the final thing that people have to also consider, and I actually became wise to this thanks to Professor Sinetra Gupta, is foreign encounters, guys. You see, during 1918, the Spanish influenza, foreign encounters and contacts were extremely rare. And the significance of this is when new populations encounter each other for the first time, especially under very stressful conditions when your immune system is already compromised, they are much more susceptible to getting a fatal reaction to a foreign pathogen or a disease. Whereas today, international travel is very common, so we are all constantly swapping bacteria. And as I explained earlier, the way that we overcome COVID-19 or any other disease or a flu is that we get some of that bacteria, we get a slight infection, and our immune system learns how to fight off that infection. And this makes us immune. This allows us to uh, develop some kind of defense against it. That's how intelligent the immune system works. But back then they couldn't do that because they encountered each other for the first time at a very large scale. So it's like a tidal wave 
just coming crashing down on everybody. Whereas we're living in a world now where travel is common, international travel is common. We are all swapping bacteria all the time. And the person that made me wise to this was actually Professor Sinetra Gupta. As you can see in this article of the uh, lockdown and social distancing could make our immune system weaker, says scientist. And she explained that people are not exposed to germs and so do not develop defenses that could protect them against future pandemics. And that's so important for people to understand, guys. And quoting over she explained that remaining in a state of lockdown is extremely dangerous from the point of view of the vulnerability of the entire population to new pathogens. Effectively, we used to live in a state approximating lockdown 100 years ago. And that was what created the conditions for the Spanish flu to come in and kill 50 million people. And unfortunately, the media hasn't given her the appropriate platform. Um, but she makes a really good case, guys. In fact, if you look in history, similar scenarios have emerged, right? When Christopher Columbus allegedly discovered the New World, the same thing happened. And there are other implications behind that, because while on the one side of the fence, it's perceived and it's been documented because history is written by the victors, that, you know, it was this new discovery. On the other side of that, for the Native American, it was more like an invasion. It was a war. And again, war and disease go closely hand in hand. But still, when you encounter people who have foreign diseases, foreign bacteria for the very first time, and it's also under horrible circumstances, such as an invasion, then that population, now that they have their immune system compromised, are much more likely to, to get very fatally ill and sick. And the same thing here with Australia. So it's, it's very important to consider the other implications that the media is not helping to provide us context with. There's so many things, guys. So as you can see, it's outrageous. It's, it's just ridiculous, mind-numbingly stupid to make this comparison constantly with the Spanish flu, which they are not providing us the appropriate context on, and then COVID-19 of today. Totally ridiculous. But once again, I mean, they bought and paid for. Like I said, follow the money. All right, with all of that said, let's investigate the new studies that are once again being spread like wildfire by the establishment media that purport to provide evidence of the efficacy of social distancing and lockdowns. All right, let's take a look into that. Because now, you know, they've come with a, a bunch of new studies that uh, essentially authenticate how valid and good social distancing and lockdowns is, right? So yeah, we have one of them, you can see this was just on the 1st of June 2020, ABC News. Mask and social distancing work. As Fox News, you know, we have CBC, keep wearing masks and social distancing because it works. <laughs> we'll tell you what to think. Time Magazine, wearing face masks and social distancing actually works, guys, according to a new study. Well, if we take a closer look at this study, which is precisely what the media should be doing, but we know that they are on the payroll, what we find is this study was funded by the World Health Organization, and McMaster University is also serving out a more than $12.3 million grant for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is significant because, as I said earlier, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has massive investments in the big pharmaceutical companies that are going to profit from this pandemic. That's a basic elementary conflict of interest. Journalism 101, people. And then in addition to that, if we take a look over here at the World Health Organization, who helped to finance that study, they are also being massively financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who is a partner with the big pharmaceutical companies, as we explored already, and then the Gavi Alliance, which was founded in partnership with the big pharmaceutical companies. So they, these are just major conflicts of interest, guys. And then even beyond these conflicts of interest, which are huge red flags, if we actually look into the study, what do we find? Moderate certainty, Low certainty, low certainty, low certainty. In other words, it's not a very good study. All right? Predominantly low certainty. Additionally, in this very limited one-sided narrative, guys, what's not being taken into account, what's not being studied, is the people who have difficulty or experience anxiety or who are claustrophobic wearing masks, right? For example, they did a study over here where it shows that the largest ever investigation 
into low level mental health problems suggests it can shorten life expectancy. So stress and anxiety, even low levels, prolonged period, that can shorten your life expectancy. So none of that's taken into account. And then beyond that, we have these studies being presented saying, oh, you know, this works to prevent the infection. But when we take a look at the official statistics, that a lot of people walking around are asymptomatic, meaning they don't really have any symptoms. And then those who do have it out of the registered cases, 99% are in mild condition. They have very mild symptoms. In my opinion, and only, I mean, I can only speak for myself, I want to get this disease because that's how your immune system has in the past for thousands of years learned how to adapt and defend itself against foreign pathogens, viruses, and diseases. So when they say this and they make it sound oh so fantastic and great, all they're doing is they are prolonging this lockdown. We need to get this disease. We need, we need to question it a little bit deeper, but nonetheless, as you can see in this study, if you take a little bit of a closer look, there's just red flags everywhere. There's another one, right? And this is a bit more shocking. Social distancing a week earlier could have saved 36 thousand lives and here we have the guardian bbc cnn all all the big dogs right all the big figures of authority spreading it like wildfire washington post of course the new york times and again this is a what it's a disease model is like i said models are poor substitutes for concrete science but let's take a closer look again once again this is this has not been peer reviewed of course they make no mention of that right in any of the headlines that's absolutely significant. This has not been peer reviewed. That's a big deal. In addition to that, Jeffrey Shaman, one of the lead authors, he has financial conflicts of interest with Merck and Company, and he owns a company called SK Analytics, who their clientele overwhelmingly, to their benefit, will be the big pharma companies. So that's, that's huge conflicts of interest, guys. Merck and Company is going to profit from all of this. So, I mean, just a, it's not even clever, is what I'm saying. And then in addition to that, who was the study supported by and funded by? By the National Institute of Health. And as I said already, if you look at the foundation for the National Institutes of Health, it is packed with big pharma players. Yeah, we have Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, and Johnson Johnson, all of which are gonna profit from this pandemic. All of which will ultimately profit from this. And at the bottom there, we see Jillian Sackler from the uh, corrupt Sackler family. I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing. I mean, I know I've said that word mind blowing throughout this, throughout this presentation, but you can see this is, just, it's outrageous guys. The conflicts of interest, authorities have been so corrupted. It's just, it's outrageous, really ridiculous. And here's another one. This one's even more shocking, right? And this came out, yeah, you can see 8th June. Lockdowns prevented 3.1 million deaths in Europe, guys. It works. Oh yes, it worked. Millions of people were saved. Told you guys, lockdowns in Europe saved millions of lives. Research shows lockdowns work, guys. Millions of infections and deaths were prevented in the US and Europe. Right? But if we take a look, I mean, like I said, it's not even clever. That's how stupid they think we are. It irritates me. I mean, it's, you, they're insulting my intelligence to think that I'm going to fall for this bullshit. This is an unedited manuscript, it's an early version, errors may be discovered which could affect the content. That's the first thing, that's the first red flag right there. The second one, and this is huge, is this is another study, another mostly mathematical model actually, which is a poor substitute for concrete science, from Imperial College London. Again, the same group that has a terrible history of bad predictions. They were behind the declaration with their research for the 2009 declaration of a swine flu pandemic and that model was completely way off once again it profited the big pharmaceutical companies at the expense of taxpayers and then they were the ones that were behind the theoretical mathematical model that was never published in a scientific journal or even peer-reviewed that justified the lockdowns to initially begin with yeah no shock once again they produce a ridiculous study and then as we already explored guys they are currently receiving millions of pounds in taxpayer money to develop a coronavirus vaccine. So is it really a surprise when they produce results that favor their position? Come on. And then beyond that, they are currently in direct partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, Eli Lilly Company, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca, amongst others. These are all 
uh, big pharma companies that are going to profit from the pandemic. This is just Mickey Mouse elementary journalism, investigative journalism that I'm sharing with you. Please, you need to spread this like wildfire because the media, obviously, the establishment media is not going to do it. And I'm tired of playing this game of pretend. I must go everywhere wearing masks and people must kill the bacteria I need to keep a strong immune system, always wiping my shit down. It's ridiculous. And then if you look a bit closer, and this was really concerning to me, guys, because if you look at the, the study that was published in Nature, they don't disclose the financial interests. And b by the way, you can see as Neil Ferguson again. I mean, it's just outrageous to even this guy's lost all credibility. But it's, it's concerning because I had to dig to find out that they were also funded, this study was partly funded in support with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And as I said already, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has got investments in the big pharma companies, huge investments in conflicts of interest, in the big pharma companies that are going to profit from this. So there's all kinds of red flags there, guys. And as we mentioned earlier, the Gates Foundation gave the Imperial College London the same month they produced that ri ridiculous theoretical mathematical model that other scientists could not replicate, which is a huge red flag, and they criticized uh, because it was so outrageous. That same month, the Bull and Melinda Gates Foundation gave them over $79 million. These are red flags, guys. Very simple conflicts of interest. So the proverbial titanic of propaganda of the establishment of the authorities, the mountain of bullshit that should be unsinkable has just been sunk, guys. This presentation put all of that into perspective for you. Right? I've documented in great detail, showed you the sources, the citations, why this is completely indefensible. It cannot be justified. They're, what leg do they have to stand on? So with that said, please have the courage now. Have the courage to share this. As I said, if you stand with reality, if you stand with the truth, maybe you'll be ostracized or even insulted and so on and so forth, but you're still standing with the truth, guys. And the implications by being silenced right now is that it's going to adversely affect not just us, but the future generations who are depending on us to stand up for them. And as the saying goes, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So please have that courage, guys. And remember, courage is not about not feeling fear. I know it's scary to voice your opinion in this world with all this uh, brainwashing and, and, the, and the bullying and stuff. And it's all being manipulated. I know that can be scary. But courage is about realizing something else is more important. Something's more important than my fear right now. And maybe that's your children. Maybe that's your uncle or your grandfather or whoever it may be or your grandmother that's on lockdown and they're suffering. So, come on, stand up, guys. Stand up for the truth. With that said, this is just actually the first layer. It goes deeper, guys. And I know some of you are saying, holy hell, it, it goes still deeper than this. It always goes deeper than this. I mean, it always, goes, it always goes deeper, guys. There's a deeper agenda, much deeper. And this agenda extends into, into control. We are actually living currently. A lot of people don't realize this. And I'll document it in my next presentation. We are living in the greatest revolution in human history. Oh yes, we don't have the historical context. You see, we don't have people to tell us that. We don't have that voice of affirmation to let us know what's going on. But just as somebody who lives through a hurricane, they don't understand the historical significance, maybe a Hurricane Katrina or some huge earthquake, uh, one of the biggest earthquakes in history, you don't know what you're going through when you are experiencing it. But in hindsight, I have no doubt 100 years from now, and the history books are written, this will be recognized as an international time of revolution. And as a result of that, the ruling class, the traditional establishment of power, families, individuals that have been pulling strings for centuries and centuries and centuries, and also different uh, organizations that have been in power for well over a thousand years, they see the threat here and they have to do something about that. But I'll get into that in the near future. The reason why I didn't include it now is because, like I said, guys, I have bills to pay. You know what I mean? I'm not getting paid to do this, unlike the media, who's getting paid to brainwash you. Unfortunately, I've got to find a way of paying my bills and so on and so forth. And once I get a cushion, then I'll get back to making a second presentation for you. But I'm not going to leave you hanging. There's a dude named James Corbett of the Corbett Report. 
absolutely brilliant investigating uh, journalist and he put together a series on Bill Gates. So for now you can check that out and this will help to illuminate a bit more of the, the deeper agenda that's taking place. And then for those people who are suffering right now with anxiety or depression, the first thing is to acknowledge that. It's not a sign of weakness, guys. It's normal, okay? It's, it's, it's normal. So recognize it. Try to gauge how am I feeling? Do I feel a little bit nervous? Do I feel a bit off? And if you do, I'm going to link this blog I wrote in the description box. And it just lays out basic uh, rituals and tasks that you can take on a daily basis to keep your mind strong, to help you get through this very difficult time. And then it also links to a longer blog for people who want to go a little bit deeper into um, changing their, their patterns, their habits, and the way that they feel and overcoming the depression and the anxiety. Because as most of my followers know, I suffered debilitating me from this, guys. In the past, I couldn't even have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And I self-medicated self with alcohol because I was just paralyzingly uh, anxious and had panic attacks on a daily. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is you can't get through hell unless somebody's been through hell already and they kind of show you the way out there. So it's really important if you are feeling like that, guys, please look into this blog. That's why I wrote it. And then the book. The book is coming. And once it comes, it's going to be just, I don't want to, you know, sound dramatic and exaggerate, but it will give you the authentic guidance you, you need. Not just in understanding how the system works, because it's necessary to know about how the system works in order to defend yourself from their tactics. Because their propaganda, it's Mickey Mouse. It's not that I'm, you know, special and I can see these things. It's just once you learn the patterns... Like I said, the game stays the same, the players change. That's all. The players change, but the game stays the same. Once you learn the game, then you are good to go, guys. So there is elements of that, but a lot of it is also to do with neuroscience, self-help, and how you can become the best version of yourself and find purpose and meaning, right? It's essentially, it's an authentic education that we were robbed of as, uh, as children growing up. And then finally... As you know, I have been censored big time. That's why I'm still recovering financially. And in order to avoid the censorship, because I don't even know what's going to happen with this presentation, guys. The, the censorship is just it's unprecedented. But in order to avoid censorship, please, as soon as you turn this off, go into the first comment, because I'll make sure that I document this as the first comment, in the comment section, and sign up for my email, guys. We have got to find a way to outmaneuver them in this chess game. Because, I mean, as you can see, I'm dedicated to helping to figure out what's going on, to figure out reality, to figure out the truth. And above and beyond all else, I feel a deep conviction to uphold the principles of humanity, the principles of integrity, the principles of truth, right? The, the principles which we all know on a deeper level they transcend politics, they go beyond religion. It's things that we all innately know deep down inside we need to stand up for and we need to fight for. And if we stand up for these things, if we live for these things, then eventually we can rid ourselves of the toxic influence of the deception, the propaganda, and those who mean to exploit us, guys. So until next time, as the book of here says, the revolution starts within, guys. Much love.